Provenge is an established cellular immunotherapy used to treat certain men with advanced prostate cancer. Provenge is customized to each individual and is made from his own immune cells. Immunotherapy is the prevention or treatment of disease with substances that may stimulate an immune response. The immune system has memory and can recognize substances it has encountered previously. Immunotherapy is designed to boost the immune system to target and attack advanced prostate cancer. This is why immunotherapy empowers the immune system to fight the cancer immediately and allow the effects to last over time. Indication. Provenge is a prescription medication used to treat certain men with advanced prostate cancer. Provenge is an established cellular immunotherapy and is customized to each individual by using his own immune cells. Important safety information. Before receiving Provenge, tell your doctor about any medical conditions, including heart or lung problems, or if you have had a stroke. Tell your doctor about any medicines you take, including prescription and non-prescription drugs, vitamins, or dietary supplements. The most common side effects of Provenge include chills, fatigue, fever, back pain, nausea, joint ache, and headache. These are not all the possible side effects of Provenge treatment. Provenge is made from your own immune cells, which are collected during a process called leukapheresis. The cells are processed, returned, and then infused back into the patient through an IV, intravenous infusion, approximately three days later. This process is completed in three cycles, about two weeks apart. Each infusion takes approximately one hour and requires 30 minutes of post-infusion monitoring. Provenge infusion can cause serious reactions. Tell your doctor right away if you have signs of a heart attack or lung problems, such as trouble breathing, chest pains, racing or irregular heartbeats, high or low blood pressure, dizziness, fainting, nausea or vomiting, have signs of a stroke, such as numbness or weakness on one side of the body, decreased vision in one eye or difficulty speaking, develop symptoms of thrombosis which may include pain and or swelling of an arm or leg with warmth over the affected area, discoloration of an arm or leg, shortness of breath, chest pain that worsens on deep breathing, have signs of infection such as fever over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, redness or pain at the infusion or collection sites. Tell your doctor about any side effects that concerns you or does not go away. For more information, talk with your doctor. You are encouraged to report negative side effects of prescription drugs to the FDA. Visit www.fda.gov slash medwatch or call 1-800-FDA-1088. Please see accompanying full prescribing information. Prostate Cancer Research Institute is an educational organization for prostate cancer patients, their caregivers, and their families. We put patients first and are an unbiased source of information and support. For over 20 years, our goal has been to meet the educational needs of prostate cancer patients at every stage of their journey. Medical technology is advancing rapidly and new treatments are becoming available. Patients have to make complex choices which have lasting implications. They face unexpected industry biases and doctors who may not be up to date on the latest research. Your donation helps men receive the latest, most up-to-date information, which empowers them to make informed decisions. Our website, PCRI.org, is a wealth of information and resources. Our conferences and webinars are a way to get patients questions answered by leading physicians and researchers. And we have a helpline for men to call with questions about their diagnosis, treatment choices, and side effects associated with these treatments. Each week we produce multiple videos covering concepts and every patient question that we can think of about the disease in a straightforward and easy to understand format. This was a brief overview of what we do at PCRI, and to learn more you can visit our website. Your donation directly funds our educational programs, which give life-changing information to men during a very vulnerable time in their life, and we thank you for your consideration. 
You can visit PCRI.org to learn more.
Hello everyone and welcome back to day two of our 2022 prostate cancer patient conference. We have a fantastic lineup today, including Dr. Yu, Evan Yu, Dr. Eugene Kwan, our executive director, Dr. Mark Scholes, and Dr. Mark Moyad, our moderator. Just a reminder to visit pcri.org forward slash 2022 dash conference to visit the exhibit hall where you'll find lots of helpful resources and information about treatments, program and payments assistance, and so much more. Also remember that you can donate. Your support helps PCRI create prostate cancer education that gets shared around the world. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Bayer, Pfizer, Estellis, Janssen, AbbVie, Advanced Accelerator Applications, Novartis, Blue Earth, Dendrion, Myova, and Tolmar, who helped make this event 100% free for you. Up next, we have Dr. Evan Yu. He is the Clinical Research Director of Genitourinary Medical Oncology at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and he's going to give us the update on the newest developments in treatment for advanced prostate cancer and side effects. We at PCRI are big fans of Dr. Yu. Not only is he an expert in his field, but he does a great job of breaking down complex treatments to help us learn more. Without further ado, thank you, Dr. Yu. Excited to talk about what I think are the hottest topics in prostate cancer right now. There's a lot of things happening in this field. I mean, we're fortunate to be in a field where there's a lot of great advancements occurring over and over again. So I'll go ahead and start by sharing my disclosures. So I'll just leave this up for a second. And then I'm going to move ahead now and talk about first the metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer state. I think there's been a lot of new findings and things that are happening in this disease state with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And I wanna talk about some of the newest uh, study results that are gonna change standard of care or have already changed standard of care. And also I'm gonna focus on who we should be doing this for. So let me quickly summarize again. When I say metastatic, that means that it's prostate cancer that's left the prostate and has spread to a dif dis distant site. As we know, prostate cancer likes to go to lymph nodes, it likes to go to bone, but it can go to sites like the liver or lung, uh, places like that. When I say hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, there's a lot of terms that can be used. People use the term hormone-sensitive, people use the term castration-sensitive or hormone-naive. These are essentially patients who haven't received hormone therapy or testosterone-lowering therapy yet, androgen deprivation therapy. And uh, so that's what I mean. So you get a scan, CAT scan, bone scan, you see maybe some cancer that's spread to the bones. They haven't received any medications to lower testosterone, for instance, like Lupron or Degarelix, anything like that. So that's the disease state I wanna talk about first. And what this slide summarizes are just a whole bunch of the different treatment options available because as of now, you know, or as of a year ago, we had a lot of options already. So the first thing that came about was docetaxel, chemotherapy. We know that if we add six cycles of docetaxel chemotherapy to hormonal therapy for patients with this disease state, that there can be survival benefit. That's from the charted trial and the stampede trial. <clears throat> now in that study, in the charted study, they broke it down further and they found that the patients who garnered the most benefit from chemotherapy were those who had kind of high volumes of disease meaning it spread to the liver, the lungs, or they had at least four or more bone metastases with one outside of the middle of the spine or the pelvic region. So let's say the humerus, like arm, the leg region, those would be considered appendicular or part of an appendix, and that would put you into a high volume disease category if you had four or more of those lesions. Interestingly, docetaxel's been around for a long time, so it didn't really require an FDA approval. So as you can see on this slide, it's not in one of those boxes. The drugs that are in the boxes are drugs like abiraterone that showed significant survival benefit for metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer patients up front in the Stampede trial, in the Latitude, and now in PEACE-1. So abiraterone is a drug that lowers testosterone production everywhere in the body, not just in the testicles, but in the tumor itself, in the adrenal gland, all the places where testosterone can be made. And the other boxes show apalutamide from the Titan study and enzalutamide from the Arches and Enzymet study. Now these are pure androgen receptor antagonists. What that means is they bind to the hormone receptor that testosterone binds to and they don't let go. They're irreversible. So they completely 
inhibit the effects. So if you, to summarize this slide, let's start with the base that we know that treatment intensification of patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer leads to dramatic survival benefit. And that could be treatment intensification with chemotherapy, docetaxel for high volumes of disease, or with really potent hormonal therapies like abiraterone, apalutamide, or enzalutamide. Okay, let's move in to more recent studies. PEACE-1 was first presented at ESMO, European Society of Medical Oncology, last year. Okay, and this was an interesting study. This was interesting in the fact that they only allowed patients with de novo metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer on. When I say de novo, I mean that when they were diagnosed, they already had metastatic disease. Now, most people in the United States present with not de novo, or what some would call synchronous metastatic prostate cancer, they present with metachronous disease, which means maybe you had prostate cancer in your prostate, you had surgery or radiation, and years later it came back and became metastatic. That's not who this study looked at. This study looked at patients who had more aggressive features who presented with de novo metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. And there were four arms to this study, but really what they were asking are two questions. Question one, does abiraterone lead to significant benefit? Now, we already know that from the Stampede study and the Latitude study, and so I'll just quickly answer that yes, in this study it did as well. But the second question they asked is, does radiation to the prostate, in somebody who already has metastatic disease that we consider essentially incurable, but does radiation to the prostate maybe reduce the tumor burden and lead to out better outcomes, survival outcomes down the road? And that has yet to read out. We haven't seen data from that yet, so I'm not going to talk about that today. What I find to be most interesting from this study, however, is what I'm presenting on this next slide, which is, is that in this study initially, they didn't necessarily have patients who received docetaxel chemotherapy, but the charted trial led to a lot of excitement. And so a good chunk of the patients, some of the patients on the study, received both hormonal therapy and docetaxel. So we're able to learn from this study a unique feature about triple combination therapy. Well, we know docetaxel adds benefit for high volume disease. We know that abiraterone adds benefit for all comers. But does abiraterone add benefit on top of getting the hormonal therapy, androgen deprivation therapy, and docetaxel? And that's the unique finding from this study that shows that the median survival benefit for these kind of de novo patients who had high volumes of disease. It wasn't low volume disease patients, it was high volumes of disease. So aggressive characteristic patients, prostate cancer patients, added a median of one and a half year or more survival benefit. I think it was like 1.6 years in, these pa in this patient population. So this was the first evidence that showed triple combination therapy with both your you know, hormonal shots, with adding the abiraterone pills, and with adding chemotherapy, docetaxel chemotherapy, that this triple combination has benefit, okay? That's pretty cool. Now, another study called the Arison study. This was really just presented at GUASCO in February of this year and is published in the New England Journal already. This was a very clean study. This study was slightly different. It was also patients with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer but it took patients who are on androgen deprivation therapy and everybody received docetaxel. Okay, so the entire population, so everybody got androgen deprivation therapy and docetaxel and half the patients got darolunamide, which is another pure androgen receptor antagonist like enzalutamide or like apalutamide, and half the patients just got placebo. So it was essentially androgen deprivation therapy with docetaxel with or without darolunamide overall survival being the primary endpoint and I want to focus first on the key baseline characteristics. So this study had different eligibility criteria from piece one where it was AD androgen deprivation therapy docetaxel abiraterone that required de novo metastatic disease and the, what we've seen is the data for the high volume disease patients. We haven't seen much of the low volume disease patient population data yet. But in this Arison study what we find is, is that eligibility requires just being fit enough for docetaxel. So it was really dealer's choice, up to the investigator, up to the patient, if you were fit for docetaxel, could tolerate chemotherapy. Now, 
logically speaking, not everybody's going to go want to go on this study. So in a lot of centers where patients had other options, they might have gotten androgen deprivation therapy or an Abirat or an androgen deprivation therapy and apalutamide. And then they've hand-selected the most aggressive patients to go on this study. And that's why I want to focus on this baseline characteristics slide. You can see with the red you know, circle there, I'm emphasizing the fact that 86% of the patients presented with distant metastases. So this whole synchronous metastatic, de novo metastatic population. So in some ways, it's very similar to the PEACE-1 study population in the fact that most of these patients had aggressive characteristics. They didn't have surgery or radiation or relapse 10 years later. They presented with metastatic disease. So that's why I want to focus on that this slide. Now the next slide is just the overall survival data. This is the top line data. You can see there's a you know, 30, 32.5% reduction in the risk of death with a very significant p-value, which is a statistical marker that we look at. But even to the bare eye, one can see the survival curves separate rather early and are quite distinct. So again, this is more evidence to support the idea of triple combination therapy, where you're getting the hormone shots, you're taking a hormonal pill, whether it's abiraterone from PEACE-1 or darolutamide from the Arison study, and you're getting six doses, cycles of docetaxel chemotherapy. For this patient population, which has more aggressive characteristics, very, very, very clear survival benefit. Now, I will tell you that about 86% did have de novo metastases. You know, less than that, a smaller subset, what was remaining, had recurrent metastatic disease. That wasn't statistically significant, but close. Okay, so again, I think there's hints that triple combination therapy might help everybody, but most convincing for those who present with metastatic disease. Now, this is a busy slide that looks at the adverse events or the side effects on the study. And I'll just point out, when you look at the left column, it's comp triple combination therapy, androgen deprivation therapy, darolutamide, docetaxel. When you look at the right, it's more just androgen deprivation therapy, docetaxel, and placebo. So you can see that most of the side effects are probably chemotherapy side effects, the docetaxel side effects. But the where areas where there's difference, I'll point out, are rash and hypertension. It's slightly more, not even a lot more, but there's a little bit more rash, and then there's a little bit more high blood pressure in the patients who got darolutamide. But it seems like most of the side effect profiles driven by the chemotherapy. So this is really, really well tolerated. All right, I want to close this section on metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, and I just want to go over the take home messages. I bolded the most important ones that I think are standard of care or that change standard of care. So for patients that are fit for docetaxel, that means healthy enough to receive it, and who have de novo metastatic prostate cancer, and again, de novo means presenting with metastatic disease, not having treatment of the prostate and recurring later with it. For this patient population, triple combination therapy leads to significant overall survival benefit. And what triple combination therapy is, your sort of testosterone lowering shots, uh, androgen deprivation therapy, okay? Chemotherapy with docetaxel for six cycles, and then either abiraterone from PEACE-1 or darolutamide from the Aerosense trial. This leads to an overall survival benefit, but I will emphasize this is not for everybody. This is for patients who have more aggressive characteristics. I assume most of these patients had high volume disease, and they clearly most of the patients had de novo metastatic disease where they presented with these metastases. So it's not for everybody. It's for patients with these most aggressive characteristics. But one could argue these are the patients that do the worst. It's the biggest unmet need, so I'm glad that we have this here now. Now, eventually, we need to do post hoc or you know, after-the-fact analyses to look at the breakdown for the low-volume disease patients. We'll have to dissect that data to show when we get more data for those with just very, very few metastases, is there a benefit to triple combination therapy? And I want to emphasize that if you have metastatic prostate cancer, even if you don't have these kind of really aggressive, poor prognostic characteristics, treatment intensification is still warranted in the vast majority of patients. 
And there is some po post-marketing data out there that shows that a lot of people, maybe half the people with metastatic prostate cancer, aren't getting any treatment intensification. So triple therapy is not for everybody, but some sort of treatment intensification, adding abiraterone or enzalutamide or apalutamide or docetaxel for those you know, really higher volume subsets. Some sort of treatment intensification or doublet therapy is warranted for the vast majority of patients as long as you're healthy enough to tolerate it, okay? So I'll wrap that section up and I'm gonna move to the next section, next what I consider hot topic, by asking about PARP inhibitors. Okay, now we know about PARP inhibitors a little bit. Okay, these are, seems like what's, it's you know beneficial for patients who have certain gene mutations in genes that lead to problems with DNA repair. You're, you get breaks in your DNA, doesn't repair very well, okay? That's often what leads to cancer, but it also leads to a susceptibility to treating cancer cells that can't repair their DNA very well. So there are these PARP inhibitors out there that are FDA approved, and the question here really is, there's new data that might hint towards expanding the patient population that we should be treating with PARP inhibitors, so I'm gonna talk about that. So first slide, I wanna summarize the FDA approval for PARP inhibitors. There's really two PARP inhibitors that are FDA approved in prostate cancer. One is from the PROFOUND study using a PARP inhibitor called Olaparib. Okay, and these studied patients who had metastatic, castration-resistant or hormone-resistant prostate cancer that have progressed on either prior enzalutamide or abiraterone. So the difference between this disease state and the previous disease state, you have metastatic disease, you can see it on your scans, but the difference is you've already received the potent hormonal therapies and your PSA is rising or your scans have gotten worse, you have progressed beyond that. That is now metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. The other key thing to make patients eligible for this study with Olaparib is you had to have one of, I think, 16 different DNA gene repair mutations. So they had a panel of genes involved in DNA repair, and they stated that if you have one of these mutations, you might be, have a higher likelihood of responding to a PARP inhibitor. And the way that this works is, is let's think about this, is double-strand DNA break repair, or what, something we call homologous recombination repair, is one of the best ways for cells to repair their DNA when there's errors that occur. There's lots of different DNA repair mechanisms. But these patients with one of these mutations have lost the ability to do that well. Now, how does PARP work? PARP works by basically helping with single-strand break repair. So you've taken out double-strand break repair by having one of these mutations. And now you have a PARP inhibitor, so you take out single-strand break repair. And these cancer cells that just can't repair their DNA, they're trying to divide, divide, repair things, and they get stuck and then they die. So that's the way that a drug like Olaparib works if you have one of these 16, uh, you know, it's actually, the label actually I think had 15 genes because one of the genes it didn't seem to work very well for. Now, the bottom of this slide emphasizes the other PARP inhibitor that's FDA approved, that's Rucaparib. And I don't think one of these PARP inhibitors is clearly better than another, but they studied it in a different patient population. They looked at patients who had already had drugs like Abiraterone or Enzalutamide and also had a taxane chemotherapy. So it's FDA approved for a later setting and their data was best for patients with one of two DNA repair gene mutations. And it was BRCA1 or BRCA2. So they have a more narrow label. And that label is for post chemotherapy patients and patients who have to have a BRCA1 or two gene repair mutation. Now frankly, I like this label because I think most of the patients with DNA repair gene alteration problems. It's driven by BRCA2 in prostate cancer. There's much less being driven by the other genes. I'm just gonna throw out a bunch of names, ATM, PALB2, RAD51. There's a whole bunch of other genes. It's less clear how important those genes are. BRCA2, no brainer, okay? These drugs work for patients with those mutations. So again, this is where we're starting from. You have one of those DNA repair gene mutations. With a Laparib, you don't have to have received chemo. With Rucaparib, you have to have received prior docetaxel. So you have to be, have one of these biomarkers selected through next generation sequencing. And so these mutations are usually found either in the tumor 
or can be found by plucking their tumor DNA out of the blood. Okay, you have to have one of these mutations, one would think, to respond well to PARP inhibitors. Well, let's ask this question again. At GU ASCO this year, the randomized phase three magnitude study was presented. And this used a PARP inhibitor called Neraprib, a different PARP inhibitor. And this required biomarker selection with a more limited panel. It was a panel of around, I think, eight genes, maybe it was an eight or, yeah, eight gene panel, okay? And if you were biomarker positive for one of these DNA repair genes, they put you into randomization of adding Neraprib to abiraterone or abiraterone alone. First line therapy for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, okay? If you're a biomarker negative, meaning you didn't have a DNA repair gene mutation, they have the same randomization. They just put you in a different group of, six, of 600 patients planned. And the primary endpoint was not overall survival, it was radiographic progression-free survival. So really essentially time until your scans look worse. All right. Now first they had a futility analysis of the biomarker negative group. And the biomarker negative group, one, has less scientific rationale to think it'll work. So they did this composite progression endpoint looking at either radiographic imaging progression or PSA progression, PSA going up, and they found that uh, neraparib didn't seem to help. So they just said, we're shutting this arm down, okay? Now this next slide, however, looks at the primary endpoint of those who are mutated in either BRCA1 or BRCA2, and they had a very significant improvement in radiographic progression-free survival by both central review where the images were sent in, where some central blinded radiologists, and by independent investigator review. So that's pretty interesting and promising that the combination of adding the neraparib early, because right now the data is with PARP inhibitors later, and it's with PARP inhibitors single agent, but this is combination with abiraterone, and there is a radiographic progression-free survival benefit with adding neraparib here. Now this next slide here, doesn't just look at those with BRCA1 and 2, it expands to the whole 8 gene profile and includes all those other patients. You can see the curves are a little bit more narrow. Okay, there's not as much difference between the curves. Probably because most of the benefit's still driven by BRCA2 and BRCA1. But there are some patients with these select other gene mutations that might benefit as well. Tough to tease that out, but still positive for this endpoint using all this biomarker panel positivity, okay? Now, overall survival, I think it's almost useless showing this because patients are gonna live a lot longer beyond their radiographic progression. You can see this, the survival curves, there's no clear difference, but that's because this data isn't mature. When I say it's not mature, it means they haven't followed the patients out long enough. You need to follow the patients out longer to potentially see an overall survival benefit. But I would propose that this is very interesting, not for the biomarker negative patients, but for the patients with DNA repair gene alterations. One asks the question, maybe we should be using these PARP inhibitors early in combination with abiraterone right up front, okay? But the study doesn't answer a key question. And the key question is, when you combine the two drugs together, is that better than giving them in sequence? So you give somebody abiraterone and follow it up with a PARP inhibitor, or you give somebody a PARP inhibitor and you follow it up with abiraterone, maybe they do just as well. And so just because we can combine doesn't mean we should, because combination might lead to more side effects, more costs to you as a patient, more costs to the healthcare system. Can't tell yet from this study, it's a little bit early. So this next slide is from ASCO. And this was presented by Maha Hussein. It's a little bit of a teaser. It's called the Breakaway Study. And this was a small study with three different arms. And it kind of tried to ask this question, which is the question of, does combination of abiraterone with a PARP inhibitor, and then the PARP inhibitor they used here was a laparib, do you do better than giving a laparib followed by abiraterone or abiraterone followed by a laparib? And again, 20 patients per arm, not enough statistical power to show too much, certainly not for overall survival, but they did show that radiographic progression-free survival seemed better to the combination right up front than one fall by the next. Still doesn't answer the question. What I want to see is overall survival is improved to combination up front versus given one after the next, because 
I don't think any of the studies answer that question, but still very provocative and interesting data. Now this next study I'm going to talk about is the Propel study. This was also presented at GUASCO, and this was a really interesting design in the fact that like magnitude, they accepted patients that had biomarker positivity or biomarker negativity, but they didn't even test up front. They just took everybody. You're eligible with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer for abiraterone. Well, we're going to randomize you to abiraterone plus placebo or abiraterone plus alaprib. And it doesn't matter whether you have a DNA gene repair mutation. We're going to test for it, and then we're going to break down the data later based on whether you have it or not. But we're really looking at all comers because there was a randomized phase two study earlier that kind of showed benefit, radiographic progression-free survival benefit. And the fields had a hard time wrapping their arms around it because we just don't understand if you don't have one of these DNA gene repair mutations, how does the PARP inhibitor work? We don't really know. There's a little bit of preclinical data that shows that, hey, when you suppress the hormonal pathways, you might be upregulating the DNA repair pathways and so you know hitting that pathway is important as well and vice versa that when you hit the DNA repair gene pathways that it might have caused changes in the hormonal androgen receptor or testosterone pathways so maybe hitting them both together might be synergistic or at least additive regardless they took all comers and they looked at radiographic progression free survival and you can see by this next slide here that you have a radiographic progression-free survival benefit there. Median RPFS, or radiographic progression-free survival, went from 16.6 .6 to 24.8 months. Very statistically significant p-value, which again is that marker we look at for statistical significance. And uh, I'd say this is pretty impressive for a patient population that was unselected. You know, there was no biomarker selection here. So it's, it's really quite interesting. It's not like the first time this was done. This was a confirmatory randomized phase three study for a randomized phase two that showed very similar data. Now this next slide looks at subgroups. So we always have to take this with a grain of salt because once you start looking at specific subgroups, you decrease your statistical power because it's smaller patient populations. But one of the important things here and that I highlight in the red circle is the HRR, or homologous recombination repair mutation status. And I want to point out that when you look at these plots, what you're looking at is a hazard ratio of one, and one means there's no benefit at all. What you want to be is you want to be on the left. You want to show that adding your new drug, Alaparib, let's say, on top of abiraterone leads to reduction in the risk of death. Okay, so if one is the number, you want to be less than one. Okay, and you can see here that for the homologous recombination mutated patient population, it's very far to the left, way less than one. And that makes sense because we already know that Alaparib adds benefit for these patients. It's already FDA approved, as I said in the beginning. But again, when you just look at the, small, the, the subgroup of those that are not mutated, it's still not only to the left of one, smaller than one, but the entire statistical confidence interval, 95% confidence interval, which, you know, statistical speak, allows some margin of error, a 95% margin of error. The entire interval falls to the left of one. Pretty interesting here. So I think, you know, this is provocative data. Now, overall survival on this next slide, similar to the magnitude study, data is not mature. Okay, the good news is not enough patients have passed away for the data to be mature. That's good news for those patients. But, you know, it doesn't give us a final answer yet for overall survival. So this is my take-home message slide. And on this slide, I want to, again, highlight it that Alaparib is already FDA approved. But it's FDA approved for those with select DNA repair gene alterations. I think it's a 15-gene panel that's approved for in the post-novel hormonal therapy setting. That means post abiraterone and zalutamide, generally speaking. Metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. Rucaparib, also FDA-approved, but the difference is you have to receive prior taxane chemotherapy as well as the prior novel hormonal therapy, and the gene mutations are limited to BRCA1 or 2. But the new stuff, the new stuff that I'm still trying to digest, 
I'm sure the FDA will take some time to digest, but doesn't change things just yet, but might be a nice glimpse at the future to come. Adding niraparib to abiraterone for first-line metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancers for patients with one of eight DNA repair gene mutations seems to have some short-term benefits for radiographic progression-free survival. We've got to follow these patients out to see about overall survival. And the real question is, do you need to do it together up front, or can you do it in sequence? The other take home is for a biomarker unselected population, which is even more interesting in the fact that I can't say I understand how this works yet, but adding patients, adding olaparib to patients for first-line abiraterone who have metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, that also leads to short-term benefits for radiographic progression-free survival. We'll have to see for long-term benefits. The real question is, I don't know how this works for those who are DNA repair gene non-mutated. What's the biologic mechanism for driving that? Will this be enough to drive FDA or regulatory approval and use down the road? And the reason it's important is that one might say, well, even if there's not overall survival, even if we don't understand how it works, maybe it's fine, just throw it in the water. Yeah, that's fine, but we always have to remember the downside star treatments. Treatments, there's no free lunch in life. Treatments have side effects, treatments have costs. And so we really have to be convinced that the data is you know, overwhelmingly, convincingly there and that we're helping our patients this way. And so I think the jury's still not quite out, but it's an interesting glimpse. All right? Now, the next section, I want to talk about lutetium PSMA 617. You've all heard of this. You know, it's been given in Germany and Australia. We now have data to support it. What I want to talk about is how do we sequence it with chemotherapy, with cabazitaxel. There's some new data on that. And I also want to talk about who does the best with this. How do we pick patients for this? How might we help select patients? So this first slide here is just the vision trial. This was presented way back in ASCO 2021. I mean, that's like over a year ago now. That's like ancient history now. This field moves so fast. But that being said and done, I got to show you this slide to show you that clear, there's clear overall survival benefit. And what the label is, is for patients who have metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, have received a prior novel hormonal therapy, and have received a prior taxane chemotherapy. You don't have to receive two or three of each. You could have, but you have to have at least received one. And you also have to undergo a PSMA PET. Now, PSMA is prostate-specific membrane antigen. It's not PSA, it's PSMA. This is a protein that's highly expressed in prostate cancer cells. Probably 85, 90 plus percent of patients with metastatic prostate cancer will express this at a high level. And all this drug is, is basically a small molecule that finds PSMA and it drops off radiation, potent radiation, right inside those cancer cells after the cancer cells uptake it. So it's pretty cool. It's like a liquid radiation delivery mechanism. We call it theranostics, we call it radioligand therapy, you can call it what it wants to. I say it works well. I mean, that's what the data shows, right? So, on this next slide, however, this just goes to show that how we can maybe pick better who the patients are gonna do the best with this therapy. And what it shows is that if you look at mean SUV, and SUV is just a way of quantifying your measurement of uptake on a PET scan that those patients, it's kind of common sense, those patients that uptake the most PET radio tracer for PSMA, they're gonna be the patients who do the best with lutetium 617 PSMA. Makes sense, right? That's not to say if you don't uptake much that you're gonna do poorly. You're gonna still gain benefit over what their control arm was, was which was switched to another novel hormonal therapy. It's just not as much benefit. And this be, can become relevant later, and I'll talk about that. Now, on the right panel there, you can see that the patients who did a little bit worse had PSMA-positive lesions in, let's say, the liver or in bone. So if your PSMA PET lesions are isolated just to the lymph nodes, you're apt to do the best here with lutetium 617 PSMA. So that helps us pick out patients a little bit better. Now, this addresses the issue of comparison with chemotherapy. This was a nicely done study from Australia and New Zealand called the Therapy Study. And in it, they took patients 
and they had very stringent criteria. They had to have a lot of PSMA pet uptake and no FDG uptake because they were worried that that might be some sort of weird variant of prostate cancer that doesn't make a lot of PSMA that's, you know, just has a very, very high glucose uptake rate. That's FDG. And they compared those patients with lutetium PSMA 617 to patients receiving cabazitaxel chemotherapy. So it was clearly a post docetaxel chemotherapy population. Primary endpoint was PSA response in favor of lutetium over cabazitaxel, which we know to be good. Cabazitaxel is already proven to be better to, than switching from one hormone therapy to the next in the CARD trials published in the New England Journal. But this has hints that maybe PSA response, better with lutetium. Progression-free survival, combining composite criteria of PSA and imaging radiographic, better for lutetium. Side effects, better. I mean, you get some unique things with lutetium. You get some dry mouth, dry tears, drying out your eyes. But you get much less suppression of your blood counts, much less suppression of your immune system, neutropenia, neutrophils, which are your infection-fighting cells, much less suppression of your platelet counts. So in general, less toxic. Pretty interesting data. But the thing is, it wasn't a registration study, not significant data for overall survival, as I'm showing in this slide. This was an update that we just had at ASCO 2022. No difference in overall survival, but I will point out the study was not statistically powered to show overall survival. You would need a bigger study, more patients, to really, really be able to show that benefit. Okay, but what we did learn recently this year is from GU ASCO, similar to the vision trial where we had that data from ASCO showing higher pet uptake, mean SUV being higher, patients more apt to do better with lutetium, 617. Similarly here in this study, therapy, if your SUV pet mean uptake was greater than or equal to 10, again, they're a quantifiable measure, those patients had much better outcomes with lutetium PSMA versus chemo, versus the ones that had lower uptake, still better than chemotherapy, but not so much better. So again, I think we can use some of this data. My take home that I put in bold here on this next slide is that although there's no overall survival benefit in the therapy trial for lutetium 617 PSMA over cabazitaxel for patients who you know, have metastatic castration resistant prostate cancers, progressive PSMA PET positive, have received docetaxel and a prior you know, hormonal androgen receptor pathway inhibitor or novel hormonal therapy, I would say that still, even though there's no overall survival benefit there, there's better PSA response, there's better progression-free survival, there's less toxicity, better quality of life, and the dosing schedule, I haven't even talked about that. Cabazitaxel is given once every three weeks, Lutetium PSMA 617, IV once every six weeks. So a little less intense and more and less cumbersome for you as a patient. These are all in favor of Lutetium PSMA 617. So, I, I won't say it's definitive, but I'll say that there's clearly enough hints and benefits to say that yeah, if I were in this situation, I might prefer to receive lutetium 617 PSMA. But here's where the prognostic and potentially predictive biomarkers come in. I'm calling PSMA PET here a biomarker because that's what it is. Higher SUV mean uptake from both of these studies showed better outcomes with the lutetium six, PSMA 617. So if you get a pet, PSMA PET and you don't uptake very much, I might think hard about whether lutetium 617 PSMA is right for you. If you don't uptake at all, it's not right for you. You have some sort of prostate cancer, aggressive variant, neuroendocrine, amphocrine. I'm throwing out all these terms, but these are kind of weird prostate cancers, okay, that don't express PSMA. You shouldn't get lutetium 617 PSMA. If you have super high uptake, you should feel reassured that you're more apt, apt to respond and do better with it. If you have kind of lowish uptake, uh, that's a question mark. These studies don't answer that, but those might be situations where, especially if your disease is moving fast, you might lean more towards chemotherapy, cabazitaxel. So I think we can get some hints from these studies as to how to select treatment better for our patients. Okay, the last section. Now this section, um, I'm not an expert in this, I'm gonna say this. It's looking at the fact that lutetium 617 PSMA is a new drug. 
we in medical oncology haven't used it much. You know, nuclear medicine is helping us administer it. Radiation oncology is helping us administer it. They haven't used it much. There are new side effects that we're not used to treating. You know, the whole dry mouth thing, xerostomia is what we call it. That's new. We haven't treated that much. So we got to think about it. And we got to come up with good mechanisms and good teaching education modules for our patients and ways to treat it when it happens and ways to prevent it. So what I did in this slide is I, I spent some time going online. Dr. Google's pretty helpful. But looking up things to avoid and things to do to avoid dry mouth. Okay, so things to avoid. Caffeine dries you out. Alcohol dries you out. Mouthwashes have a lot of alcohol in it. So get a mouthwash that doesn't have alcohol in it. Tobacco dries you out, smoking or chewing tobacco. Get away from that. Antihistamines and decongestants can dry you out. And just being a mouth breather, that can dry you out too. So these are things not to do. Breathe through your nose, okay? These are things that you can say, I'm gonna cut this out of my life habits and I'm gonna avoid this. So because I'll tell you, it sounds like not a big deal. Dry mouth sounds like not a big deal. But when your mouth's really dry, no fun, no fun. It's hard to eat, you know, it's, it, it's, it's kind of gross, right? So you got to find things to do also, and things to do. Sip water regularly, sips. Add moisture to the air. When you sleep at night, use a room humidifier. You can chew sugar-free gum or suck on sugar-free hard candies to stimulate the flow of saliva. And in particular, there is something called xylitol, which is kind of like an artificial sugar that can be in mouthwash and it can be in certain gums and candies that might be able to help with this. Okay, and that's something to look for. Carboxymethyl cellulose is another ingredient to look for. Hydroxyl ethyl cellulose is another ingredient to look for. So you're gonna be looking on your mouthwash labels, on your gum labels, etc. You can find this stuff on Amazon and order some of this. And then the last case, you can try over-the-counter saliva. Sounds gross, right? I don't know many patients that like over-the-counter saliva substitutes. Okay, but it can be tried. Okay, and I would say, you know, these are things to consider, things to avoid, things to do. Now, I have to give credit here to a friend and colleague in the field named Brian Lewenda. He is a radiation oncologist, used to be in Nevada, but now is in Washington, Eastern Washington. And I went recently to ASCO Direct. Uh, they have lectures all over the place in the country. They're working, CME providers working in collaboration with ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology. And they have all these meetings in, in different cities, different communities for oncologists in the community to go to. And I gave a talk at one in Las Vegas. I did one in Seattle too, but the one in Las Vegas, uh, Brian was there and he gave a great talk because he's a radiation doctor. And he gave a great talk looking at alternative methods to help with different side effects of treatment for cancer patients. And again, this is for head and neck cancer patients because head and neck cancer patients get a lot of radiation to the head and neck region, which can cause xerostomia, dry mouth, because it irradiates the salivary glands, okay? And the reason patients with lutetium get it is, is because it's essentially radiating the salivary glands. PSMA is actually highly expressed in the salivary glands and it brings the radiation there and drops it off. So this is a little different because that's directed external beam radiation in head and neck cancer patients. But I'm extrapolating from this because I'm looking for things to try. I can warn patients things to do, things not to do. But when I see it, there, people are still looking for, well, what can I do now to treat it? Well, Brian actually presented this interesting day, and I borrowed these slides from him, which I think he borrowed from ASCO. But this is in head and neck cancer patients who had radiation-induced dry mouth. And they randomized patients to standard oral hygiene, to standard oral hygiene plus true acupuncture or standard oral hygiene and sham acupuncture. And sham acupuncture is just putting your needles in random places, not in the true pressure points. Okay, now acupuncture is something that I do recommend for some patients in my clinic. Hot flashes, it can help with, it's good data in breast cancer for that, so I do recommend it for some of my patients with prostate cancer who have really bad hot flashes from their hormonal therapies, okay? Pain and nausea. There's data to show all this can be beneficial. Don't understand how, 
But again, we don't understand everything in life, and so we have to accept the data is the data. So I like these studies where they're testing the question of acupuncture with sham acupuncture because we know there is a placebo effect. Well, I'm a human being. We're all human beings. You get something, some treatment, sometimes you think that there's benefit there. Maybe the treatment's not doing anything, but you have this placebo effect. So the way to really test it is not to do acupuncture versus nothing. It's to, to do acupuncture versus sham acupuncture where you pick random points. And so this is a cool next slide. I'm not going to propose to know anything about these pressure points where they're doing the acupuncture, but this just shows the points where you know people have been studying acupuncture for thousands of years where this may help with the salivary glands and with xerostomia. And this next slide shows the sham points where they did on the ear that are random points that are not known to help with the salivary glands. And they even use this device where it just kind of pokes in superficially, feels like real acupuncture, but is not real acupuncture. So pretty neat that they did that. And here are the xerostomia symptoms. You can see that over time, you know, week four, week eight, week 12, that patients that got true acupuncture had the lowest xerostomia scores. And patients that got sham acupuncture also had improvement in xerostomia, you know, over those that, you know, didn't get any acupuncture at all. So what this tells me is that there is a placebo effect. Doing sham acupuncture works, but doing the real thing works even better. And here's fact G, which is like a 27 question scale for patients with cancer, looking at all kinds of quality of life issues. And this, they have statistics to it. They looked again at no acupuncture, sham acupuncture, and real act, true acupuncture. And you can see that true acupuncture is not only better than no acupuncture, it's better than the placebo effect that you get from sham acupuncture, which again benefits, but the real thing benefits even more. Okay? So this is interesting. I mean, I can't say this is going to work with lutetium induced xerostomia, but acupuncture, you know, is a reasonably low cost, low toxicity thing to try. I have no problems with trying it with some of my patients and hopefully we'll be able to design some studies that really ask this question as to whether it benefits patients that get xerostomia or dry mouth um, from lutetium 617. I will just tell you that in addition to this group, there's other efforts ongoing out there. There's a guy, uh, a nuclear medicine a guy, he's trained in nuclear medicine and in oncology, and he's on faculty of the National Cancer Institute. His name's Franklin Lin, and I've looked into some of his work where he's working with a dentist that does cannulation of the salivary glands. And what they do is they cannulate the salivary glands and they inject cold tracer that binds up and soaks up all the PSMA expressing cells in the salivary glands, then they give you the treatment. So it's already soaked up, so the treatment doesn't go to the wrong place. It doesn't go to the salivary glands and cause the side effects. And so they've been doing it in animal models. I think they're getting ready to do it in humans, so I'm going to keep my eye out for that data as well. And again, this is not my area of expertise, but if there's a new drug with new side effects, I feel like it's my obligation to learn about it and think about any sort of alternative methods that might help my patients to get it. I'm going to wrap up here, and here's my bullet point wrap-ups. The ones that are in bold are the things that I think are prime time now. The other stuff is maybe stuff to come. For patients that are fit with docetaxel who have metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, consideration should be given to adding either darolutamide or abiraterone to androgen deprivation therapy and, and docetaxel, triple combination therapy. But we have to recognize this is a highly selected group of patients with de novo metastatic prostate cancer presented with metastatic disease. Triple combination is not the only standard of care. You can have patients with lower volumes of disease, recurrent disease. They're probably not ideal for triple combination therapy, but some sort of treatment intensification with adding abirat or nenzalutamide, apalutamide, or docetaxel to hormonal therapy might be necessary for these patients should be strongly considered if you have a patient who's fit enough to receive them. In regards to PARP inhibitors, abiraterone for first-line metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, when you add norepirate, 
If you have one of these select DNA repair gene alterations, that seems to add radiographic progression free survival benefit. And in an unselected population, adding a lap rib to abiraterone, regardless of whether you have a DNA repair gene alteration or not, seems to add radiographic progression free survival benefit. I still think we need to wait to see overall survival data. I, it's not mature yet. I still think we need to see what the regulators think about this. Um, I don't know that this, administering this combination is the definitive right thing to do, maybe for select patients, but I think we need to wait and see and more data on sequencing is gonna be necessary to know because again, adding things together may not be better than one after the next. We just can't tell from these studies. Lutetium PSMA 617 very clearly offers survival benefit for those patients who have received a novel hormonal therapy and have received a taxane chemotherapy with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. Similar overall survival benefit to cabazitaxel, but potentially more quality of life benefits and other efficacy benefits like PSA and progression free survival. So I do kind of lean more towards Lutetium PSMA 617 over cabazitaxel for those patients, but I lean even more heavily for those who uptake a lot of PSMA on their PET scan, because it might be a prognostic and potentially predictive biomarker. If you don't uptake so much, I might lean more towards chemotherapy there. And xerostomia, or dry mouth, from salivary glands that aren't working well, this is a new side effect of Lutetium PSMA 617. We need to monitor for it, prevent, and be thinking about newer treatment methodologies. All right, so with that, I'll wrap up, and I'm sure we're going to have some great discussion with Dr. Moyad now. Thanks so much. There it is, the great Dr. Evan Yu, the great Dr. Evan Yu. Look what I did for you. I actually made a sign after your incredible presentation. I said, Dr. Evan Yu, you are the man, right? Because when you first came to our conference <laughs> in 2018, I gave you the you are the man. But then I put, before we get started, but who's your BFF based on video interviews? Do you know what the answer is to that question? I believe his name is Dr. Moyad. Yeah. Do you, do you know why? Let me explain something to you. If you ever well, doubt. The one reason why is that you gave me a, you gave me a cool t-shirt. I know. Photos, pictures on it. I mean. <laughs> I know I mean, that was in person though, but still. Yeah. Well, You're we have a t you we have a t man, Thank man. you. Well, we have a t-shirt for you today too. And after we send it to you and you put it on, we're going to take a photo and share it with the audience. So your t-shirt we're sending you All right. is, a, is another one. It's a surprise. Let's it's already it. on its way. You've got to put it on and take a selfie okay. and then we're going to post it after this lecture. But to answer your question on Okay. Why I'm your BFF is that I went back through every video interview you've ever done. This is how I do my homework. And even though you're one of the most famous oncologists in the world, the reality is when you go to these big meetings, you know, you get 100, 150. Every time you and I do an interview, we get 10,000 plus views. 10,000. Are you serious? Yes. Yeah. So our last wow, one that we amazing. talked about, we, the last one we talked about chemo, I think, is almost at 8,000 in just a year. And so I thought, man, wow. we need each other like peanut butter and jelly, I think, because otherwise nobody would watch us. We should start doing professional blogging then, you know, and, and like be one of these YouTubers. <laughs> That's right, baby. <laughs> and of course, because All you right. and I have been friends. New job for us. There he is, new job. I just wanted to bring up that fact to the audience that every time you and I, every time you do a presentation and I do Q&A with us, Together, we, we close in on 10,000 in no time. The last one, I think, is at 7,500. And these numbers are just so far beyond what doctors watch at videos. So this one will be in the tens of thousands. So, but I, that's why I have to show you, I know you're not a football fan, but last year we played University of Washington and we won 31 to 10. So I just want to share that with you in football. Well, I actually am a football fan. But you I am a football fan. The only reason I pretend not to be one is I don't want to talk about things like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew you were going to rub football. that in. And no, no, I have to rub it in because like I told a friend of mine, whenever we win, you rub it in. 
And whenever I lose, we go, hey, man, what's the big deal? It's just a football game played by 18-year-olds. So I found psychologically on how to give myself therapy when we lose or when we win. Your talk was hot, baby. Look at this from my Taco Bell days. These are hot sauces. That was a hot talk. So here's what I want to do. I'm telling you, this is one of, the, one of the most viewed talks I've seen in a long time. This is just so state of the art. It was so, so good, but you covered a lot of material. So I want to do something because you're, you're a smart guy. I want to go back through your material in my mind based on the study, and then you tell me based on the study, the take home point. So I, I, I want to do a summary of your summary because there's going to be so many advanced patients watching this based on your thoughts of the trial and what it meant, which is almost exactly the same as your summary points, but it's just kind of a different look. So do you mind if we do that for a second? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Lead the way. You started with a trial called Peace One, right? Peace One. Basically, yeah. the take-home yeah. message Peace for one. advanced patients, if they want to talk about Peace One with their doctor, the take-home message for Peace One <laughs> in Dr. Evan Yu's mind was basically what? Peace One's take home message, basically what? Yeah, if you have metastatic prostate cancer that presented de novo, meaning you were diagnosed with prostate cancer and metastatic disease at the same time, and you got high volumes of disease, that we know adding abiraterone has benefit to hormonal therapies, but adding abiraterone to hormonal therapies and docetaxel also adds significant survival benefits. So triple combination therapy, androgen deprivation therapy, docetaxel chemotherapy, abiraterone for this select patient population, very significant survival benefit. Okay, so that's where you kept coming up with the name, triple combination therapy. Don't be scared to talk about that with your physician. So this is high volume disease now can you break this down i'm not asking you to give me the exact definition there's a couple words you use as we go through a couple of these trials that i think can confuse a lot of people just based on the language when you say high volume versus low volume uh do you just mean do you just mean a lot of spots and a lot of places i mean how, how do i know if i'm high volume versus low volume basically i know i don't i'm not saying you have to get specific just how do I even know if I have high volume disease? Yeah, I think the simple way to think about it is if your disease is spread to an organ, liver, lung, something like that, that's high volume. Okay. If your disease is only in the lymph nodes, that's low volume. If your disease is in the bones, whether it's just in the bones or the bones in the lymph node, then I'd count lesions. Really? Four or more with at least one outside of the middle, meaning the spine or the pelvis. You got one spot outside, that can be the humerus, that can be the femur, that can be the ribs. All of that would then put you in a high volume. So the reason is there are old studies performed way back in the 80s and 90s that were negative studies, unfortunately. And I mean 1980s, 1990s, okay? Or at <laughs> even older than that, some of them might have started. but. These studies showed that this characteristic breakdown of where the disease is located and how much disease you have has prognostic value. It'll help tell how well somebody will do or how not well somebody will do. And so some of these studies then started using these older criteria and they started mixing criteria from different studies to formulate this high volume, low volume breakdown. It's not an absolute. Are there problems with the way they do it? Yes, but it's the way that it was done in some of the studies, specifically like the charted study with docetaxel. So I think the simple way to do it, and again, you told me I don't need to go through the whole definition, I more or less did, but if you have it in an organ, high volume. If you don't have it anywhere except for the lymph nodes, low volume. And if you have it in the bones, well then there's some subtleties and you need to talk to your doctor more about that. And then there's a count in the bone. There's like a num there's a count in location, right? You said. I mean, that's a really, really good summary yeah. of high volume. Okay, okay. So piece one is a game changer in the sense that triple therapy. A, a lot of people will automatically qualify for triple therapy, right? Okay. So you say high volume, and then you told me what low volume is, but why not? Again, I'm not looking for a specific answer, but can you just explain? 
why can't low volume people use this? You're talking about metastatic disease. I don't want, nobody wants metastatic disease. Why do the high volume people get all right. the hardcore drugs? Why don't the low volume people get the hardcore yeah. drugs too? Yeah, and, and I'll just tell you this. We don't know that low volume disease patients shouldn't be getting this. Okay. But what we do know is, is that we need more data. Okay, we need to follow the data out. And we do have some hints from the charted study that low volume disease patients didn't benefit with chemo. So again, as I mentioned during my talk, you know, it's not all about if we can give it, we should give it. It's about should we give it? Do the benefits outweigh the risks? Everything has a cost in life. I always use the term, there's no free lunch. If you have low volume cancer, sure, it's bad. You don't you don't want to have low volume cancer, but the good news is you can live for many, 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 many years. And if you hit it too hard with too much treatment, maybe the side effects aren't worth it. Maybe you're gonna live so long because we keep developing newer treatments in prostate cancer that you never die of the disease and you just treat it like a chronic disease. Um, in that case, if we hit you too hard and give you too many side effects and, and affect your quality of life. Now you have to ask, was that worth it? Did we do the right thing? And so we're constantly always balancing this cost-benefit, risk-benefit ratio. If you just can, you say, I can do it, let's do it even if we don't know if it's beneficial or not, well, sometimes you did the wrong thing because what you did is you added excess toxicity, excess costs, and maybe there was no benefit there to begin with. So. The reason not to do it yet for low volume disease is, I don't think the data is there to show benefit. And there's already some hints from some studies that chemo maybe doesn't benefit patients with low volume disease. So who wants chemotherapy if they're not gonna get benefit from it? We know you're gonna get side effects from it. So can you help me educate me on this? Cause this has bothered me for about 30 years. So I, I reserve my, I reserve this kind of personal therapy for guys and, and, and gals like you who, who know the business. A lot of times people with metastatic disease and, and a variety of cancers, and I know, cause you also do work in other urologic cancers, right? So they'll say, I wanna throw the kitchen sink at it. You know, I wanna throw everything in the kitchen sink at it because it's cancer, I go after that. So you, you just outlined a, 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 for low volume disease, one of the reasons you don't wanna do that. And uh, two reasons, you said no benefit and you might develop toxicity that wasn't there. Can I, can I ask you about a third thing I've never talked about with you in my entire career? Is it theoretically possible that if you're also too aggressive with low volume disease, I'm just, I'm just getting you to think for a second, theoretically possible that you could also be causing a mutation or a variant that you don't want, you know, almost like a virus. In other words, so could there be a consequence to this becoming an aggressive phenotype if you're getting too aggressive with something that's not aggressive? Yeah, I think it's a theory, right? Uh, I think we don't know that, Mark, but I, I think that it's always possible. It's theoretically possible. So that's why I would say that, you know, the way I look at things is, you know, we don't know everything in medicine and science. We have a foundation of knowledge in science, and that's our foundation. There has to be some art on top of it as a clinician, otherwise they just replace us with robots. And so what I tell my patients is we have to work with that foundation of science and build on it. What we shouldn't do is just knock that foundation down, right? Because we already right. have this foundation of knowledge, and there are a lot of unanswered questions where that's the art on top of the science, right? But right. we shouldn't ignore the science just do only you know voodoo art right yep. and so that's that's how I, I i do my practice so if we don't if we know that there's side effects we know that there's toxicity but we have no idea if there's benefit seems like to me the math shows that we shouldn't be doing the wrong thing okay so we shouldn't ignore the science we should pay attention to the science and use the art for the unanswered things on top of the science well, the reason I can't get this out of my head is I think about oligometastatic prostate cancer and how this has taken on a new name. And here's the idea. It's sort of a, it's, it's not a very aggressive approach right now. And people are trying to figure it out. And, you know, and so that's why I'm so glad you talk about high volume versus low volume. Because the, the idea too, what you're basically saying is when, when you identify an FDA approval, like 
or a situation like the piece one where it's high volume. I mean, we're excited to see what happens in low volume, but you got to be careful about going too far with this data. Right. I think that's really important. I think this data is great. It's transformational in the fact that I mentioned this is kind of an unmet need population because this patient population has more limited survival. You know, it's not, you know, in the past we'd say metastatic prostate cancer, median survival three and a half years. Then we said five years, and now there's some studies that are looking out at six, seven years, but it's not everyone, not this population. This is the more aggressive population. We need this for this more aggressive population. But if you have less aggressive disease and you draw a bell-shaped curve in the middle of that curve seven years, well, a lot of my patients are on the good side of the curve. It might be more than a decade, right? And the thing yeah. I always have to emphasize is with a chronic disease, you always have to be careful that you don't over-treat it just as much as you don't under-treat it. It's, mm. You gotta be careful both ways. Because if you over-treat it and you give too much side effects, too much toxicity, or you over-treat and you run out of things to do, yeah, maybe you hurt people more than help people that way. So yeah. I, you know, that's, that's the way I look at it. And I think this is really important data because it's for an unmet need population with really aggressive characteristics. But we need to be careful not to just immediately import it to good prognosis, low risk characteristic patients and say, go ahead and just plow it in because if it's good for them, it must be good for you. It might not be. We might over treat it and you might not be happy with the results. So that's the take home from this piece one. So if patients want to talk about piece one, you got this triple therapy, high volume, they can see a significant benefit. You're, you're really excited. I can see why it's exciting. And then the next one you talked about, which actually was interesting, it just based on that, there was the FDA put out, hey, you know what, there's a new approval here. Um, so this Aerosense trial, right? Can you, can you basically, in so many sentences again, just say, if you ever want to talk about Aerosense, A-R-A-S-E-N-S, -S, the Aerosense trial, what's basically the pithy take home message from that trial and why is it such a game changer and why did the FDA put this out? Uh, in the you know in August that said hey this is a significant finding essentially yeah so the game the, the the message would be if you have metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer and are fit for dose of taxol that adding darolutamide to your base of androgen deprivation therapy and dose of taxol chemotherapy leads to very significant survival benefit with the caveat that the vast majority of these patients, 86%, had de novo metastatic disease and presented when they were first diagnosed with metastatic disease. That's not everyone. This is also a very aggressive subset of patients. I love the study, it's very cleanly done, but again, I think that the benefit is clear for this subset of patients um, with these characteristics. Um, I don't know that we should be generalizing it to everybody with metastatic prostate cancer. I want to ask you something else within that. We talked about people need to understand their cancer, whether it's high volume, whether it's low volume, whether it's hormone sensitive, whether it's CRPC. But I'll tell you another term that's thrown out all the time when I'm watching videos. And again, I'm not expecting a specific answer, but I think it's an important uh, word to contemplate. Because when I, I've used, I've watched physicians use this word differently. What do most people mean by the word metastatic? I'm not saying explain the word. I'm just saying how I have heard some people call uh, local lymph node disease metastatic. I have seen how the, how lymph nodes being positive beyond the pelvic region, which is under the TNM system, that's a metastatic site, right? That's a metastatic node. So how do I think of the word metastatic? Does that mean it's just left the prostate and it's the area around the prostate? Or does that mean it's got to travel quite a distance? What comes to your mind? Because so many doctors seem to throw that word out in all these scenarios. Yeah, that's a really good question. And the reason I think it's a good question is, is because it's used in all different scenarios. Different people have different definitions for it. And I'm just going to try to make it simple and say that Technically, I have two definitions for it, okay? I have what I consider to be the real definition, and then I have what I consider to be the pragmatic definition, okay? The real definition of metastatic is 
any cell escape from their original organ. That's all, that's metastatic disease, okay? You have a cancer in an organ, it left that original organ, that's metastatic disease. Now, that doesn't mean we can find it. That doesn't mean we know where it is because maybe it's microscopic, but it's still metastatic, right? So that's the real definition of metastatic. Now for the pragmatic, practical definition of metastatic, which is what I think most people mean when they say metastatic. Okay, that means they can see it on a scan. They see that it's left the original organ and they can see it on the scan. Okay, now even that, you could break it down. Well, what kind of scan? CAT scan, bone scan, PSMA PET, right? So in my mind, because all these studies, and we're talking about research studies, used m conventional imaging studies, that's what I'm referring to when I say metastatic, is by conventional imaging, and I also will say that I, it has to be more than lymph nodes and outside of the true pelvis. Mm. Now that's slicing and dicing pragmatic definition of metastatic way down. But that's what I mean because that's what it would take to be eligible for these studies. To have conventional imaging metastatically identified disease and having it outside of the true pelvis if it's lymph node only. Of course, if you have bone metastases or liver metastases, that's a done deal. It's metastatic. Clearly, no one's going to debate that. Okay, so it's kind of gradations if you think about it. That you could take the pragmatic definition and break it down. But that's what I mean when I say metastatic. Conventional imaging, CAT scan or bone scan, with you know, either bone mets, visceral mets, which means it's in an organ, or lymph node mets only that are above the true pelvis. And the reason is if it's below the true pelvis, one could potentially encompass it all in a radiation field and irradiate the prostate and irradiate those lymph nodes. But again, the true definition of metastatic is even one microscopic cell escaped from the prostate, escaped from its original organ, we're just not able to identify it yet. And mm. so that's tough because oftentimes we're now seeing patients that have conventional imaging studies, they don't find any disease. You do a PSMA PET and you see this one tiny six, seven, eight centimeter lymph node that's positive and people say, well, that's metastatic disease. Is it metastatic disease? It is metastatic disease by the true definition. Is it metastatic disease by the pragmatic definition? Not really. Yeah. So, yeah. but it is metastatic disease by the definition. Yes. No, that really. So that complex really issue, and I've never had anybody ask me that. So I'm glad you did, and I think it's really important for patients to to understand that those distinctions. No, and I really appreciate that you took it on because as I always try to remind the audience, especially the other times I've talked with you, um, essentially that you have no idea what's coming. I have no idea sometimes what I'm going to even ask, but the, the reality is over oh, the past few years, everyone's throwing out this word metastatic and it's almost like become a jaded term. It's almost like cliche. And I'm thinking, wait a second, I've heard people refer to metastatic where cancer is in the pro prostatic fossa, you know, after a radical prostatectomy, I've heard them refer to metastatic when it's just in the pelvic lymph nodes. I've heard it when the non-regional lymph nodes, I've heard it then in the bone, I've heard it when it's in the liver. So that really helps a lot, but you can see the confusion, right? For patients, I mean, depending on who you're talking to, you've got a lot of different definitions of metastatic. I, I couldn't agree more. I don't think we're going to change the terminology that people use, uh, but I, you know, that's how I think about it. That's how I break it down. No, it's beautiful. I love it. I love it. Because one of the things you do well, and I'm not, I, just, I don't know, maybe I'm getting, maybe because I'm getting old and now I'm getting sentimental. I mean, the reason we have you here over and over again is the way you teach. The way you teach to me is very practical. It's for someone exactly like me who's not an oncologist. I just, I can understand it. You explain it in a way that actually makes me understand it. So then I want, I'm encouraged to ask more questions that help even micro dissect things further. So I want to ask you something. So I think knowing the piece one and the Arison study is, is very critical. Also in your talk, when you were talking about those studies, especially piece one, it brought up a question. I, I don't know if I've asked you before, because you said there's this, there's this group that gets radiation too, right? And they don't, you don't know the results yet, right? And so, so the idea brings up the idea of, of cytoreductive procedures and debulking. The idea here is that when someone has advanced disease, it's gone beyond the prostate, metastatic, there's still viable tumor potentially in the prostate itself. 
And so the question is, where are we, where are we with that now in terms of someone having metastatic or advanced disease and still going after the primary tumor in the prostate, for example? Where are we with that? And where do you think it might go? Because I know it's not, it's not clear, but where are we with that and where do you think it might go? That's a really, really good question. Um, um, you're so good at asking the salient points, the relevant points. So where we're at right now with radiation to the prostate for somebody who has already advanced metastatic incurable disease is this. Number one is there's good theory behind it. There's a bunch of retrospective studies where people have looked back at patients who had metastatic disease and got local treatment of the prostate, and they seem to imply benefit, but you have to be careful with retrospective series because there can be bias introduced and unknown kind of you know, selection bias in the patients that were looked at. So the only way to really prove something in, in a clinic is to do a clinic, well-designed, randomized, prospective clinical trial, which has been done. So let's talk about what's been done. So the first study that read out is the HORAD trial. It took patients with metastatic prostate cancer and randomized them to get radiation or no radiation to the prostate in addition to standard therapy, which at the time was you know hormonal therapy, androgen deprivation therapy. That was flat out negative. There was no benefit to cytoreduction or reducing the tumor burden in the prostate. And that's just probably because those patients had really high PSAs in that study, really high volumes of disease. It was all over the place for most of the patients in the study. And so one could argue that treating just one spot when you got a whole lot of other spots probably isn't gonna lead to benefit. All right, so that's negative study number one. Study number two, this was the Stampede study, and I keep bringing up that name over and over again because it's a UK study with a million arms, essentially. But in one arm, they did radiation. And in that study, for the overall analysis of people with metastatic disease, there was no benefit to adding radiation to the prostate. Negative study number two. Now, However, in that study, the Stampede study, they had a subgroup analysis, and it was pre-specified, meaning they planned to look at it. And they mentioned it in advance that we're going to look at it and statistically analyze the low volume subset. Because their theory was, maybe it doesn't work for everybody, people with lots and lots of disease. But if you have maybe limited disease, one, two, three, four spots, and we reduce that tumor burden, maybe that'll lead to survival outcomes down the road. Okay, just less spots there to be active, to mutate, to become nastiness, okay? And that subgroup analysis was positive, <clears throat> okay? So this has led to a lot of, I think, differing opinions in the field. I think there are a lot of radiation oncologists who think, hey, that's a done deal. There's a study that's positive. I can irradiate it. I can. Thus, I will. Go to a barber. I'm going to get my, you're going to get your hair cut, right? Perfect. So, you go to radiation oncologists. They know, they're familiar with that data. You got low volume metastatic disease. You're going to get radiation. Some of my medical oncology colleagues, I'll just tell you, my group here, there's 10 of us that are GU medical oncologists. I think there are two or three that feel very strongly, at least two that I can think of, about radiating the prostate or at least offering it to patients. I'm one of those who are like, well, two negative studies overall, one positive subgroup analysis, that's not definitive for me. Do I ever offer it to patients? I talk to patients about it. But I don't encourage people to do it. If people hear about it and said, I'm okay with two negative and one positive subgroup, I wanna do it, I'll refer the patient to a radiation oncologist. But what I will tell people is, is that there's more data coming. And that data comes from piece one that we talked mm. about. And mm. that data will also come from a study called SWOG 1802. Mm. And the reason I like SWOG 1802 is this. Is SWOG 1802 is a study where people get randomized with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer to standard systemic therapy, which is essentially androgen deprivation, and you can add abiraterone or enzalutamide or docetaxel. It's whatever you think is sta reasonable standard, which I think is with treatment intensification. You can even do androgen deprivation therapy, docetaxel, and darolutamide now. Or that standard systemic therapy plus treatment to the prostate. And the reason I like it is treatment of the prostate can be dealer's choice, up to the patient, up to the providers. And that dealer's choice can be surgery, and that dealer's choice can be radiation. 
Now the reason I like that is when you look at Stampede, they used an unusual radiation schedule. They didn't give full doses of radiation. They gave lower doses of radiation and not necessarily daily, daily radiation like we normally do. But in SWOG ATL2, people are going to use standard higher doses of radiation. And so one has to ask, maybe that'll lead to better outcomes. And maybe having surgery in there could lead to better outcomes as well. So in my mind, the jury's still out. If I have a patient that's willing, interested in this topic, willing to explore it, and willing to undergo randomization, I would encourage that any day of the week because... I think we don't know the definitive right or wrong answer yet, and in that situation, what better than enrolling on a clinical trial? Because not only are you going to help, is that knowledge going to help contribute to science in the future and help other people, but maybe you get lucky and you get the right treatment too. And I always tell people that when you go on a clinical trial, if we knew what the right answer was, we'd already tell you to go on it. The reason you're going on a clinical trial is this is promising. But we don't yet know what the right or wrong answer is. And the number one reason to do it is you're an altruistic individual. That knowledge, whether it's positive, negative, whether it's good, bad, whatever, that's going to help a lot of other people down the road. A lot of my patients, they have sons. You know, they have nephews. They're thinking about others with prostate cancer. They want to do it. But as a side effect, as a side reason, maybe you'll get lucky and you get a treatment that's very beneficial and they'll help you before anybody else could get it as well. So that's the reason to go on to a clinical trial. I am not a fan, and I'm sorry if anybody in the audience has done this, I'm not a fan of going on to a randomized clinical trial and if you get randomized and you know it to an arm you don't like, drop it out. That ruins the integrity of the trial and hurts the future for the field. I don't like that. I'm just saying it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> There's a lot to address there, a lot to chew on, right, Mark? Well, I, I was chewing on fine till the end, till the end, <laughs> till the end. It's it's a tough call, right? Because um, you're talking to a guy who there's a lot of cancer in the family, and um, nah, that's that's a tough one. But I understand what you're saying. Well, but... I do too. My mom died of cancer. My dad died of cancer. My sister at 59 just died of cancer. But we have to oh, look out sorry, for man. the entire field and the future and for all of society. It's the right thing to do. You do, but but at the same time, to defend what you said, I mean, when you're put in those arms, if there's futility there, it's not as if they take this on and just keep going, even though it's not showing any benefit. That's why there's an independent safety monitoring committee that says, hey, this is working, let's stop it, everybody should get this treatment, or this is not working, let's move you to something else, right? It's just not, I don't want people to think it's just kind of some random laboratory experiment, but... Um, no, so, of course not. No, 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 no. 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 So, so, for example, in that magnitude study, I showed you that futility analysis, right? With yeah. the all comers, yeah. the non biomarker positive patients, they built that in early so that they could find out if people aren't benefiting, we're not going to harm people by giving them extra treatment that's not going to help them. So, that's you right. know, that's a well designed clinical trial where people think about it in advance. No one wants to have our patients be, you know, lab rats. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I am talking about is you don't know the right or wrong answer. And you go on to study and you're randomized to an arm where you don't know the right or wrong answer. You shouldn't drop out. You should accept that in advance or don't enroll under the trial. I'm a big yeah. believer in that. If you did know the right or wrong answer, well, of course, but then you probably don't need the study. <laughs> No, no, I just wanted you to further explain it because, you know, we deal with uh, sometimes we get hundreds of people yeah. that suddenly go off on these tangents. Well, everybody gets a placebo. I'm like, no, that's not cancer medicine. It's not everybody gets a placebo. There's placebo use in certain no, situations. No, no, no. But a lot of times it's standard of care is yeah. your other go to. But uh, we could open up a whole thing. But I um, so here's the deal, I think. When you're talking about cytoreductive, and so you're talking about SWOG 1802, right? That's the one you're excited about. Right. When is SWOG 1802 going to well, be done? That's one study I'm excited about. Well, well when's that going to oh, be done, you know, though? Am I, I waiting? Pardon? Yeah, good point. Many years, many years from now. Okay, so here's the deal because you, you've written a lot about everything, including imaging, including PET CTs. What's happening now, and you, we, we, we hear this all the time and, and see it from colleagues and all of that, is that people are getting PET CTs for meta, they get metastatic disease. 
but their prostate lights up. There's a lot of activity going on in the prostate, right? So if you're still seeing activity in the prostate, that's why I thought it was interesting that you said that some of your colleagues will entertain possibly treating that area, even though we don't have an answer, I understand. Yeah, they will. Because they, PET CT they has will changed based the game. On that subgroup analysis. Right, because PET CT has right. changed the game. They because will. it shows you what's happening in the prostate too sometimes. You're absolutely right. And so, you know, some people love that stampede subgroup analysis and other people think, ah, maybe it's too early, you know? And again, I think in my mind, that's you know this is still that's a still art component right we just yeah. don't know yet if we knew then these studies that are ongoing now we should shut them down <laughs> right yeah. we should shut yeah. them down if we know already but i don't yeah. think we definitively know and so but you know and, and and so i think it's important to do these studies it's really important to do these studies because treatment to the prostate surgery and radiation in the prostate has side effects it has toxicities anybody that's had treatment of the prostate will know so it's not just a nothing it's not just a walk in the park you want to know that it's benefiting you and yeah. that's why clinical research is important right yeah because yeah. we're going to be able to figure it out and that's why mentioning these key trials are almost as important as the drug names because P advanced patients understanding that the, what what piece one means aerosins means all these trials you're mentioning and that's why it stimulates conversation. I love the fact that you use them in your talk. Okay, so um, when you talk about getting chemo, for example, in, in the Arison study, I mean, how can you reiterate to the audience on average how many chemo treatments are you getting? Right. I mean, when you talk six. about getting dosi toxol, okay, so you're getting six, right? So, when, so does that mean mm -hmm. you get six and you're done? You don't need, you don't yep. get docetaxel anymore? So then no. why? Then why, does every, done. then why does everybody give chemo? I mean, we could talk about the chemo bad rap later on, but we're talking about six treatments and then that's it. You move on. And so basically there must be a reason there. The six became the magic number based on data, right? Going to eight, 10 or 12 didn't provide necessarily any further benefit. Is that correct? Yeah, so I would say this. In metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, the original dose of Taxol studies went up to 10. Okay. Now, in real life, sometimes, you know, we can't make it a 10. Sometimes we make it a 10 and patients are doing well. They want to keep going. We keep going. That's real life, okay? Now, okay. in the studies, where did 6 come from? That's because in the charted study, 6 cycles of dose of Taxol showed overall survival benefit. So that's where six came from for the hormone sensitive setting. And the whole idea is six was just a random number they picked with the idea of saying, okay, we get some good side or reduction here. We want to go to a point where we don't get too many side effects and toxicities. Anybody that's had docetaxel knows that over time, your nails get ratty. You can get peripheral neuropathy, numbness and tingling in the fingertips and toes. You get swelling in the tissue by the nasal lacrimal ducts where tears drain, and then it seems like you're getting excess of teariness, it's just not draining so well. These things are quality of life things that are important. And so you don't wanna push it so far that patients are miserable from that. Um, at the same time, you wanna get enough to where you're getting benefits. So six is kind of where they settled that. It's not, it's, a, it's kind of a made up number, but it makes sense to me too because much more beyond that, I really start to see cumulative toxicities. And I think I'm not sure how much benefit you get beyond that. We want to talk about this. I, I made this sign on March 24th for when we were doing a talk. Is, uh, you know, again, I mean, you and I have been through this. I know that you like to use generic names. I, I, I don't, I like to use trade names. I don't work with these groups, but I just said, I, I, people me memorize the trade names a lot. And it got, a, people realize that this just got approved sure. March 24th. And then you started talking about therapy and the vision trial. And, and so now we have lutetium FDA approved. Um, the first thing I want to ask is that there was a resource issue uh, out there, right? Uh, and now has that been, there was an issue of getting it. Is that issue cleared up or where are you now at your center with getting the product? Yeah, I'm going to be critical again, Mark. 
Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I say it how I think, and I'm not pleased with Novartis. I mean, wow. maybe they couldn't have prevented it, but I'm not pleased. So they make yeah. this drug. They have two production facilities. They had production issues. They had to shut down. It was FDA approved. No one could get it anywhere in the world, not for the clinical trials that were ongoing, not for standard of care. Very frustrating. I had many patients waiting. Many other people across the country had patients waiting. They couldn't get it. I'm upset. Mm. And I think patients that were waiting should be upset. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm trying not to do the whole cold uh, smash thing here right now, but I'm, no. I'm upset about it. So I th- I, I, it's I better. It. It's better. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's better. better, but they're it's, up and is running. They're starting to produce it. Is, but is, is but this, it's is not this... perfect. Okay. No, Go ahead. We got a lot. You were going to say oh, something. No, no, I'm I'm actually shocked you said it. I I really appreciate the candidness. Look, the the company's a good company. Yeah. It's just I think the way this was handled, in terms of I thought there should have been more press releases about supply. There was one, and then I didn't see another one for a while. And we're kind of going, what's going on? So we started getting tons of calls from all around the country, right? Well, what where, where can I go? What can I do? And I I didn't think that was my job to answer those questions. <laughs> Um, so I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, the problem is, is nowhere to go, nothing to do, right? Yeah. That's the problem. It, it, if somebody could do something, that would be helpful. But so here's the deal now. Let's let's move forward. And okay, okay. select centers are able to give it. We're certainly giving it. We've treated tons of people with it. Um, I know there's one other center in the country that's given more than us, but I think we're number two in the country. Uh, but that being said and done, it's very limited supply very limited supply so it's better but we have big wait lists you know we're scheduling out three months from now and the problem is 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 that they still have supply manufacturing issues they're not ramped up they're building another production facility so hopefully they'll have three and that'll take the problem away but i think that won't be until next year so right now patients are still having to wait a long time and anybody new that i see i can't guarantee them anything because the way that it works is, is that you put an order in and nuclear medicine receives it at our center and there's a module or, or, or something that they log into. And nuclear medicine has to sit there and when slots come up, which are limited slots, you gotta grab it. You grab it right away. And then you hold that slot and then you can get a new start. But the company realizes that if they new start everybody, that what will happen is when patients come back for dose number two or three, they're not going to have enough. So they're limiting new starts right now. So if you're a patient that really needs it and you don't have another good alternative, that really sucks. If you have other alternatives, I think it's a good time to do those alternatives, somehow try to get on a wait list or something, but it's challenging. It's really still a big challenge. Not as bad as it was when we had zero, but yeah. it's far from perfect. And I'm still angry. No, I appreciate I appreciate the anger, but I, I think I also is like you said, as we move along constructively. Okay, so now I'm going to see you, uh, because what happens after these videos is a ton of people ends up calling the person who gave the lecture. I want to go see you. I think I'm going to get it in three months, right? But I'm not sure. You're not sure. So then, what's your advice that anybody watching this tape should sit down with their oncologist? Even if they're on the list, they should talk about plan B. I mean, is that this how the game is? I mean, is that how the situation is today? That if in three months you can't get it off, you're on this list, let's talk about what you're going to get instead. Is that how you handle it? Yeah, I mean, it's not my preferred way to handle it, but I don't know how else to handle it. And so I guess the first thing I'll say, Mark, is um, don't hang up from this lecture and call my office and say, I need to get in to see Dr. Yu because I'm actually... You know, I can only say no to so many people, and it's because I don't want to be the bad guy. I'm not the bad guy here. I'm not the person who makes this agent. So a lot of people, we've been getting referrals from all over the place. We don't have the ability to give Lutetium 617 PSMA yet. We hear that you're open. Can we send them to see you? I got an army of patients here of my own right now that I'm struggling to get the agent for. I, I'm, I feel bad, and I'm sorry, but I can't, like keep adding to that list of, of people from all over the, the country or all over the world right now. Um, they, Novartis needs to fix their manufacturing supply issues. 
I would love to see everybody under the sun down the road, but right now I'm, I'm kind of saying no because my answer is going to be, I don't know when I can get it for you. I, I don't have the bandwidth. It's not that I don't have the bandwidth. They're not making enough of it right now. And they're no, just not but you have, the, you, have so, the gray mat, you have the gray matter to offer the second best option when that is not available. And I think, that, I think what's, what's painful to me is watching that there's not enough of those discussions going on. I, I, you know, I'm sure they'll catch up. Everything's going to work out. But, in the t but at least you have plan B discussions, right? I mean, there's always a plan B discussion. But sometimes the discussion is not what people want to hear. Sometimes you're out of therapies that work. And sometimes that discussion is an honest discussion about focusing on quality of life, palliative care, and sometimes hospice. And people don't want to hear about it in general. But the truth of the matter is there does reach a point where treatment might hurt more than benefit someone. And I'm not shy to have that conversation with people because it's the right thing to do. Sometimes just continuing to treat somebody who's not healthy enough to tolerate the treatments, we're hurting people more than we're helping people. And so I can see how people could be frustrated if let's say they live on the other side of the country and they're coming here to see me saying, give me something, give me something. I don't have anything else to give. I'm going to be honest and talk about these sorts of issues because it's important and it's the right thing to do, to talk about there are a time and place where pounding forward with the next treatment that might cause you more side effects and might ruin your quality of life needs to be balanced with focusing on the best quality of life and enjoying the time that you have left to see your family members and friends. And, you know, again, I don't think this is what most people logged on to talk about here, but it's part of pra the practice of oncology. What about the idea that we don't hear much about since this got approved? What about the idea of uh, essentially the uh, you know the radio pharmaceutical out there that's also available that can be used for bone um, that's do you want to talk about that for a second or is that something you don't want to cover i think radium 223 is still a good drug so now you're talking about radium 223 it's that's a right. radio pharmaceutical it only goes to the bone it's only fda approved for patients with symptomatic disease um so the, that's a challenge the other challenge is it doesn't really drop psa but it seems like the bone biomarker alkaline phosphatase is a better marker of who's going to do well and who's not going to. So I would say the two biggest challenges for radium-223 is one is it doesn't treat soft tissue disease like lymph nodes, like visceral disease in the liver or the lungs. And two is it doesn't drop PSA. And I think everybody likes to see their PSA go down. So there is this, I think, psychological thing that, you know, you get married to the PSA and it's tough when you get a drug that theoretically the data shows there's a survival benefit, but it doesn't drop PSA. But it's still a good drug. It's still useful for select patients, and I still definitely reach for it. So radium, the radium product you're talking about is called Zofigo, and you still use it. Uh, yeah, but again, that's the other thing. Okay, okay. And then um, I'm gonna before we go back to Pluvicto, Lutetium, one other side note in this category. Um, is is there anything happening? You know, there are patients that went to Germany and other places for actinium, another type of radio ligand. Do you that might one day compete with lutetium or be utilized? Maybe. Do you see anything happening in the clinical trial world with another radio ligand that could compete with lutetium one day? Absolutely. So uh, there's all different types of radio pharmaceuticals. So the things you can think about manipulating are. Lutetium-617 PSMA has a small molecule that binds to PSMA. There are other types of small molecules. There are antibodies. There are other ways to bind to PSMA. There may be other targets out there that are highly expressed on prostate cancer that maybe in tumors that don't express PSMA, we could go after that. So that's one thing you can manipulate is your binding moiety. Okay, what binds what you're binding to, and what the protein looks like that's doing the binding. The other thing you can manipulate is what's the radio pharmaceutical. Lutetium's a beta emitting radio pharmaceutical. Actinium, that's an alpha emitting radio pharmaceutical. These are different. They are different in how much they spread. They're different in their ability to break DNA. There are pluses and minuses. There's an older thing called I-131, which actually has the highest energy, and that's used in thyroid cancer. There's a mm -hmm. compound 
that's targeting PSMA with I-131 that's being studied in clinical trials right now in prostate cancer, metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. So there's a whole different host of things with one manipulating what you're using to bind to, what you're binding to, and what the radiopharmaceutical is. So there's a lot of things out there that you know can be studied and that I think have promised to add additional benefit and potentially be used in this setting or even other clinical settings, earlier disease states potentially. Okay. So let's go back to lutetium and then we'll go to the rapid, just A to Z, whatever comes at the uh, top of my head. Um, you're very, at, even though there have been the supply issues, it sounds like from your presentation, I realize it's FDA approved now since March 24th, Pluvicto lutetium, you're excited about it. Um, what do, what yeah. are you seeing or what have you, what have you seen in clinical study and clinical trials? Are you seeing PSA responses? Are you seeing some bone mets that go away? I mean, what, what am I, what am I, what am I seeing here? What's the possibility of something that I might see from getting these treatments? Um, can yeah. you elaborate on that a little bit? I, yeah, I am seeing PSA declines. I am not necessarily seeing bone meds that go away, but I wouldn't expect that. Uh, I am seeing patients that get subsequent next PSMA PET with changes, you know, decreased uptake. But I will give a word of caution. PSMA PET has not been approved or even validated as a treatment response modality. So we are doing a study right now. And the results aren't out yet, but I'll say it's kind of one of the early things that we've seen is it might be all over the map. There are certain patients with metastatic disease where you're giving them a treatment, whether it's lutetium or chemotherapy or hormonal therapy, where maybe the changes on PET seem to correspond with things that we know to be considered response, like drop in PSA, like decreased pain. And there are patients where it doesn't correlate at all. So I think we need to pump the brakes on that as well. If patients say, well, I got a PSA PET at baseline, I'm now getting this treatment, let's get another PSA PET and let's use that to determine should I keep going or should I change therapy? I think that's early and preliminary. So I don't know what to do with that. So I'm glad you brought up this topic because it gave us the opportunity to say, we're in the early stages of knowing how to use PSMA PET for determining treatment response or progression. Not clear yet. And so the idea, the idea with chemotherapy in this situation, because again, don't you, isn't the concern with all these radio ligand therapies, the, the, the bone marrow suppression, uh, on hematology issues, how does, how does even chemotherapy come into play in your practice now that Pluvicto's out? You, you, you're using it before, you're using it after, is there a concept that one day they could be combined? I mean, where... We're going to go into chemotherapy a little bit in a little bit, but I'm just, how do I get my head around that right now since that was, since that was approved? So when I can, I will reach for lutetium PSMA 617 first over capacitaxel chemotherapy. Hmm. Okay, when I can, based on the benefits that I showed you in the therapy study. Okay, now when might I ch that change? Okay, situations that might change is where I have a PSMA PET that doesn't uptake at all, I'm definitely going chemo. If I have a PSMA PET that uptakes just a little bit, I might go chemo. If I have a tumor that has a lot of aggressive variant features, maybe neuroendocrine staining, okay, that's like in a variant of prostate cancer, or negative for everything, not hormonal at all, not PSA staining, not androgen receptor expressing, or it has really, really weird you know, genetic profiles, you know, when you do sequencing of the tumor. This is a really extensive discussion, right? But those are patients I might lean more towards chemo. And of course, if I can't get Lutetia and PSMA 617 because the wait list is so long, I'm going to go chemo. So uh, with Cabazitaxel there, because Cabazitaxel is still a good drug. But in a world where maybe people express very high PSMA and Lutetium 617 PSMA was easy to reach for. Yeah, that's probably my preferred treatment uh, for now until we see more data. Uh, but there's, you can see there's a lot of stipulations and situations. And I think that's where the art is important. Yeah, uh, that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, so my last question on this, 
is that you talked about side effects and these new side effects you're seeing, you're seeing dry mouth. And I thought that was really interesting that because you, you brought up acupuncture because it had that role in head and neck cancer, right? And that's so fascinating. The other thing that we used to hear from Heidelberg, and I don't know where it was from the vision trial, is the idea, and I understand it's controversial, some people write about it in the literature, some people don't, about you, the utilization of ice packs to cause vasoconstriction yeah. possibly. So are, are they currently using ice packs with, so I went back to the PI, sorry, the prescription information for, for, for Pluvicto. And then I read for the prescription information, you know, some suggestions to patients, which is always at the very end. There was, I didn't see any mention of it. So where are we with using ice packs 30 minutes before and up to several hours after the treatment as some papers have suggested? Yeah, I think it's a reasonable thing to try. Um, huh. I think, you know, there's not definitive data, but it's a reasonable thing. But I would say this. It's a little bit easier to use ice gloves to prevent neuropathy from taxing chemotherapy. And our center doesn't even have gloves anymore. We just ask them to put their hands in ice or wrap cold packs around their hands and patients don't like it. But it, it goes to show that, you know, the data is not so strong that the center feels that, hey, they need to buy ice gloves for everybody, okay? Uh, maybe COVID also affected our use of gloves. But this is another level of icing. Right? It's a little bit hard to ask somebody to put ice on their cheeks like this, and it's not comfortable. So, and since the data is not like overwhelmingly like, yeah, you gotta do it, it's kind of hard for me to ask patients to do that. Um, if patients are very concerned about it, sure. I have no problem with doing it if they have with dry mouth issues with doing it, but you know, you have to be willing to tolerate the ice in that unusual place. I know there could be discomfort, but, but what? what? What's happening with the patients that are coming into your institute? Why not ask for it? I mean, are they asking for it? Do they know about it? So you bring it up and it's sort of voluntary right now, whether or not I want to apply something like that. So the truth is, is I haven't brought up icing to the face. Okay. I think I, well, I think I've discussed it with a couple people before and they thought the idea was ridiculous because they were going to sit there and hold ice packs on their face. Um, we could probably make a makeshift ban and hold it on their face, but you know, they didn't like it. And so um, I, I can't say that I'm offering it to everybody. I might have to think about whether I start discussing it with everybody and giving people the option. Uh, just because, again, this is a situation where the data is not clear and there is discomfort involved in it. I appreciate that. That it's is theoretical. very educational. That is very educational for me because you see in the literature brought up by some that says they, they kept it very mild by using it. Some said it didn't work at all. But I just kind of look at it as... I had a friend get a wisdom tooth out just the other day and they told him to apply ice and he was very happy. He didn't want to get swelling. And I'm thinking that's a wisdom tooth. We're talking about, you know, a side effect from cancer treatment that's fairly new. So the other thing that I thought was interesting, I mean, acupuncture looks so interesting because I just had to do but, a paper. Can I interject one, one thing to say? Yeah. Can I interject one thing? Mark? Absolutely. Um, I prefer to focus not on what we do. Okay. Icing is something we do to people, and I'm not sure how much it helps. But I prefer to put patients like to have some control. Patients always want to know, what can I do? Okay? I mean, of course, there's some patients that just say, that I don't want to do anything, you do it to me. But most patients want to have some control. And so that's why my talk on the zero stomach on the dry mouth, I focused on things that the patient can actively avoid, the patient can actively do to help. And in my mind, that means more than something that we do to them that I'm not sure is going to be helpful or not. That might be right. uncomfortable. But you're, but you're bringing up the idea, if you're stimulating thought, and, and then you start developing a pros versus cons, and that's part of the communication with the patient, right? For example, when you brought up acupuncture, you're, what you're really selling, what you're really saying also is true. I just had to do um, acupuncture paper for AUA update along with supplements, and it was fascinating, not just in hot flashes as their preliminary data in prostate cancer and breast, and not just also possibly in head and neck cancer and also for dry mouth, like you said there. It, acupuncture is used to a limited extent for overactive bladder, a form of acupuncture. And now there's some papers coming out from New York and other places for chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, possibly having some impact with acupuncture. So what, you're kind of going, hey, the pros are starting to exceed the cons here. So it's just... 
So we're just giving patients more ideas of what to talk about with their physicians and their team, which is, which is the goal of this process. So that is awesome. By the way, the other thing I thought that was interesting is there's a couple of trials being starting up on Botox to prevent that complication in terms of dry mouth by causing um, hypometabolism in the parotids and other places. So I just thought it was awesome that you brought in all those things to avoid things to do. So I got a, a couple of quick questions about using these, these oral agents. There's this test called ARV7. Are you still using it? Does it still have application to see whether or not you can, no. Okay. Do you want to say anything about that? I'm not using it because it doesn't happen very often. When it does happen, it's a marker of bad disease. But it doesn't happen very often, and I'm not sure it's the driver of the disease. So it's not a useful test in that regard. Okay. So ARV7, it's, it, it sounded great, but you're not, you're not really necessarily using it. People can talk about it overall. Here's a thing that I have found oncologists have struggled with when I have these conversations. <laughs> Abiraterone uses prednisone, correct? Right? When you take abiraterone, you also take yes. prednisone. Okay. Will you please help me? And yes. for the first time in YouTube history, will you ex please explain the importance of it very quickly? And are, does this go after all the toxicity potentially, like not just fluid buildup or liver enzymes, hypertension? I mean, why do I have to take this? Because I have actually found in some people that have called in, that they don't want to take it, or maybe they'll take half a dose, but what's the purpose and what's the benefit across the board? Yeah, it's actually super important, but the key thing to keep in mind is we use a lot of steroids in oncology and we use them for different reasons. And sometimes it really, you know, you really have to think hard about why you use it. In this situation, abiraterone is a drug that inhibits an enzyme that converts cholesterol all the way to testosterone. When you block an enzyme, what happens? You get stuck with some upstream molecule some in biochemistry that accumulates because you're not able to go past that enzymatic reaction. What you get stuck with are things that are like mineralocorticoids. Big term, but what that means is sodium, salt reabsorbing hormone. The kidneys hang on to sodium, okay? If you hang on to sodium, think back to high school physics, what follows salt? Water. So if you're hanging on to too much sodium in your kidneys, you're pulling water in and hanging on to it, you can get swelling. You can get high blood pressure. To stay net neutral, charge neutral, sodium's Na+, potassium's K+. You lose potassium. You can get low potassium as a side effect. Get headaches, you can get all kinds of things like that as a side effect. So what you keep doing is you're pushing down this pathway, trying to make testosterone, trying to make testosterone. You're not. You're making more of the salt reabsorbing hormone. How do you mm. shut it down? Well, these are all hormones that are stimulated from the brain, the hypothalamus gland, the pituitary gland. Steroids, like prednisone, serve as a negative feedback to say, stop making all these hormones. And so you just need a low dose of the steroid to be introduced. Even five milligrams a day may be enough. So that's why you give the steroids and you have to give it because it blocks that pathway from keep pushing down that pathway. You can get some serious toxicities. Now there are some side effects of have around like the liver function test abnormalities. Steroids don't touch that. It's not for that. But it's for all those mineralocorticoid side effects, the electrolytes, the blood pressure, the fluid side effects that the steroids help. So then I got, I, unless you tell me otherwise, I got to take that. There's no getting around that. I, cause there are people who get really bad hypertension on this drug. And if they're not taking their steroid, it could be one of the reasons they get hypertension, right? So there's always a way around things, Mark. There are alternative ways that you could do it. Have I treated patients without steroids because they are adamant about it? I have. Did I run into problems? Almost universally. Almost everybody gets problems with high blood pressure and fluid retention if you don't use the steroids. There are other medications called mineralocorticoid antagonists, like one called a plerinone. If you look back in the phase one study, they used it. Expensive high cost meds don't work as well, but have I used it before in patients that really are personally allergic to it? Yes, do I prefer to use that? No, it's a low dose of steroid. It's essentially physiologic dosing 
Uh, I think that low dose is not harmful, and uh, generally Good. that's what I prefer to use. Good. And then um, this is a paper from 2013 that caught my eye. I still have it. It's from Italy, but now I don't even see what the discussion is. What happens when someone's no longer responding to um, abiraterone or any of the novel antiandrogens? Do you, do you take them off, or do you, are you worried about what? Is there a possible uh, withdrawal syndrome? You know, we have antiandrogen withdrawal effect where when you actually take someone off a drug that you're no longer responding to, they get a response. Are you seeing that in, with these pills, or where, where are we with that? Not so often. Have okay. I ever seen it? couple times here and there did I believe it was related to that I wasn't sure so not so much of that uh, it's not to say it's impossible but it's certainly not anything I would hang my hat on okay here's what made you really famous on the internet I know this because I looked it up you and I talked about a, uh, a chemotherapy that nobody talks about much when it comes to prostate cancer we talk about Taxotere we talk about Jeftana but you actually brought up a name called carboplatin that some people can use. Do you want to further comment on that? Since so, people, so many people got interested and there was so much commentary that this is another possible option in the chemotherapy world. So I don't use carboplatin for everybody. Who I use carboplatin for are patients who have one of those DNA repair gene mutations that I've mentioned before. Because carboplatin causes double strand breaks in the DNA and those patients keep, tumors can't repair that very well. So that's one patient population I use it for. Occasionally I'll use carboplatin for people with kind of, you know, aggressive variants or unusual prostate cancers, which I talked about before, like neuroendocrine prostate cancers or these aggressive variant prostate cancers. There's some data to show that it might work well for those patients. So it's not something for everyone. It's something that you have to kind of think about and use it for select situations. My last question. Evan Yu, first author on a paper that just came out about pembrolizumab, an immunotherapy. Just came out combining it with chemotherapy in patients with metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. We really didn't talk at all about immune therapy. And your latest paper in European Urology, you were the first author. Would you like to make any comment before we leave here today, since you know so much about immunotherapy, where the heck are we going? I mean, are you frustrated? I mean, we thought more would be approved, but where are we with immunotherapy right now, apart from Provenge, which is obviously still used, but you talk about Keytruda here with, with, with chemo, and this is a big time paper. Do you wanna just comment on this paper since you didn't put it in your talk? And you're the first author. Yeah, well, here's the deal. Immunotherapy, with these checkpoint inhibitors or PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors like pembrolizumab or Keytruda, is, which is, is the pharmaceutical company name for it, um, they work in a lot of cancers. We've had problems in prostate cancer. They don't seem to work as well, certainly not as a single agent. So that paper is one of many different cohorts of a study that I helped lead um, that looked at many combinations of pembrolizumab with conventional standard of care therapies in prostate cancer with the hope that in combination it will lead to better outcomes. The problem in those studies, and I'm first to be critical of my own work, is the fact that there's no randomization in those studies. Meaning, if you just give people chemotherapy with pembrolizumab, a lot of people are going to respond just to the chemotherapy. So it's kind of hard to tell how much the immunotherapy added. The only way to know for sure is to do a randomized control trial where half the patients get chemotherapy and the half the patients get chemotherapy with immunotherapy. And I will just say this, since that paper recently came out, there is a randomized phase three trial follow-up to that paper that where half the patients get dose of taxil and half the patients get dose of taxil pembrolizumab. And just a few days ago, it got press released as being not meeting its primary endpoint, so not showing a survival benefit. The devil's in the details. We always need to see the data. Haven't seen all that data yet. Need to analyze it, understand whether there are certain subsets that did better than others, et cetera, et cetera. Need to see all the genetic testing analyses. But overall, the press release, without seeing any numbers, showed that that combination didn't work. Now, do I still have hope and promise? Yes. But do I think it's a lot more of a complex situation than it is for most cancers? 
Yes, I think prostate cancer has a very immune exclusive and microenvironment. There are a lot of cells that don't just that keep the good immune cells out, the cells that might attack the tumor. And so if you're giving these immunotherapies that need to have your good immune cells, T cells, in the tumor, they are present for it to work. It's not going to work if you don't have a lot of those good immune cells there. So we need to find mechanisms to try to get those immune cells there, to try to decrease the immune-exclusive microenvironment that's trying to keep those cells out, and then these agents might work. So I think there's still a lot more work to be done. Uh, I'm not one to give a lot of propaganda, although I say that all the time, but I didn't want to talk about my own work there because I think it is interesting and promising and contributes to our foundation of knowledge. But I don't think that study is going to change standard of care, especially after seeing the follow-up randomized phase three press release that just came out a few days ago. But maybe there's going to something we can add. Something's going to be a game changer in immunotherapy. Don't you agree? I mean, you had your name on a paper for a Provenge product, Absolutely. and they added they added interleukin yeah. to give it a boost. Something's going to, something's going to hit here. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It doesn't mean we should give up trying. It actually means we should keep trying hard. We should analyze the data inside and out, even when the study's negative, so that we can learn from that data to design a better study as a next step. As I say goodbye to you, does everybody who comes to see Evan Yu and has advanced disease, do they get genetic testing and buy those biomarker tests? Do you test for BRCA1, 2, ATM? Does everybody who has metastatic disease, according to Evan Yu, which could be just outside the prostate, do they all basically get genetic testing? A resounding yes. Yeah, because for two reasons. One is certain mutations might affect their future treatment. Two is that if they inherited some of these mutations, their loved ones, their siblings, their offspring might have inherited these mutations. And many of these lead to other cancers as well, breast, ovarian, pancreatic, endometrial cancers, etc. So, again, our goal is not just to help the patients in front of us, it's to help all of society. And we may find cancers earlier if we detect families that carry these mutations that predispose to cancer. And our hope is to save a lot of lives down the road. That's really what our goal is. And so it's a resounding yes. That's awesome. Well, listen, for all those who didn't, we wanted me to talk about PARP inhibitors with Dr. Yu. We're going to talk about it at the end of the conference. And so we'll, we'll get to that, and, and we'll actually uh, repeat a lot of the same data that Dr. Yu talked about. So we will definitely get there. But look at, see, I made this sign for you. Thanks for being you. Listen, I, I really appreciate your dedication. I mean, you always say yes on the fly. You always give of your time. You always sneak us in. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it whenever we make that phone call. And for people who don't see this beyond the tape, uh, you're just one of those gems in our field that we look up to. And I just appreciate you a lot. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. It's always a pleasure. You guys do a wonderful job. Your mission is wonderful. Uh, I think the education you provide is, you know, first class. So uh, thanks again for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moyad, and thank you, Dr. Yu. That was an incredible presentation. For our next speaker, he is another one of our PCRI All-Stars. Dr. Eugene Kwan is a world-renowned urologist at Mayo Clinic. He has incredible expertise in imaging, immunology, and much more. And today he's going to present the latest information in Lutetium 177, otherwise known as Plevicto, and patient empowerment. Right after his talk, we have a Q&A session with Dr. Moyad, and you won't want to miss that. All right, without further ado, thank you, Dr. Kwan, for joining our conference once again. I'd like to thank you all for inviting me to speak once again. Um, I really enjoy speaking at the PCRI conferences. Uh, this is the one venue that I really enjoy participating in because I do believe that this has been a very highly beneficial forum for patients with advanced prostate cancer. Um, so for me, it's been a very gratifying experience. Uh, as part of today's uh, um, presentation, I'll be talking about lutetium, which is a new agent that has been approved by the FDA 
for treatment of advanced prostate cancer. And I'm going to give this talk kind of in the context of part four of my DIY combat manual for beating prostate cancer. This is an extension of the talk I gave last year. And it may be useful for some people who are viewing this to go back in time and look at last year's presentation if there are questions or things that don't make sense. Hopefully, I'll be able to get this get through this talk uh, in a fairly clear fashion. So this is part four, 177 PSMA Letitium, also known as Plavicto. Once again, I'd like to remind everyone that one of the main reasons that I give these talks is as a um, way of honoring all the patients that I've cared for over time, including many men who have died for, from prostate cancer. Um, I do take these losses very personally, and uh, I do understand that these people that we lose to prostate cancer are friends and sons and soulmates and husbands and fathers. And I want them to always know that they are dearly missed by their family members and even our care team. So um, I also have to provide disclosure. Dr. Kwan and the Mayo Clinic have received licensing payments for PD-1 and PD-L1 immunotherapy-related intellectual properties over time. And then I also want to make it very clear that I do read the little comments under all of my previous presentations, and I try to remain sensitive to concerns or criticisms that people write in regarding past presentations that I've given. One comment that came in previously was um, kind of a statement that my presentations maybe don't give enough credit to other people in regards to where our technologies come from, who are the scientists and the physicians that are moving these things forward. Specifically, today we'll be talking about 177 PSMA Letitium, and this is a technology that was really born out of the efforts of brilliant physicians and scientists in Germany and Australia. So I want to acknowledge that fact. This is not necessarily stuff that we raised in our own backyard here, but this, um, this technology really does represent the very hard work of very, very amazing scientists and physicians overseas. Um, and in many regards, the US is just catching up to where many of these countries have been for a number of years now. So um, I also wanna acknowledge one final thing, and that is that my talk is geared mostly to US audience because this talk is being triggered by the FDA approval of 177 PSMA Letitium as a treatment agent in the United States, okay? So the FDA approved 177 PSMA Letitium on March 22nd or 23rd of 2022 this year. Another name for this agent is Pluvicto. So the question is, what, what is 177 PSMA Letitium? So in order to understand what this agent is and how it works, we first have to understand that some prostate cancer cells or many prostate cancer cells will have a little flag or a protein on their surface, and it's called prostate-specific membrane antigen. This little protein can be imaged using a PET scanner, which will show which cells or tumors express the little flag or protein prostate-specific membrane antigen, also known as PSMA. So here's an individual that has metastatic prostate cancer within the body, and all of these little tumors have this little flag on the surface that can be seen by a PET scanner that is designed to identify whether or not these tumor cells have prostate-specific membrane antigen on their surface. 177 PSMA Letitium is a new drug that was developed that can stick to this little flag or protein called prostate-specific membrane antigen. The reason this is important is 177 PSMA or 177 Letitium 
is an isotope that gives off radiation. And once it sticks to the flag, which is on the surface of the cell, the cell gets irritated and swallows it. Kind of like if you've ever seen a frog swallowing a fly, it'll literally just swallow it or internalize the isotope. Once the isotope is inside the cell, it does its work by emitting beta radiation. And this results in the kill off of the cell as well as cells that are in proximity to the cell that swallowed the 177 lutetium. So just by watching that little cartoon, I think you can start to visualize why this is a very attractive therapy because it's a form of therapy that is very specific for prostate cancer and it's very effective and it actually kills cells. It doesn't suppress them. So understandably, there's great interest in receiving 177 PSMA lutetium if you are a patient with advanced prostate cancer. So the next question is, in the United States, who is eligible for treatment with 177 PSMA lutetium? So in order to get 177 PSMA lutetium in the, in the United States, you have to meet four criteria. You have to have metastatic hormone refractory prostate cancer. You have to have metastases that express PSMA on the surface, prostate-specific membrane antigen. You have to have been treated with an androgen receptor pathway inhibitor, and you have to be treated or have been treated with taxane-based chemotherapy. So let's take these criteria point by point. Number one, hormone refractory metastatic prostate cancer. What is that? So as I talked about last year, there are two types of prostate cancer when it comes to hormone responses, hormone therapy responses. The first type of prostate cancer is hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. Specifically, this is a form of cancer that you can treat with some hormone therapy like Lupron or Orgovix or something like this to reduce testosterone in the body, which then causes the cells to shrink, which then lowers the PSA in the body. So that's hormone sensitive prostate cancer. In contrast, hormone resistant prostate cancer or castrate resistant prostate cancer is a form of cancer that when you treat it with hormone therapy, such as Lupron, Eligard, Orgovix, whatever, once you treat with hormone therapy, testosterone goes down, but the tumor keeps growing because it's no longer dependent on the presence of testosterone. And this tumor can then send off metastases and the metastases can all grow. And the PSA is going up even while you're on hormone therapy. So the signature of hormone refractory prostate cancer is PSA is rising while you're being treated with a primary hormone form, primary form of hormone therapy, such as bilateral orchiectomy, which is testicular removal, treatment with Lupron, Eligard, Zolodex, Firmagon, Orgovix, Casodex, all of these medications that basically knock out testosterone or mitigate against testosterone utilization in the body. So what is a metastasis? Well, prostate cancer is like dandelion. This was from last year's talk. When you treat prostate cancer, even if you treat it, it can send seeds to the rest of the body. And every one of these seeds can grow another tumor. And these are called metastasis or metastases. And that sounds a little bit like metastases. That's a little of my humor. So at any, way, uh, at any rate, all of these sites of new cancer growth are called metastases, and every one of these sites can manufacture PSA and make the PSA go up in the body, and every one of these sites is prostate cancer, okay? So this is what, or these are what metastases are in the context of prostate cancer. So in summary, in order to meet the criterion of hormone refractory metastatic prostate cancer, you have to have metastases that are 
hormone refractory. In other words, they don't respond to hormone therapy. So that's number one. Number two, this is where things get a little bit trickier. And this is one of the reasons that I thought it would be useful to give this presentation because it's even been confusing for myself and it's created great anxiety to figure out what this all means. Metastases that express prostate-specific membrane antigen, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that you have to be able to see the cancer and the metastases inside a PSMA PET scan. This is where it gets confusing, however. In December of last year, the FDA approved a gallium-68 PSMA PET scan. But then in May of 2021, the FDA approved an F18 PSMA PET scan for evaluation of PSMA-positive prostate cancer. And then in March of this year, the FDA approved another gallium PSMA PET scan, and this one's owned by Novartis. And this one was basically described as an imaging agent that would be useful for evaluation of patients with metastatic disease for whom 177 PSMA therapy might be indicated. So what does that all mean? Well, basically those statements or those approvals pertain to two different forms of PET scanning. One is called a gallium PSMA PET scan, and one is an F18 PSMA PET scan. And here are is his one individual that was first imaged with gallium, and then the next day imaged with F18 PSMA PET scan. And other than maybe crispness of the image, there's really not a lot of difference between these two scans, at least by my inspection and inspection of a lot of the nuclear medicine experts here at our institution. So why is this all important? Well, it's important because the presence of these two different forms of PET scanning has created lots of confusion. Did I get the right PET scan? Can you tell if I should have gotten this PET scan or this other PET scan? The answer to that is thus far, it remains largely unknown if type of PSMA PET scan or PET imaging used to assess patient leads to substantive differences in the effectiveness of 177 PSMA lutetium treatment outcomes, okay? So thus far, we don't know if a gallium PSMA PET scan works better than an F18 PSMA PET scan in determining who's going to respond to the treatment, 177 PSMA lutetium. So that's why this is so confusing. Overseas, I can tell you that they're largely agnostic or indifferent to what kind of PET scanning you have. So overseas, 177 PSMA lutetium is given to all patients with PSMA positive disease, irrespective of type of PSMA PET scan that was used to image the patient prior to therapy. At present, most experts in the United States do not anticipate that there's gonna be a big difference in treatment outcome with 177 PSMA lutetium treatment for patients who were screened with gallium versus F18 imaging, okay? So I think we're all cool with that thus far. However, and this is where the confusion comes from, different insurance providers may specify or specifically require either a gallium or an F18 PSMA PET scan for assessment of patients with advanced prostate cancer before authorizing 177 PSMA lutetium treatment. So now you can see why we are all a little bit in a panic because some insurance providers will say, oh, that's good enough. Other ones will say, no, you didn't get the right one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a, little, a lot of anxiety there um, and a lot of questions about that. In addition, to add to the confusion even more, not all institutions have both a gallium and F18 PSMA PET scan in their arsenal. So some institutions can only provide one, other institutions can only provide the other, 
And then when you start doing this thing with, did you get the right scan for the right insurance provider, so forth and so on, things get very com complicated and patients get very anxious. And a lot of doctors are waving their hands and they don't have all the answers to why there's confusion and how to resolve the confusion or address the confusion. So that's why I thought that this was a very important discussion to have with regards to 177 PSMA lutetium. In short, getting any form of PSMA PET scan prior to potential treatment with 177 PSMA lutetium will not likely impact the therapeutic effectiveness of this treatment, but it could lead to major delays in treatment and or possible failure of insurance providers to authorize or pay for therapy. So that's why this is very important. And of course, after going through all of this, the phrase that goes through my mind comes out of Wizard of Oz, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Okay, very, very frightening. It even gets more complicated because even if you have PSMA on the surface of your tumor, and even though it is present, you may not be eligible for treatment. So gallium or F18 PSMA PET images are scored at our institution to identify which advanced prostate cancer patients can receive 177 PSMA lutetium. And scoring of a PSMA PET image is basically an assessment of the brightness or intensity of the lesions on the scan. So scores typically range from a brightness intensity value of zero, which means no intensity, that'd just be a black spot you can't see, up to three or four, which is high intensity. I actually asked our nuclear medicine specialist, what's the difference between three or four? And it was um, a little bit complicated to understand for me, but it did remind me of volume 11 on an amplifier in the movie Spinal Tap. I'm really curious how many people are gonna understand that reference. At any rate, very bright is three to four, very dark is zero or one. At our institution, currently scores of two, three, or four qualify a patient for treatment. Scoring of these spots, however, is somewhat subjective and has not been perfected. And then on top of it, we still don't know how to treat patients with mixed PSMA expressions. So this guy has some three, but he also has some one. So should he be treated, should he not be treated? Will it work, won't it work? We don't know. It's also unknown if a low score might increase over time or after various forms of therapy. So if you had a scan in February of this year, and you had a score of one, what if you repeat the scan? Could you have a score of three and then qualify? We don't have all the answers. My hunch is that some patients that have low scores initially may have sufficient scores to qualify for treatment later on, so you shouldn't give up. It's also unknown why some patients with high expression levels do not respond well to therapy. And I think that Dr. Jeff Johnson, who is brilliant in this area, has already touched upon this subject a little bit, and we might expound on that in a little bit. So I guess the question is, could we possibly make this whole issue of PSMA PET scanning and scoring and everything a little bit more complicated? And I think the answer is probably no. So point number three, a patient has to have been treated with androgen receptor pathway inhibition. So even I had to ask what the heck that meant because I thought hormone therapy is androgen receptor pathway inhibition and hormone therapy is, but this is, they're specifically, specifically referring to use of second generation forms of hormone therapy that are listed here. So second generation hormone therapy is Zytiga, Abiaterone, Extandi, which is enzalutamide, or Lita, which is apalutamide, Nubeca, 
Nubequa, which is darolutamide, in order to qualify for treatment with 177 PSMA lutetium, you have to have either failed one of these agents, not all of them, just one, or you need to be receiving active therapy with one of these agents. And then you can move forward with 177 PSMA lutetium treatment. There are some reports that I've heard here and there that say, oh, well, you should take these medications because they will facilitate a better response by 177 PSMA lutetium. I caution you about that because some of these claims are not well established and have come out of small reports. So there's no locked in stone recommendations regarding whether you should take these things. And there's certainly no statements that say you got to take this medication in order to get a better response from 177 PSMA lutetium. So the fourth point that a patient has to meet in order to get 177 PSMA lutetium is treatment with either docetaxel, cabazitaxel, taxotere, jevtana, chemotherapy. These are called taxane based form forms of chemotherapy. Now, in order to understand what that means, you have to go back to the FDA indication label, which was put out for approval of 177 PSMA lutetium. Specifically, 177 PSMA lutetium plevicto should be given to patients with metastatic disease, castrate resistant, who have been treated with androgen receptor pathway inhibition and taxane-based chemotherapy. So what does that mean? This includes patients who have previously received taxane-based chemotherapy. This includes patients who did not tolerate taxane-based chemotherapy for every, any reason. This also includes patients who are currently receiving taxane-based chemotherapy, but it's not working. But this label indication does not mandate that a patient fails taxane-based chemotherapy. And I think that there's confusion out there. And some patients are hearing, I can't get lutetium because I didn't fail chemotherapy. Therefore, they're pouring chemotherapy in me until I fail. That's not right. And it's important because if a patient receives too much chemotherapy treatment prior to treatment, treatment with 177 PSMA lutetium, you can damage the bone marrow to the extent that you cannot get treatment with 177 PSMA lutetium. So all you have to remember is you have to have been treated with taxane-based chemotherapy previously, but you don't necessarily have to be actively failing it in order to qualify for this therapy. And the reason this is important too is some insurance providers are saying, well, I'm not going to let this guy get 177 PSMA lutetium because you can still give chemotherapy over and over again. It hasn't failed. Well, that's not a good idea. Um, and I wanted to put some clarification out there regarding this. Additional considerations. You have to remember, everyone has to remember that 10 to 20% of patients will not have sufficient PSMA on the surface of their disease and therefore will not qualify for treatment with 177 PSMA lutetium, or patients may have other reasons that they can't receive therapy. Patients should be in reasonable health at the time of treatment, ECOG per performance score zero to two, ideally with a hemoglobin of eight, platelet count of 75,000, white blood cell count of 2.5, and kidney function of 50 ml per minute for GFR. The experience to date, most of our patients have been treated with up to six cycles of treatment with 177 PSMA lutetium given at six week intervals. This is an average patient receiving treatment. This is after two cycles of treatment. PSA started at 13, went down to 0.65. I should say this is an average favorable response to treatment. It's hard to average ac across all treatments, and we'll talk about that. But you can see the PSMA positive disease is disappearing. PSA is going down. Everything's looking good. 
these are gross generalizations. About 50% of patients with ex will experience a 50% decline in PSA. About a third of the patients will have a fantastic response. A third of patients will have a mixed response that's kind of, um, eh, you know, good and bad. And about a third of the patients will have no response, and that's tragic. A reduction in serum PSA of greater than 50% after the first treatment cycle probably, probably indicates a very good response therapy. In contrast, no reduction in serum PSA after two cycles of therapy will likely portend a poor response to therapy. And I got this information from our collaborators and friends overseas who have quite a bit of experience with treating patients with 177 PSMA lutetium. We don't know about the durability of treatment. Um, overall, we've had some patients that have lasted up to three years without much disease coming back. The majority of patients, however, have failed or start, start to exhibit signs of disease recurrence before three years out from treatment. The published median overall survival for patients receiving 177 PSMA lutetium for advanced disease is 15.3 months versus 11.3 months for patients treated with standard of care. A little bit difference in overall survival, but we have to remember that this is based on fairly minimalistic levels of standard of care. This doesn't mean that overall you're going to last this long after treatment with 177 PSMA lutetium or even standard of care therapy, all right? 177 PSMA, my summary is 177 PSMA lutetium is a novel, exciting, wonderful treatment, but it's not a miracle cure. It should be viewed as one tool in the arsenal of treating or combating advanced prostate cancer, just one tool. And it's gonna be used smartly in the context of everything else that's out there. In terms of side effects, the most common side effect is fatigue, dry mouth. We've seen a lot of nausea, usually about three days after treatment. Sometimes the nausea can be fairly severe. Um, there's some anemia, some decreased appetite, constipation, about 20% of patients. The most common laboratory abnormality in 30% of patients decreased lymphocyte counts, decreased hemoglobin, decreased white blood cells, decreased platelets, and some decrease in calcium and sodium. Also, the FDA warns that you could have long-term damage from radiation exposure from a drug like this that could lead to bone marrow dysfunction and ki kidney failure. Late radiation side effects are unknown for this agent because there has not been sufficient follow-up. Guidance for patients in general, when they come to get treated by us, this is the guidance we provide. For three days after therapy, you should drink lots of water, wash everything through your system. Preferably, don't be drinking eight glasses of beer or something to wash it out of your system. Non-alcoholic beverages are preferable. For the first day after therapy, use separate bathroom facilities whenever possible. Men should sit down on the toilet to avoid splashing urine, which could have radioactivity in it all over the place. Clean up spilled urine by yourself. Um, flush the toilet twice if possible. For three days after therapy, any soiled waste that gets contaminated with your body fluid should be kept separate and safely away for 70 days so that the levels of radiation can return to normal baseline levels um, in a safe place of storage. Um, you got to keep the garbage and everything away from pets and children because they can become contaminated with radiation. Do not be closer than an arm's length from children of 10 years or less for an extended period of time on the first day after therapy. For two days after therapy, sleep in a separate bed from your partner, especially if they are pregnant. Otherwise, it's safe to share a bed with another person. If they are not pregnant or less than 10 years of age, you may return to work after treatment, unless you don't want to return to work, of course. 
For six months after therapy, you should not father a child. You may travel home by car or plane immediately after therapy. You may stay in a hotel the night of treatment. Patients who have received radioactive medication should be warned that they can set off radiation sensitivity detectors at airports, border crossings, and other security checkpoints. And this has definitely happened to quite a few of our patients. And it is amazing from what distance you can be detected with a security detector at a place like an airport. And it can be quite unpleasant to have security guards coming after you if you are setting off their radiation alarms. Other questions re regarding uh, lutetium treatment, and I'm sure Dr. Moya and I will talk about some of these, so I'll speed through this. Lutetium retreatment after six cycles is possible. Um, you can get this treatment after treatment with radium-223. You can access this treatment overseas. They have great experience overseas, and they have different restrictions regarding treatment. Um, concurrent use of drugs. The one drug that we take patients off of while receiving treatment tends to be uh, olaparib or linparza. The PARP inhibitors are thought to be radiosensitizers. And if you stay on them, they could mix with the lutetium to cause adverse um, side effects against the bone marrow and cause other problems. So we tend to hold uh, olaparib um, for three days prior and three days after treatment with 177 PSMA lutetium. Other therapies, we stop immunotherapy uh, two weeks before treatment. We hold chemotherapy for one month before treatment with 177 PSMA lutetium. The question of using, you can use radiation in combination with 177 PSMA lutetium. Sometimes we'll shoot hot spots that are not responding, but you have to do it cautiously and you have to use a radiation oncologist that's very experienced with this kind of situation. Predictors of response, we don't have good re re predictors of response, but we're working on that. Bigger spots of cancer tend to be more refractory treatment to treatment compared to smaller lesions. So a lot of times we'll use radiation to knock out the really big lesions prior to treatment with 177 PSMA lutetium. PSA zero. So PSA zero is a situation where the blood PSA is zero. Your serum PSA is zero. So you'd think you wouldn't have any cancer in the body. And we've shown with choline PET scan that about 12% of our patients actually have metastatic disease even when the PSA is zero. Well, we've accidentally also found that you can have a PSA of zero and still have a heck of a lot of PSMA positive metastatic disease in the body, even though the serum PSA is saying there's no cancer there. So this is something that we're gonna have to think about as we move forward. If a patient doesn't respond well to lutetium, we also use other forms of imaging to see why that is. Some patients will have a mixture of PSMA positive disease and PSMA negative disease in the body, which explains why only part of the disease is going away, whereas the other parts of the disease are progressing. And that's where we use these other forms of PET imaging. Clinical trials, there's a clinical trial for everything right now. Every combination of lutetium with every combination of drug, some of them are good clinical trials, some of them are kind of not very thoughtful, and some I don't think are going to really answer very useful questions. But there's a lot of clinical trials on 177 PSMA lutetium. Future isotopes, there's a really hot future isotope, and that's not a pun. It's called actinium-225. It's much more powerful than lutetium, but it's also got a kick to it. It's got side effects. And it can be effective for patients that have not responded to lutetium. Here's an example of one of our patients. He got four cycles of lutetium. He wasn't responding. His PSA was actually going up. We pivoted. We asked for actinium overseas. Patient was treated with actinium two cycles as PSA went from 172 down to 13.3. We think it's because the actinium has deeper penetrance in the tumor, more powerful effects for, from, against the tumor, 
And we are excited at the possibility that actinium will one day soon be approved for the management of advanced prostate cancer um, to go up against or with lutetium for the treatment of patients. Finally, um, the last thing I want to say is this has been a very anxious process, uh, not only for patients. I mean, I've, I know that patients suffered a lot through the, through the process of the rollout of the lutetium. And I think there's a lot of confusion and I think there's a lot of anxiety and there's a lot of things we still don't know. I myself have felt that this has been a very anxious period in my career. I, and I obviously don't have all the answers to everything, obviously. Um, the one thing I do want to point out, though, is it is new and it's exciting. This new technology represents a sea change in which it's no longer just urology. And it's no longer medical oncology that's driving the care of advanced prostate cancer. Several years ago, I was asked to give a talk at the Society of Abdominal Imaging, and I said, my prediction was that one day soon, we're gonna see radiologists and nuclear medicine taking care of advanced prostate cancer, and they may become the experts in the management of prostate cancer. And I think we're starting to begin to see a sea change in which nuclear medicine and the experts and the great scientists and the great physicians are stepping into this field and they're starting to drive the care of advanced prostate cancer patients. And I think it's a good thing, but it's gonna take a while for us to sort out all the pros and cons and to step in all the potholes with regards to all of this stuff. Um, once again, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators, especially we have just a mind boggling, um, outstanding group of nuclear medicine people at Mayo. Um, they were the ones that figured out the technologies. They're the ones that um, implemented all the SOPs, the protocols. Um, they anticipated the ins insurance concerns and they were the ones that really got this therapy moving and I applaud them. They are brilliant, wonderful people and they did a phenomenal job in getting this technology opened up and running at our institution. And I've learned a lot from them. I also absolutely want to thank all of my overseas collaborators and friends, Dr. Kezban in Turkey, Clemens Kratokville, Dr. Habercorn in Germany. Kratokville and Habercorn are probably the inventors of 177 PSMA Letitium and they should get the lion's share of the credit. Also, Dr. Lenzo in Australia, they're developing really hot new technologies along this line. They, they, develop, they all uh, deserve an incredible amount of applause and uh, praise from everyone. And then I'd like to thank, you know, all the rest of my collaborators here at Mayo Clinic. And I also want to thank my team. This is my team. I've never shown my team. Um, my team is the singular reason that we're able to see 6,000 patients annually within my clinic. And I would have to say that the vast majority of our patients are um, very happy with their care. And it isn't because of me, <laughs> it's because of my team. They're brilliant, caring uh, healthcare providers. And I'm very proud of them because they're very smart people and they do a great job. Um, of course, my team looks different in 2022 than it did in 2021. So I'll have to update the photo. Anyway, thank you very much. All right. Another Quan moment. I was, I, I knew you would, I'm so happy you could do this. I always call it Quanology. Because every time, <laughs> every time you give a, you give a talk, it's like, it's Quanology. You go, you give a talk that nobody can give. You give it with the passion plus the information that nobody has. So first of all, without sounding too obsequious here, I really appreciate the fact that for the audience, he really self-generated this talk. We wanted to hear a lutetium talk, 
And he said, I'm, I got to do this. You know, I got to explain what's going on here. So to me, I'm going to call you huge because everyone, everyone in Mayo calls you huge. That's your nickname. And I'm telling you, you are the pride of Grinnell College. Um, yeah. So uh, quick, true or false. You remember, you remember Herbie Hancock, Herbie Hancock. I do. Did a, okay. True or false. Herbie Hancock is an alumnus. went, actually went to Grinnell College. True. I know that. Oh, okay. There you go. I thought maybe I would stump you because he was there in the sixties, but that's true. So now it's the only thing I actually learned while I was at Grinnell College was Herbie Hancock <laughs> went to Grinnell <laughs> College. So I can say that with certainty. Well, Grinnell College now just doesn't have Herbie Hancock. They have uh, Eugene Kwan. All right, my friend, are you ready? I didn't really prepare much here because I've known you now for so long and you and I are like brothers from another mother. I don't know if that's, uh, you know, we're twins that get along. Are we Cain and Abel? What's the deal? But we have a mojo, so I don't like writing too many questions. So if you don't mind, I'm going to jump in the pool and off many things off the top of my head when you gave the lecture, I'm just going to throw out. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. The first thing I'm going to throw out is a, something I actually threw out in Dr. Johnson's talk. And I gave him a new nickname called Dr. J because he, he gave a slam dunk talk. And uh, before we go, before we move into Plavicto, I want to give some quick background into the area of PET CTs and just as, and how you see them. I asked Dr. Johnson this, but you have your own opinion, how you see them because you, you're going back almost 10 years now that you got choline FDA approved, right? Right. So if I'm coming to Mayo or any other place, but let's just say Mayo, am I still getting a choline scan potentially, or are you just giving me all PSMAs? So I still uh, use choline quite a bit, um, in part because obviously part of the assessment is, are we assessing for potential treatment with 177 PSMA lutetium, or are we just assessing for disease burden um, to assign therapy? So we have C11 choline PET available, um, and we have great experience with assessing patients who have newly diagnosed metastatic disease, and we're trying to assign a form of therapy. And for guys that are fairly treatment naive, meaning they're not hormone refractory or they don't meet criteria for treatment with lutetium, we'll get a choline PET scan. So mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons we get it. Another reason that I didn't bring up in the talk, but I'm glad you brought it up, and I'm sure that Jeff Johnson had a slightly different take. I have now obtained many years of response to therapy with choline PET scan. So we know what to look for after first treatment, second treatment, third treatment. We know what the kinetics of response is supposed to be. I have a sense that the PSMA PET scan may not be as responsive. Mm. And the reason for that, I think we're just starting to figure out. So I have patients internationally and nationally here who have been followed with PSMA and choline PET scan the choline responds very quickly within weeks to therapy. The PSMA does not. And it may have to do with something to do with the carcasses of the cells. So PSMA is on the surface of a cell like a little flag. If you kill the cell, the carcass is still there mm. and the protein is still there. Whereas choline is a metabolite. It's like oxygen moving in and out of the lungs. The minute you kill the organism, the oxygen stops moving, the brightness goes away. You can see that even within probably hours. So I think that, and I've actually tried to encourage Dr. Johnson here to actually explore this. I think we want to run a study where we say, you know, what's the responsiveness of therapy, PSMA versus choline? So that's something that we're thinking about looking at moving forward. That's a really interesting explanation about the metabolite versus the 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 the, the surface molecule. Uh, but so let's there have to be scans 
So how do you handle this? There have to be scans where nothing shows up on PSMA scan, um, but it shows up on choline and vice versa, right? How, right. Uh, so are you so that, are you saying that when you give choline scans, this is very this is an exception to the rule, or do a lot of people get choline with PSMA? I mean, we're I'm trying to put my head around this. We're trying to put our head around this also <laughs> <laughs> because it it does. I mean, the permutations are infinite. The the questions that are unknown are infinite. And we live in this world where we can't get everything. We can't get all the answers. And this is going to be one of those things that never gets resolved. Having said that, though, I do think that, first of all, we know 20% of patients will not have sufficient representation of their disease with a PSMA PET scan. Ergo, choline is going to be important for them. The yeah. bigger problem, and I think that this is going to grow out of the 177 PSMA lutetium treatment response thing. So if you get a great response, then the answer is, well, probably all the disease had PSMA. If you get a mixed response, what's the possible answer for that? Well, the cancer is resistant. Well, it was here where it's there. Or maybe 50% of the cancer had choline, would have shown up on the choline, or maybe 100% would have shown up on choline, but only 50% has PSMA. Even more so, if we know that out of 100 guys that are treated with lutetium, none of them achieve cure, okay, uh -huh. which is probably going to be true. Why is that? Well, one possibility is you've treated all the PSMA positive forms of disease on those patients, but what grows out of it may not have the marker. So this is part of the evolution of resistance or selection of cells during systemic therapy. So choline, I think, is still going to have vital utility at least from the perspective of figuring out what's going on with these patients as we move forward over time. So I'm looking for a tangible, a tangibility here and to wrap my head around it. For every 10 patients, how, how can I put this? For every 10 patients that get PET CT and they're getting PSMAs, how many of those potentially also get choline? I mean, so again, so it sounds like you're, it sounds like you're doing a lot of choline still. It sounds like there are a lot of patients getting both. There's still a huge number of patients that are getting choline. Yeah. Because you know what the, you know, what's in my hands here. This is, this is, this is really thick and it's not your CV, although your CV is very thick. No. I'm saying, I'm saying I always ask Alex for every single question that's been submitted uh, for the conference. And I, and I sure. actually read them all, just like you read all the comments that people have about you, which is a huge mistake because there's always going to be someone that doesn't like you and it's going to hurt your feelings. Right. But I read every comment about, I read every question and I'll tell you a theme under Dr. Kwan ready this year. One of the themes that I'm reading on many questions is, okay, I did your pet CT thing and my PSA is rising and they saw nothing. Now what? I, I don't have any, I'm just saying, how do you answer that? Okay, they've done everything right. They've qualified for PET CT because what you said last time I interviewed you, which is very um, cerebral, it's very true. It's better to have a PET CT than no CT. So let's quit trying to compete and say, this is that much better. But what do you do for all those folks who are going in and their PSA is clearly rising, there's disease activity going on, but there's nothing on the PET CT. So when we went and got the choline PET scan approved, um, we published the paper that said that the sweet spot was a PSA of about 2.0. And we did that intentionally because we were trying to set some expectations. So with a PSA of 2.0, um, you find lesions in about 80% of patients and that what that's what's been put out there. And not by our group or anyone specifically, but there's been this impression that the PSMA PET scan is better than choline 
and that you should be getting it for a PSA of 0 0.2. So immediately people conflate the information and they say choline is worse than PSMA. PSMA should be picking up things at PSA of 0 0.2. Our experience thus far, however, at Mayo is that I'm not sure we're picking up more lesions with PSMA PET scan at the lower PSMA value, PSA values, all right? Oh boy, okay, I'm listening. So we do have lots of patients that are coming in with PSA of 0 0.2, 0 0.45, 0 0.7. It's not to say that you're not picking up things. I still advocate getting a scan as soon as possible because if you can find it early, you can kill it early. However, just because there's a number out there that says you can start getting the scan at 0 0.2 is not synonymous with saying, and you're going to find your lesion with a PSA of 0.2. So people are conflating two different subjects. One is, oh, it's a bare scan. You're going to find it earlier. And the number is 0 0.2. You're going to start seeing things. That yes. is untrue. In our experience, we have lots and lots and lots of patients that they pull the trigger on the PSMA PET scan, rightfully so, because you never know when you might pick something up, and the first scan is negative. So then what do you do? My response is you have to be patient. You have to set expectation that you may not see it the first time and that you may have to let the PSA go up a little bit and then repeat. We usually let a doubling take place. Yeah. So we'll tell a patient, you should let your PSA double and you should then repeat the scan. So then the typical anxiety is, the typical anxiety is, Dr. Kwan, are you saying that I shouldn't treat my disease? So then you have to go kind of through the discussion about it's not spreading like wildfire. It's not blowing in the wind like dust. It's probably a seed that's trying to take root and grow and you're trying to identify the spot. And then they say, yeah, but you're delaying my treatment. And then the response to that, at least from our perspective, is, yeah, but it's always more injurious to treat something you don't know is there than it is to identify the spot and then pick it off or treat it rationally. That's really interesting. So if I have a 0.3 and nothing's there, I'm, this is a generalization. So for the audience, of course, I'm not talking specifics. I, I like to look for generalization. So what you're saying is if you have a 0.3, let's say, that goes to that there's nothing there, or let's say a 0.6 is not there, you want to see that, you want to see it double before you rescan. Yep. Wow. And you feel confident that the doubling of that PSA when the scan was negative ups the odds significantly that you're going to see something that time. As long as there was not a technical reason you didn't see something. Mm. You know, some scans are crummy, some of them are misread. Um, but if it's a legitimate scan, you know, the reality is these scanners have an ability to see certain things, but they can't see at a microscopic level. So you have to give the disease a little bit of time to evolve. It's interesting that you say that because I pressed Dr. J, your colleague, on the idea that in prostate cancer, I think healthcare professionals and patients, we kind of get fixated on this idea that you can get a second pathology report, no problem after a biopsy and have it questioned, whether it's by your institution, Hopkins, it doesn't matter. But you, you, it's, it's common today to ask for a second pathological opinion. But and then I think about it, I think, well, there's a lot of expertise that goes into reading these scans. So I said to him, do you ever do second opinions on scans? And he said something that blew me away. He said, in Nuke Med, where you are, they do about I think you said 50 a week. I forgot. Anyway, the number was much higher than what I expected. Do you have any comment on that? Do you do you actually see scans that come in that somebody sends to you and say, wait, we're seeing something or wait, we're not seeing anything like you're seeing. Is yeah. it, that happens? Yeah. yeah, it's it's very it's very common. Um, I've had patients where. You know, I, it's it's a new technology. People are getting their experience with it not everyone's going to be like our group that's sitting there all day and night reading these scans but we've seen just about everything 
we've seen situations where, you know, they're calling every node positive for cancer. We're calling none of the nodes positive for cancer. We have people that have come in with treatment plans that are probably not going to work because the reading is not correct. Um, the interpretation we and, you know, we have to also understand we make mistakes too, okay? The Mighty Mayo Clinic does have situations where even we don't see certain things. And luckily, we all read scans. So they'll say, Dr. Kwan, you know, you want to do this, but you didn't see the spot over here. And I'm like, D you know, Homer Simpson, doe. I didn't realize that. So you can never, you know, people are still fallible and they're working hard and they're doing a lot of things and it is very complex and it's very new. So not everyone does things perfectly. I am a big fan of having other people's eyes on things and have people even look over my shoulders for the, what I prescribe, what I do. Part of the reason I give these talks is I want the patients to even be able to de double check what I do. And they do. They'll say, hey, Quan, you said in your talk, you got to do this. You didn't do that. And I say, you're correct. I'm glad you watched my talk. You know, so th the reality is that, yes, we do a lot of overreads at Mayo Clinic and we will not assign a therapy or do something until we've established the credibility of the scan, the quality of the scan, the findings of the scan bef before we do something. And a lot of times, as much as we hate to do it, sometimes we'll even repeat the scans ourselves because by the time they come to us, you know, one problem in medicine is, oh, I got the study. And then you look at it and you go, yeah, but that was six months ago. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. Immediately, you're already dealing with a different animal. So sometimes you have to update everything. Yep. So, okay, I'm going to leave this topic. I've just become so fixated. You know me, I'll fixate and I won't let go. It's like, ah, I'm rabid dog. So they, I, they have they have medications for that. I know. And I take those and they don't <laughs> work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I understand. Trust me. You know, me. so um, so, OK, because, again, I, the majority of questions I get about about quinology is, OK, I've had this PSMA scan, PET CT, it's negative. Let's say I do what Quan says that my PSA doubles, it's still negative. And then I come to you and say, well, now I want a fluciclovine or now I want a choline. That's not a that's not a wacky request. That's probably when you probably think, too. I wonder if this is going to show up on something else. Right. Or no. You mean uh, getting a different scan? Yeah, I mean, just, from... I mean, if the patient requests, you know, you, they followed the rules. They've had one scan, nothing showing up. They've had another scan. They followed your doubling time rules. Nothing shows up. And so they say, listen, hey, Eugene, Dr. Kwan, I want a choline or I want an Axiomen scan. I mean, that is a logical request, isn't it? It is a logical request. And I think that patients have to know that they're not doing something wrong. The scans aren't broken. Right. Something weird isn't happening. We even here where we have all the PET scans on the planet and we're doing them left and right. We've had guys because of distribution of disease. You have to remember distribution of disease also plays a role. So if all the cancer is in one spot, there's a chance that you're going to pick it off early. But how often does that happen? So I think I have some diagrams that say 50 percent is one spot. But the rest of it, the rest of 50% is not in one spot. That means that the intensity of each lesion is smaller, so you have to give it more time. We've had guys in our practice that have chased PSAs all the way up to 650 you know, milligram per deciliter yeah. on a PSA, and they still haven't shown up on any of the PET scans. And that's a situation where you're probably dealing with dust in the wind, where everything's settled out. So part of it is the biology. Part of it is the dissemination of disease distribution. Part of it is bad luck. If the cancer is plastered to the side of the liver, which makes it tough to see 
on a PET scan. There's yeah. a whole lot of features that um, play into this. But I tell the vast majority of our patients, you have to be patient yeah, and you have to give it time and you don't want to lose your nerve and jump into some kind of therapy that's nonsensical just because the PSA is going up. Because oftentimes I think that that can be more injurious than actually giving a little extra time to find the lesions. And yeah. actually, right now, it's funny that you raise this. I actually asked my fellow recently to tabulate the finding of everyone at Mayo Clinic that had a PSA of 10 or greater where they did not have a lesion on PET scan. Because I would like to know, is there a cutoff PSA value where you get above that value and you already know you're dealing with diffuse disseminated disease that would be useful because that would be a situation where once you hit that ring that bell you can say to a guy you probably have metastatic disease or you in, in the old nomenclature that would be referred to as m0 disease mm -hmm. what is m0 disease it's you can't see the lesion but you know it's metastatic you know mm -hmm. so yeah. is there an m0 for pet Interesting. I'm going to, I'm leaving pet for just a second. Cause I, I can't get this out of my brain that I'm going to come back and then we're going to finish with lutetium and go from there. I, rem, I, I had this, I have these quan flashbacks. I don't know if this is a healthy thing for me. Maybe I have trouble sleeping. Cause I have these quanisms. You say something and it sticks in my gray matter and then I can't get it out. I can't shake it out. So this is what's sticking in my mind. And I brought this up with Dr. Johnson. And I want to bring it up with you. What you implied last time I interviewed you was that essentially the bone scan and some of these other imaging devices are going by the way of the museum. That ultimately it's all going to be about PET CT for imaging, maybe combined with MRI, but the bone scan itself is essentially becoming more and more obsolete. Now I asked you that about a year ago. How do you feel about it now? You know, I don't use bone scans maybe once or twice a year, you know? And I think that we've been doing a pretty good job of managing our patients and- Wait, once or twice a year, and how many patients do you see per month? Probably 6,000. What? Yeah. As it, did you, you didn't say 600, you said 6,000. Yeah. That I said per month. Oh, per month. 6,000 a year. Oh, okay, yeah. a year. But still, that's a mind, yeah. still, okay, that's a mind blowing number. So yeah. you're, so I'm laughing. I don't, I don't use, uh, I don't use bone scans very often. So you're saying, you're saying to one or two bone scans per 6,000 patients per year? Some of them come in with bone scans, so we won't reorder them, but I don't, I don't use, I think I've only ordered a handful of bone scans. Um, and typically they're in patients that can't get pet coverage for insurance, you know, and five, but I, five, I think that they're far inferior. And five years ago, how many were you doing a year? Well, truth be known, I've never liked bone scans. Oh, okay. I mean, I've <laughs> always thought that they were kind of Rorschach <laughs> exams, but, um, the reality, the, the reality is that, you know, probably when I started my practice, you know, everyone got a bone scan every three to four months. Um, since that time, PET has superseded that or, or, or supplanted use of bone scan, period. And it's not singularly because the bone scan is ugly or it doesn't work. I mean, a PET scan is one, it, it's, it's quick trip. It's yeah. 7-Eleven, you know, it's one-stop shopping. A yeah. PET scan is going to look at soft tissue. It's going to look at bone. It's going to look from forehead down to thigh, all in one fell swoop. Yeah. So why why subject patients to a million other scans if you can just get all the information on one scan? You know, the, I get so many patients that are told, you don't have metastatic disease. Your bone scan's fine. Well, yeah, of course, they're negative on a bone scan because all of their diseases in their lungs or in their lymph nodes. Yeah. But that's not synonymous with non-metastatic disease. No, you know? I know. I, it's, it's really, it's incredible. It's really interesting. Now, 
now per a Moyed moment, I'm now going to play devil's advocate because I personally do not believe people are talking about this enough. And I tried to push Dr. Johnson a little bit and he bit, he bit, I, I was trolling. So now I'm going to troll with you. I want to see if you bite on this line. And I think that you should, because you're one of the only people I know that would want to answer this question. Are you ready for it? I'm worried about this. I'm worried about the false positives and false negatives. And I'm worried that are we at a yikes or is Quan going to tell me, don't worry about it? Am I at a yikes or no worries on the scale? And the reason why is because, look at, I've looked at the choline data. I, there are false positives with any PET CT. And it takes a while to figure out why, what causes them. And should I worry about this? Because I am worried about it. Once again, I mean, I think that you have to provide some context. So okay. are we talking about the average community practice, right? So if you're talking about an average community practice where there's not a lot of familiarity with the scans, I think that there are going to be false positives and false negatives, false positives, especially. Um, at our institution, you know, for a long time, no one believed a single choline PET scan. When I started doing this, no one believed anything I said. This guy has brain met. No, that's not brain met. Prostate never goes to the brain. That's a lung. Met. So we used to biopsy everything. Uh -huh. uh, or the other thing that I heard a lot of was, I can't see it on an MRI. It's not there. I'm just going to observe the patient. And mm. then the guy comes back later and the thing's twice as big. Mm. So over time, I think we've developed sensitivities of what could be a false positive, what can be false negative. So stuff in the chest, I think you got to be careful about because it can be a false positive, like lymph nodes next to the airways, especially in the era of COVID, right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, so you have to be very sensitive about those things. You have to ask a lot of questions. Have you had a cold? Do you have an allergy? So forth and so on. You have to look at the lesions to see, are they super bright or are you squinting? I squint a lot, all right? So when, when, you're, when you're looking at these things, you have to decide, you know, is this a slap you in your face, false positive, possibly, or is that for real? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times when a guy has one lymph node that has your SUV max of 10 and everything else is negative, you have to sit there and say, that looks suspicious. And even those guys will send to the pulmonary guys and we'll get an EBUS biopsy on them. Yeah. Um, I think that where, you know, I, I have to say that it's shocking that you and I are having this discussion in this era because 10 years ago, we couldn't convince anyone to treat anything you find on a PET scan. And now the problem is a little bit on the other side of this thing. Everyone wants to treat everything they find on a PET scan. So part of it is rewarding in the sense that we created a change in thinking. But the other part of it is that we have to put the brakes on the system a little bit and say, you have to pause, you have to think about this before you actually treat. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff. PSMA PET scan, when it got rolled out, everyone said, this is the best thing. You know, this is this is the champion. And all of a sudden, the next meeting I saw taking place, everyone was saying, oh, no, those are all false positives. It's like, really? <laughs> you know, last year it was the best scanner on the planet. This year, every rib lesion is a false negative or false positive. It's like, really? They can't all be false positives. You have to sit down and you have to adjudicate them. Yeah. You have to look at them. If it looks strong, then the next question is, can you see it on an MRI or CT scan? Is there CT correlate? You have to adjudicate it some. And some of them, you have to say, I have no clue what's going on here. Maybe a little further observation is advisable. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I just, it's not, look, every test, every human, everything comes with a, fail. like you said, it's valuable as, I can't even pronounce that word anymore, makes mistakes. And so I, I think we're also just what you mentioned, the isolated, there, there are rib lesions. I remember a year ago, some guy called and said, this rib lesion keeps coming up. I said, just tell your 
doc to ch check the literature. And all of a sudden you started seeing these papers on these isolated rib lesions that were turned out to be false positive. So I, I, I just think it's something that we're going to, you know, I mean, I know you keep learning about this in real time and it's just, I wanted to hear your comment on it. You want to talk about lutetium now for the last 10 minutes? Sure. All right. Let's, let's start with the good news. Tell me how many patients do you believe, can you just say, I mean, you don't have to say the number, but you have, you've seen a lot of patients get lutetium now, even though it hasn't been out there. You've sent a large number of people into the phase three trial that helped get it approved. However, am I getting, am I seeing any Quan miracles? Have you seen a bunch of patients get this treatment and go, whoa, that's an amazing, I know you've had people that haven't had responses. Like you said, you have a third rule, third do well, third kind of mix, third don't. But I'm saying in that third to do well, have you had any sort of, how did that happen moments? You know, you know, once again, it's, it's context. So some of these guys are measuring their existence on this planet kind of by the minute. And they're very, very sick. And we have seen patients that are on the cusp of dying. Um, who have gotten treatment and they've been pulled back from the cliff. Hmm. Um, and some of them have gotten additional meaningful time with their life on the order of a year or two. Okay. Yeah. So in that regard, it is a miracle or a blessing in the sense that they had a meaningful response. The ones that I caution about though, is this idea that you don't have to do hormone therapy. You don't have to do chemotherapy. You don't have to take this drug. You don't have to worry about anything. You're just going to get lutetium and your cancer is going to go away forever. Mm. We don't see that. Mm. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't expect it because the cancer by definition is heterogeneous. Mm. So the patients thus far that I have seen that have done the best tend to be fairly lower volume patients with fairly smaller lesions. But part of that is that we track the hell out of these patients, whether people agree with us or don't agree with us. We don't follow blood markers. We don't follow nothing. We get imaging up the wazoo and we follow these patients. And if one lesion is not quite going away, we shoot it out of the sky with stereotactic radiation. If another lesion is over here, we'll freeze it with, you know, whatever. And in terms of guys that were back on the vision trial, you know, the one, the registrational trial that got it approved. I mean, we have probably two or three guys that are still disease free, but mm. it isn't in the absence of other maneuvers to get them there. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah no, I Had understand. they... Had they only relied on lutetium, we'd have zero that are disease free. Yeah, because you're six cycles and done, right? I mean, you get six, six and you're done. And I know that they're studying more than six or what can you can do, but um I I I it's not just a PSA thing and disease. Some of the some of the lesions kind of disappear or whatnot. Are you also seeing then I assume you're also seeing quality of life benefits because it's not just about the number, right? It's how you could have the greatest number all the time, but if the person feels like feels bad, then what what's going on here? So are they? Do you see people feeling better too? I definitely see feeling people feeling better. Um, there's no question about that. Okay. Um, one of the patients that I well, the one patient I showed that got the actinium after the lutetium. I mean, he was really ill and he did not feel well. And he was a young gentleman. And in my heart, I was worried that he was on his way off the planet. Um, we sent him for actinium and he felt even worse for a while. But then he started getting better. Um, some of these treatments will make you feel worse before you get better. But that's the hard part of treating. Yeah. Because you don't really know where you are in the evolution or de-evolution of the disease yeah you re you realize you just mentioned the buzzword and uh, there's a thousand people writing down that word actinium and they're thinking in their minds that's not fda approved how did this person get actinium and what do you say about that 
So there are different ways to get actinium right now. One is clinical trials in the United States. I think some investigators have in actinium trials. Um, whether or not we're opening any here, I don't honestly know. Um, but uh, if I want a patient to get actinium, I typically send them overseas to um, places like Germany or Turkey or um, Australia. These yeah. are the epicenters for isotope therapy and they have access to actinium. Um, right now, for whatever reason, we're using a lot of Turkey because patients are getting in and out very smoothly. And they really? um, actually, there's a doctor there who I really like, Dr. Kesban. Um, she is incredibly thoughtful about patients. She's very sensitive. I, I sense that she thinks about cancer treatment like we do here in my clinic. Yeah. And uh, she is administering actinium. Um, and she also administers lutetium to patients that don't qualify per FDA regulations in the United States. And wow. they really like Turkey. They say that Istanbul is much more interesting than Rochester, Minnesota. Um, I have no idea How why. How is that possible? I mean, we were the gateway to the north. Istanbul was the gateway between Europe and Asia, you know, I mean, how could it be more possible that, but they say that the, the care is outstanding uh, at their facility. Um, and I have no shame in saying that it's a Johns Hopkins uh, sponsored hospital and it's JACO approved. Um, and it's a very, very good place to get treatment. So it is a, it's a really good place. At the risk of becoming more popular, can you repeat that doctor's name again in, paper, in case people want to Google the person in Turkey? Because that's a name I have not heard. I don't even know how to pronounce her name. Okay. Um, but her, I call her Dr. Kesban. Uh, okay. Her last name is spelled, or her last name has even little symbols on it. And I don't know what they mean. Her name is Dr. Kezban, K-E-Z-B-A-N. Her last name is Burroglu, Bur 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 I, I, I'm so ashamed that I don't know how to pronounce her last name. So if you, if, if you are, say it again, sorry. Yeah, B-E-R-B-E-R-O-G with a little squiggle, yeah. L-U. L U and you know, the only reason I'm bringing this up is she's provided incredible care of my patients and I have not seen the level of professionalism and responsiveness from many different physician groups, including us that I've seen come out of Turkey. It's just shocking. Um, they must stay up all night. They have English interpreters. They have handlers. They have people that um, respectfully review medical cases. They assist with everything. And they, I've, I've written long introductions and I've gotten responses back in 20 minutes from these people in the middle of their night. Um, and the patients that go over have raved about the care. So the only reason I think it's worth mentioning it is I think that they represent a lot of what I envisioned medicine to be about when I got into the field of medicine. Yeah. And I think we've lost a lot of, uh, not a lot, but I think we've lost some of that. Yeah. Um, they're very patient care oriented. And I think that they basically should be applauded for their efforts, you know? Look, I think that's a watershed moment. I'm not here to say that that's where your miracle is gonna be, but when people are looking for options and they have the ability to go somewhere and think about those options, and I didn't, I didn't ask you about price. I'm sure it costs a little bit of money here, but if you wanna say something on price, if it's manageable, that's fine. But to, just to, oh, what PCRI is about, is that people forget that it was six, seven years ago, there were many people calling the helpline and calling the, the center, I call it, and they were being set, sent for PSMA scans at UCLA. 
they were being sent to Heidelberg for lutetium and actinium. And that was years before. It turned out to be a, a correct move for many people. So I think this is the surprise of my Q&A. I did not see the Turkey advocate the Turkey endorsement come in, and I and that's in Istanbul, you said? Istanbul. Okay. So, again, I want to put things in the right perspective. Dr. Kratokville in Germany with Dr. Yes. Haberkorn, incredible physicians. Yes. And they, they broke their backs to treat my patients. And they did a phenomenal job, and I don't ever want to give an indication that this person is better than that person. Right. But the reality has been in the last three years that they have, there have been a lot of forces that are unforeseen and difficult to deal with. One of the forces has been COVID. The other force has been availability of isotope. The other one is resources at the individual institutions and what are their federal regulations? What are their governmental restrictions? On top of it, we add to the fact that not everyone's a millionaire, right? right. A lot of patients right. are going to mortgage their house in the hopes that they can get a couple extra days on this planet. And so we have to consider all of these factors because the futures of these people are partly embedded in the decision as to what's best for them. So. I don't mind saying that, you know, sending patients to Turkey has been shockingly cheaper. Um, I think that their treatments have been on the order of $7,000 per treatment. I think that their PSMA PET scan is 60 bucks, six zero dollars okay? Um, I think that the hotel and airfare has been relatively reasonable. It doesn't mean that they're, that Dr. Kesban's a better doctor or more well-intentioned, but she is an excellent physician and she cares. Yeah. And I know that Dr. Lenzo in Australia, extraordinary guy, yeah. wonderful physician, one of, the, one of the best physicians, but it's been hard to get in and out of Australia. That's a big trip, costs a lot of money. Plus, during COVID, there were a lot of lockdowns. On top of it, for Germany, it's been hard to get in and out of Germany because the government kept shutting down and yeah. restricting travel. And on top of it, there have been expectations of the government that they need to focus resource and privilege on German citizens. So that's where Dr. Kesban comes into the equation. But I don't ever want to, you know... I get nothing out of this. I'm just interested in my patients or patients out there who are in a desperate situation or a concerning situation, you know, their ability ability to get something they need. Look, the reality is you're a really nice guy. You're 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 an attractive man. I I I <laughs> love you. I love you like a brother, but the reality is part of the reason we keep coming back to you is you have one of the busiest clinics in the world. And so if you don't know what's going on in the, I feel like I know what's going on globally, but if, if I turn to people like you to tell me, what am I missing? What else is going on globally? And those are the kind of moments. Nobody is implying that everybody's got to run there and pay for this. I just like the idea that you just still open up more opportunity, more times at bat if someone wants to do that. I'll tell you one thing that's been my experience with all these places that you mentioned, and probably Turkey, you have to tell me if I'm right or wrong, is at least when people called up, they got a very candid answer as to how much it would cost. It was candid. It was yeah. upfront. They knew what they were. It wasn't a guessing game. And so it, is that the, maybe that's the same experience you had. It really, you know, it's for me, it's been eye opening um, because, you know, this, this happened with U S consumerism back in many of the earlier recessions when U.S. businesses start to fail. Everyone's sitting around saying, well, why is U.S. business failing? And then all of a sudden someone comes out and says, well, it's because we treat our consumers poorly, right? So then there was an increased focus on how to treat consumers. The thing that has been really eye-opening to me is 
the level of respect and care and straightforwardness and facilitator, facilitatory um, kind of guidance that patients that go overseas get compared to what we get in the US. I mean, I think that we are lucky at Mayo because I do think that we have a business apparatus that um, tries to take care of patients as much as possible. But overseas, it's palpable. They give you, you know, interpreters. They're sensitive to where you came from. They give you prices. They tell you what hotel to stay in. They, you know, welcome you and treat you like you are a very important person who's going through a hard journey, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to see, you know, I'm not knocking anything, but I think that I'd like to see a lot more of that here I mean, in the United States, you know? I, this, every time I interview you, we, we come up with some surprise. And like, again, I, I think this is incredibly valuable information. Um, PCRI, like I said, you know, the one thing I want to say for sure, I think that, you know, and I, I can fully understand it. You know, the, the, the most common complaint that's registered against someone like me is that you're insensitive. You didn't get this point. You didn't get that point. You're not advocating for me. You're more concerned about business than care. You're more concerned about your reputation than it's untrue. The one thing about me is I get physically ill when my patients do poorly. I get physically sick when I hear some of the nightmares my patients go through. I, I literally, you know, I almost can combust when I feel that patients are not treated well. Mm -hmm. And the part of me that I, I still don't quite understand is I came into the field of medicine to fix people. And I thought that that was the goal of what we should do. And I thought that nothing should ever stay in the way, stand in the way of that. And I just feel like not everyone in the U.S. model feels that way anymore. And I would like to see it come back. And I think that that's what places like Turkey are understanding. They're understanding that, you know, emotions care, prices care. Human decency, respect, care, you know, is important. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't want to get into the whole medical model, but, you know, the reason I give these talks is because, like I said, if I were a patient, and if I were sick, I'd be really picky about who I talk to and I'd try to gobble up as much information and I'd do everything possible to make some of the right decisions. And the consequences of not making the right decisions are patients that, you know, the dads die and the children are upset and the house is destroyed and the futures are, you know, disrupted. It's and some of it, I believe, is something that, you know, is controllable. So I'm trying to equip patients with as much information as possible. I'm not trying to say that I'm always right, but I'm trying to equip them with as many utensils and devices as possible intellectually so that they can fend for themselves in this world because it's hard enough just getting a diagnosis of cancer, period. Right. I don't know how people even stay in the game. It is horrible. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. No, I appreciate that. And it makes me think of, man, it makes me think of my father, who was, he was the smartest doctor I'll ever meet. I'm telling you, of course, I'm biased, who was so incredible with patients. And when he got sick and got cancer, he used to say to me all the time, and I sometimes I would brush it off, but I now I know what he means. He said, until you're on the other side, you don't know how hard it is. And I went, oh, man, that's that that it still hits me to talk about that so i i appreciate that but now so so pluvicto i apologize i kind of got sidetracked but i blame that on you because you brought up a couple of nuggets there <laughs> so i had to chase them i had to chase sorry, them sorry it's yeah like I, like, like a, I had to chase them like a squirrel which is your mascot of grinnell college which you didn't know last time i asked you i had to inform you 
it was the unofficial mascot of your college is the fox squirrel. Um, okay, Pluvicto, just a quick summary. Who, who qualifies immediately for it? And can I get, I'm sorry I'm doing this. When people do this to me, it makes me wacky because I can never remember the second question. Who strictly qualifies right now to get lutetium? And is it possible to get a PSMA that qualifies you and then get the treatment in the same visit, or do you got to separate those? Yeah. So um, you have to have hormone resistant disease, PSA going up while you're on hormone therapy. You have to have metastases, spots outside of the prostate. You have to have disease that lights up inside a PSMA PET scan, most likely a gallium PSMA PET scan, but some people can get F18, check with your insurance company to see which one you should get. And then once, and then you have to have received previously taxane-based chemotherapy at some point. Didn't have to fail it, but you at least have to have had some. And then you should have also played around with either Zytiga, which is abiaterone, Extandi, which is enzalutamide, or Lita, which is apalutamide, or darolutamide, which is Nubeca. You have to have put some of those in your mouth at some point along the journey. Okay. So those four things will qualify you for treatment, at which point your physicians will push a button and say it's time to order the Plavicto. The Plavicto is ordered and it takes two and a half weeks to make its journey to your facility okay. for treatment. And so it's not like you can get the scan on one day and get the treatment, although we are trying to make some arrangements to make that happen because a lot of our patients travel far and wide to come here for therapy. So we are working on those kinds of things, but right now it's kind of qualify first, get invited later for treatment. Let's say I go through, I'm just putting this out as an example. Let's say I go through a couple of cycles or rounds of chemotherapy. I'm not doing very well and I didn't necessarily fail it, but I want to, I have to move on or any other type of treatment. I have to move on. Am I possibly a candidate for this or I have to have actually no longer responded to those therapies? You mean, like I'm sorry. Taxing. Like you said, yeah. the taxing. so that, that one, you just have to have had a history of receiving taxane based chemotherapy. I know, but that sounds very malleable. That sounds like there's a lot of latitude there. Some patients have received some treatments and they, quit because they had side effects, they have taxane sensitivities, they got side effects of the treatment, they got sepsis, they got violently ill, they stopped. Okay. That's in my book, you don't want to give them taxane, move on to Pluvicto. Some patients have gotten three treatments, PSA's starting to go up, they've switched yeah. to something else. The Where we've seen problems, though, is where an insurance company will say, well, he didn't really fail taxing chemotherapy. It's like, what do you mean? He's had it before. Now the patient's here. Cancer's growing back. Yeah, but it might work again. Give him more. Give him more. Give him more until it fails. So then actually when I start preparing the talk, I'm like, wait a minute. It doesn't even say failed taxing-based chemotherapy. It says has been treated. Ah. with taxane-based chemotherapy. Ah. So I think that that's why I'm trying to educate patients. Yeah. Don't necessarily fall in a pothole where someone says the only reason you can get the therapy is after you fail all this other stuff. Yeah. I think that that's a misinterpretation no, of the that's indication. Awesome. That's yep. awesome. Okay. So what about another exception? Like an oligo met, I got a few mets in the pelvis. I've gone through all of that. I, you see what happens is you have to admit this is a fact when you deal with a lot of these scans and you see them at patient advocacy meetings, a lot of people like to show the scan where there's all this disease everywhere. What about the, what about the guy who has just a few spots, maybe in the pelvis and fits the criteria? Do you get excited about Pluvicto there? Or are you thinking more conservatively? 
So we actually have brought this up and we're thinking about doing a clinical trial because for the last 10 years, all I talked about is shooting down oligomastic disease. Thank you. So here we are and all of a sudden it's like, you know, a guy walks through the door and Dr. Kwan says, oh, I'll give you Plavicto. It's like, wait a minute, I thought you can shoot these things. And so we don't know the answer. We don't know if it's better to shoot the thing and save Plavicto for the future. We don't know if it's better to treat with Plavicto because it's small and then shoot whatever doesn't respond. We don't know if it's better to do both, shoot it and give Plavicto. My right. gut feeling is probably it's going to be better to do both. But, you know, we don't have data or evidence one way or another. And it's created a situation. And it we have we don't treat anyone here without a tumor board meeting. Um, and I've always been resistant about tumor boards because um, historically, you know, the things that we presented typically didn't fit into what historical guidelines would be. So everyone would always say no. But now there are some hard questions. We don't know if it's better to shoot the oligometastatic disease or if it's better to treat with pl Plavicto or do a little of both. Likewise, just with chemo too. I've argued that sometimes it's better to give chemo and shoot the spots at the same time mm. to get a more permanent outcome. We still don't have the answer to that. So there's still a lot of unknowns. Some of this will have to be unraveled with very smart clinical trials. Um, I just hope that we get around to answering some of them soon. You know? So if I hear you, and I think I do hear you, and I've been doing the math in my head since you said the word 6,000, that means 1,500 every three months of people that you see, right? And so what I think you're saying is that for those guys who fit the criteria for Pluvicto, if they've just got a couple of spots, you have plenty of people that could possibly just get Pluvicto. You have, you have, you have some that you just zap and some that you may consider you've already had experience with this. So is it, it just sounds like it's a mixed bag and you decide privately. With Gener, gener generally, um, patients that have two or less met metastases, we will shoot at those. So we still treat stereotactically. It's the ones, you know, we just wrote a paper. I think it's coming out somewhere soon that um, our best experience is solitary metastasis. So if you have a solitary metastasis, I think that that's a situation you should shoot at it or yeah. you should try to pick it off. I think that's indisputable. And I think it would be wrong to jump to Plavicto for a solitary met. If you have two that um, are compelling, I think it's reasonable to shoot at them. But then when you start to get to oligomastic disease three, oligomastic disease four, oligomastic disease five, but, or yeah. if it's very, very disparate, you know, a spot here, a spot on the ankle, spot... I think that you start to shift towards that's not going to respond to picking it off. That needs to be treated with something like Plavicto. And I think that that's the way we deal with it here, which is ironic because, you know, we have our tumor meetings and a patient will pop up with one or two spots and I'll say, well, I'm thinking about giving this guy Plavicto and I now have Mayo Clinic telling me, well, no, 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 wait, why don't you pick those off stereotactically? which yeah. always cracks me up because I used to have to twist people's arms right. to shoot it, you know? Right, right, right. Yep. So this is your fault. You, you keep taking me down this path. So if you have a single oligo that got shot three, four, year, four years ago at your clinic, and then another oligo met springs up right near it, a single, is that what, in other words, if there are plenty of oligometastatic patients that have a lesion here or a lesion there, it was treated, they're doing fine, but three or four years later, somewhere near that lesion comes another lesion. Is that someone you're thinking again, let's zap that, or you're thinking, oh, that might be more aggressive. We need to go to Plavicto. We we would retreat that. I mean, if it's literally one of these border lesions, yeah, you know, so it's you there just a lot. Made, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It happens a lot, especially with stereotactic radiation. Because yeah. stereotactic fires within a fraction of a millimeter. So you, and we just had this conversation, Dr. Stish and I, he's our stereotactic star here. He said that a lot of people, when they treat, they don't treat broadly. They just treat the lesion. But the problem is you have to think of these lesions as having tentacles. Exactly. And the tentacles can be underestimated. So you really should be treating a little bit broader 
than just the lesion. So we do have a lot of patients that come to us that have gotten outside stereotactic and we have to clean up. Yeah, no, that's Retreat. a really good way of putting it. I thought of it many years ago that a lot of people think of like this circular spot that appears in the scan. But I remember one time I spilled some paint and I got in trouble for it. But when I spilled the paint, it had a little circle, but then it had a little arm here and a little arm there. It right? looks like it looks like Nickelodeon. It looks like the si symbol for Nickelodeon, right? Yeah. The, spl the paint splotch. Yeah, the yep. paint splot. And I thought, Oh, I wish we carried that as an analogy because it's not just this circular spot. It has these arms that, like you said, oh man, I swear you, this is the best Q and A I've ever had with you. And I'm saying that, and I'm usually <laughs> right half. I'm usually right half the time. A few more <laughs> quick things. Yeah. Uh uh, I can't let you leave here without the catch. The catch is every time I get Pluvicto, let me just report this from the prescribing information. Thirty nine percent experienced dry mouth. And then here's something interesting no one ever taught me. Dry mouth was defined as not just dry mouth and the ability not to make saliva. It also include dry throat. I didn't know that. So zero stomia, zero meaning dry, stomia meaning mouth or opening. What say you about one of the most common side effects, something to worry about or self-limiting? So number one, before I forget, the side effects that we're seeing with lutetium are going to be worse with actinium. Okay. Yes, thank you. So xerostomia, even though actinium is stronger, it's going to knock out the salivaries. It can hurt the kidneys and it can hurt the bone marrow. And we have lots of patients that have received actinium. And then years later, they're having big problems with kidneys, bone marrow, and salivary glands. Mm, the mm. reason it occurs, of course, is because even though it's called prostate-specific membrane antigen, the reality is it's not as specific as people thought. And there's a ton of prostate-specific membrane antigen on parotid and submandibular and tear glands. Ah, tear glands. So if you look at a PET scan, and if you're not a smart guy that does this a lot, if you want a quick and dirty way to look and say, oh, that's a PSMA PET scan, look at the head. And if the tear glands and the salivary glands and right. submandibulars light up brightly and sharply, you're looking at a PSMA PET scan. And so Interesting. The zero stomia and stuff comes because the isotopes bind to those glands and kill them. And it can be quite dissatisfying and it can be debilitating and it can be a huge problem for some patients. Some patients will have, as a secondary consequence, horrible ability to taste food because the saliva mixes in there and moves all the good stuff around and makes you enjoy your food. When you don't have the saliva, your taste goes to hell yeah. and you can't really enjoy your food. So in terms of a quality of life thing, it can be debilitating or it can be a problem. We've tried maneuvers. Everyone's tried maneuvers to pack glands on ice Next and do month. all of these things. Yeah. However, I think that they've been relatively limited in their ability to do that. Um, I think that people are thinking about ways of um, momentarily blocking the arteries or doing something that prevents the isotope from getting in there. In the old days, we used to feed, we used to feed cold ligand to the site before giving things so that the actual um, ligand cannot bind to the protein. So shoot some anti-PSMA antibody up there before and then give the drug so that those spots are blocked. But none of that has hit prime time. A lot of it has to be developed and tested. Um, I, so the, the bottom line is it is a problem still, and we don't have a good solution. But not, but, but much more self-limiting and not as much of a problem with Pluvicto. And it's something, it, a, a large, like this said, in the trial, they had 39% of all grades so not as bad as with actinium, like you said, right? But actinium is going to be rough, I think. Rough, but I, but what I've seen in all the reviews from the groups is some of them will use these ice bags for thirty minutes to up to four hours after treatment, 
intermittently and some of them will say it works and then other review paper papers say oh it's not that great and so are i guess what i'm asking is are you guys still using the cryo the ice bags or are you just kind of winging it i actually asked that question to our team before we did this because i didn't know the answer and i think that the response i got is they don't think it's very effective and they're not doing it really that's too bad but you know i don't again differently but i was hoping that would you know as it's used in chemo on the feet, you know, on the hand sometimes to reduce the neuropathy, you reduce the drug going in there. I thought maybe it would help. And so they're, they're not. So I guess it really is. If someone wants to do it, they can do it. But otherwise, people aren't excited about it at your institution. I guess if I were a patient, I'd probably do it. But yeah. I, you know, the, the problem is that the depth of the glands, it's hard to cool them down that much. And yeah. the binding of the agent to, you know, that's coming up vascular from the inside. It's so quick binding. I think it's hard to block that. I think that the only way you're really going to block that is basically to uh, shut down the blood supplies. And that's hard to do or I cold, a, cold bind it. I saw a trial of Botox with, I don't know what's going to happen. The idea that you sort of stun that area, maybe it doesn't absorb. I, don't, I mean, people are they're trying to use Botox for everything. I know, but that's true. That's true. Botox walks your dog these days. I mean, it does yeah. basically everything. I pulled a paper uh, just published in European Urology last year from um, part of it was the the group from Germany. And there was something that caught, I, again, I, I'd like to focus as much on the negative as on the positive, just so people understand what they're getting. And here was the patient summary from the medical journal from their retrospective look at actinium. So they're excited about actinium, but here was the line that caught my attention, and I hate to belabor this. It said, actinium showed substantial anti-tumor effect in late metastatic uh, castrate-resistant prostate cancer after lutetium failure, okay? So that's exciting, and I'm thinking, hey, this is one of the, the, the groups. You know a lot of members of this group, but here's how they finished the last sentence of the patient summary. However, dry mouth is a common side effect that caused about a quarter, a quarter of patients to stop therapy. I think that, uh, I think, like I said, you know, the, the dry mouth can be quite debilitating and it can take a lot of joy out of eating and enjoying life. Yeah. And uh, I think that, you know, once again, you know, I, I don't want to see a comment on you know, the little comments at the end of my presentation that Dr. Kwan doesn't care about taste and swallowing and all that stuff. I think some of these things, we think that they're minor, but there are huge consequences. And I think that they, they impact some of these people's lives greatly. I All I can say is I, I think that we should probably be thinking about a lot of effort on how to avoid that side effect. Um, and it may require some thinking about delivery and some of the technologies in order to mitigate against that. It, it is a tough one. I have had to do, I'm, I'm doing some review papers and some looks at different things people have done to mitigate it. And it's come with a number of catches, but you know, I got to be optimistic. Something's going to happen here. I decided to look at all the lutetium trials going on globally and it fills up many pages and it's in every possible scenario. And Dr. Johnson touched upon this in one of his slides. And um, it's almost every scenario you can think of. So that's exciting. That's exciting. Now, here's my question. It may be related to this or not. I'm going to take out my checkbook because I just won the recent lottery. I'm going to write Quan a check for $100 million because I like Quan so much that I want him to just quit wasting time and do his dream trial. I want him to do a, his dream trial. Here's a hundred million dollars. Of course, of the hundred million, you give Moyed at least a million for his personal use. Um, but the rest of it, you can spend. What trial would Eugene Kwan want to do with the hundred million dollars that Mark Moyed is going to write to him today? So uh, I already thought about proposing this and I've articulated this several times. So um, I want to develop local regional delivery um, for a number of reasons. One of 
the reasons is because you get systemic side effects. So in order to reach the tumors better, um, I think that we can develop minimal invasive ways of doing that um, and maybe even mitigate against some of the systemic side effects, kidneys and, and glands. So if a patient has disease down in the pelvis, we should be developing ways that deliver predominantly isotope to the stuff in the pel pelvis. Um, for guys that have what I call infield failure, we're just studying this right now. This is recurrence of cancer inside of uh, an irradiated field, which is a plague in the world because the radiation guys have irradiated everyone that's had prostate taken out or a prostate that's still intact. So we see a ton of patients that have something called in-field failure, which means the cancer is now growing back inside an area that's been irradiated. And this is a plague. We don't have good solutions for this. So I've already told Novartis verbally that we got to figure out how to use their isotope to cure in-field failure by local delivery. But the big one, that I really want to do, and we have interest here at Mayo, is I want to actually treat prostate cancer in situ without removing the prostate. So the consequence of that would be to do away with prostatectomy and do away with radiation therapy of the prostate and leave the gland intact so that people aren't impotent, so that they are not incontinent, so they don't have to have the surgeries, but they don't have prostate cancer to deal with moving forward. So I call that isotopic prostatectomy. Right. I want to knock it out just by doing this. And actually, our surgeons here are on board with this. They're interested in it. And now we have to kind of see if the companies and so forth are willing to help us get, you know, develop these techniques. One of the reasons I want to do it is because obviously everyone knows the downside of radiation of prostate, surgery of the prostate. You know, Mark Scholes wrote books about, you know, the evils of prostatectomy, whatever. But mainly, I just think that there's probably better ways of doing things using minimal, uh, minimal invasive approaches. And I think that we can also spare systemic toxicities of the patients because we do not know what the consequences, consequences or consequences of these therapies are on the body over the long run. Hmm. So that's where you'd put it. You'd put it in this category that we were actually talking about in order to even provide localized effects. Get rid of prostate cancer, yeah. People don't realize that before we did this interview, we went skiing together. Uh, the three of us, right? I mean, Eugene, Quan, and Mark and Alex went skiing together and we took one photo. Should, should we show you that photo that we took together and we all went skiing together recently? I don't have a recollection of that ski trip. Um, <laughs> but if, it, if the photo is there, is it there? Is Alex there? Uh, let me see. This is where we were on this chairlift and this is where Mark Moya looks at me and he goes, you know, do you know how to drive a chairlift? <laughs> and I, you know, I didn't know where he was going with that, but you know, this is what we had to deal with. Okay? No, that's true. I, I was saying yeah. to myself at this point, wasn't Mark Scholes on the chairlift? That's where the fourth seat came from. And now we know where he was. He was basically skiing, yeah. you know, uh, a la California style. And that's why you were shocked. Alex, you can you can leave us, but I'm I I want you to say what I just heard, and I'm telling you, Eugene, that was the best Q and A I've ever done with you, and I have no idea why, but you just always get better. I you're just an amazing guy. You're a great friend. I'm not going to say too many things because I want you to be able to get your head outside of the Mayo door. It's going to become too big, and so I just appreciate you a lot, Alex. I'll let you finish it, Doctor Quan, because, I can only because you're the fearless leader. I'm going to let Alex, she's going to say it better than me. Can you finish up my segment by basically trying to say what I'm trying to say? Yes, I, I can read your mind by now after a decade. So <laughs> uh, Dr. Kwan, 
I mean, I can't thank you enough for giving that talk. First of all, we have so many people who are so hungry for information when it comes to Fluvicto and the treatments that you talked about, but being able to even talk about the access and the care for patients and even mentioning travel and the costs and what to expect, the side effects. These are things that are questions in our mind at PCRI, but questions for patients all around the world. I can't thank you enough. You not only did it, in a, a beautiful manner, but it was very concise and to the point. And that's exactly what we need here at PCRI. You have always been a rock star speaker for us. Your personality alone is incredible because you're able to bring warmth and levity. And we absolutely know that you care for these patients. The fact that you go do this basically for free for us and come in and say, hey, I'm gonna speak and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to educate patients on what I see here at the Mayo Clinic every single day and then making that access on to a global scale for patients is beyond incredible. So I personally can't thank you. I learned a lot and I'm looking forward to making future videos for PCRI and, and furthering uh, this, this cause, but I can't thank you enough. And, and like I said, it's, uh, you know, I consider it an honor and privilege to have this forum to try to help patients because in my mind, that's what it's all about. The only thing that I'd like to caution is you know, the patients should probably double check everything I say, because just because I said something costs this much, or this is the way it, it's, it's always worthwhile to dub, double check things because, you know, to be honest, I'm doing a lot of this kind of off the top of my head. Um, prices change, uh, information changes. And like I said, you know, I am fallible just like every other human being. So, you know, I don't mind people double checking what I say because, you know, it's it's their lives and it it really matters, you know. I mean, the fact that you even say that you're fallible as a physician, as an expert physician at Mayo and have people double check just shows where your heart's at. So we can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwan, and thank you so much, Dr. Moya. That was awesome. Our next segment is a sponsored talk from Bayer, and they will be discussing non-metastatic and early metastatic prostate cancer presented by Kelly Gingrich. I hope you find this informative. Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Kelly Gingrich. I'm one of the oncology nurse educators for Bayer Pharmaceuticals, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to be here with you guys today for your PCRI conference. Um, this is such an honor for me. I just want to start off by saying that you're all heroes in my eyes, and it's so admirable that you're here growing your knowledge and gaining new knowledge to be able to help best advocate for yourselves and others that are also going through the prostate cancer journey. Um, please note that today's presentation does comply with all applicable FDA regulations. And during the presentation, we're going to be re reviewing all sorts of information in regards to Nubeca. We're going to talk about its safety and its efficacy data, along with a lot of important um, other little pieces of information throughout the, throughout the material and the, uh, and the presentation along the way. So without further ado, we're going to dive into things. So um, today we're gonna to be talking about Nubeca. And I think one of the easiest um, hints to remember the name is that it stands for new better quality. The other name for Nubeca is darolutamide. Um, and it's a prescription medication that's used to treat adults with prostate cancer that has not spread to other parts of the body and no longer responds to medical or surgical treatment that lowers testosterone. Um, this encompasses that non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer space or NMCRPC. And we're gonna dive deeper into that word. I know it can be a little confusing trying to understand the landscape of prostate cancer and each of these different um, acronyms as well. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and hopefully gain a better understanding of what that truly means. Um, it is not known if Nubeca is safe and effective in women or children. Um, and we also do have additional safety information scattered all throughout the presentation. So first off, it's really important that you have open and honest dialogue with your healthcare provider. We need to know about all of your different medical conditions, including if you have any heart problems, high blood pressure, diabetes, or high amounts of fats or cholesterol in your blood. Um, that's often called dyslipidemia as well. Um, and by doing this, we can better treat um, you and be able to pick appropriate treatment options that fit the overall picture. So some of our objectives or goals today is that we wanna understand what can happen when hormone therapy is no longer enough to treat your prostate cancer that has not spread to other parts of the body. 
We're also going to understand what some definitions and terms that are used to describe prostate cancer and how treatment helps. We want to talk about what rising PSA levels can mean and why you should take action. We're going to review how Nubeca works, really what's its mechanism of action. We're going to talk about the clinical study that proved Nubeca works and possible side effects seen in the study. And this really leans towards the FDA indication that we received for the non-metastatic space. And that was actually back at the very end of July in 2019. Um, and also, too, we're going to talk just we're going to mention our new indication as well that we just received last month in August. And so it's really important to know that this information um, is updated based off of both indications of the product and also how to take Nubeca. We're going to discuss some various support services for men taking Nubeca. We all know that this is really important to make sure that not only um, are you having a good experience on the medication, you can have a great quality of life on it. Um, but also to uh, the affordability of the medication. And so what options are available to help support you in that realm? Um, and as well as the, another additional important piece of important safety information, um, whenever you're talking to your provider about your medical conditions, please also mention if you've had a history of seizures, brain injuries, stroke, brain tumors, just be a very nice all-inclusive list. And again, this can help, um, help all of us treat you better. So whenever we're talking about um, hormone therapy and prostate cancer in general, you, you will notice throughout this presentation, we are going to have some words that are in bold. And these terms will be explained as we go through the presentation as well. Um, and when, when you have prostate cancer, the testosterone in your body causes it to grow and spread. Now, prostate cancer is a hormone sensitive cancer. Um, and I think that that's really, really important to understand where testosterone plays a role in prostate cancer. Testosterone, as you know, is the main male hormone. Um, it is an androgen type hormone that causes men's secondary sexual characteristics to develop. Um, and in men with prostate cancer, testosterone can also cause the cancer to grow and spread. And so we have all different agents, whether it's androgen deprivation therapy agents or agents such as Nubeca that may be classified underneath the second generation um, second generation hormone therapy category um, that causes lowering of testosterone levels. And we do want to lower these testosterone levels to help to remove that fuel to the prostate cancer fire, if you will. Um, you may already be on hormone therapy, such as Lupron, to bring your testosterone levels down to very low levels. And really, these hormone therapy um, agents, they cause your testosterone levels to be um, undetectable in your lab work. But hormone therapy at that point may not be enough to keep the cancer from starting to grow again. And so at that point in time, um, we need to add, we need to do something more. We need to add another medication into the mix. Um, and when we're talking about hormone therapy options, Lupron is something that is used uh, very frequently, but there's also this nice little uh, list down below that you guys may re recognize some of these medications on that list um, as, as being some medications that you're currently on. Um, and all of these medications aim at lowering testosterone levels. They all are classified, or classified under the androgen deprivation therapy category. Um, and in turn, I don't really like the word medical castration, but I'm going to use that because that is the medical term associated with it because we're lowering those testosterone levels to castrate levels. But there's the other option, and that is for surgery, and that's with surgical castration or a bilateral orchiectomy, which will surgically lower those levels down to undetectable levels. And so um, either way is not wrong. They both are aimed at doing the same thing. Um, and some individuals um, may pick one versus the other for various reasons. So just really important to note that. So when hormone therapy works, your prostate specific antigen or your PSA level um, drops and it stays low. And with PSA, I mean, we oftentimes look at this biomarker as being our tumor marker for prostate cancer. Um, and so for PSA levels as well, I mean, we, especially in the beginning of the disease course, we oftentimes look at this as the activity of the prostate cancer. We look at this as if we see doubling of the PSA that the activity of the prostate cancer is increasing and really helps us understand when we need to do more, when we need to do more imaging, when we need to change treatment options. And so it's a very important value. Um, I do tend to chuckle and laugh because I know it's something that I always had some anxiety over when I was looking for patients. Um, and I always called PSA, uh, whether it's provider specific anxiety or patient specific anxiety, and with good reason. And there's a reason that we're looking at that um, because it is so important. But um, also, there is anxiety um, around the PSA level and what it's doing. 
Um, and so when the hormone therapy stops working, the PSA levels may rise, even if your cancer has not spread to other parts of the body. Um, and this is really in turn uh, kind of defining that NMCRPC space or non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. When we see um, low levels of testosterone, but a rising PSA, uh, we're worried about emerging castration resistance at that point in time. So what does that word mean? Let's break that down. So NMCRPC, non-metastatic. Whenever we look at metastatic in, in the terms of cancer, that's cancer spreading. So non-metastatic in turn is that cancer has not spread to other parts of the body. When we're looking at CRPC, that's castration resistant prostate cancer. It's cancer that starts in the prostate gland and keeps growing even when the amount of testosterone in the body is brought down to very, very low levels. So let's keep moving forward here. So when your PSA rises, it means that your cancer could spread to other parts of your um, body. So it's really important that your doctor monitors your PSA levels. And some of you may be wondering, how do they do that? What, how can somebody draw a PSA level? Well, it's via your lab, your lab work. And so uh, this is a lab test. It would just, they would get a tube of blood and send it off. And that's how you would get your PSA level. Uh, your PSA levels may rise even if you're on hormone therapy. So if your PSA level rises, that's because your prostate cancer is castration resistant, meaning that the prostate cancer keeps growing even when the amount of testosterone in the body is brought down to very low levels. So this is a really nice picture that kind of outlines it. Um, and I hope it, this really clarifies what that word means, what this space means, because it can be very confusing within the prostate cancer landscape. So again, you're seeing that PSA level rise despite having low levels of testosterone, and that equates to prostate cancer being castration resistant. So let's look why that matters. So it matters because it's really important to delay the spread of prostate cancer. So whenever we're seeing these pictures here in front of you, first off, you can see the first picture, the little blue dot represents cancer in the prostate. And the whole goal of treatment is to delay that spread of the prostate cancer. And then moving into this other picture where cancer is spreading outside of the prostate. And so why does delaying the spread of prostate cancer matter? Um, it matters because we want to prevent it from spreading to other parts of the body because it can cause symptoms. And this is where we don't want us to get to. Um, symptoms can include things such as bone pain, worsening fatigue. I mean, other things that aren't written on here. I mean, it could be difficulty sleeping at night, uh, decreased activities of daily living or ability to do things that you love to do on a day to day basis. So just really, I know one of the hardest things is, is really when you get into um, a doctor's office and they sit you down and they ask you, hey, how are you feeling? I mean, it's very easy to be like, oh, I'm doing okay or fine or everything's great, but um, really kind of keeping a list of symptoms that you may be experiencing between, between each of your clinic visits. Um, and please tell them about any new symptoms that you may be feeling, especially after starting on a new therapy. That's even more important. Um, so even just symptom logs can be really, really helpful. Um, so make, making sure that, um, that you are talking to your doctor, that even if it's something that you may seem to be kind of silly, please bring it up to them. Nothing is silly. Everything is important. Everything you have to say matters and is important. And our goal is to make sure that you're doing the best you can on a therapy. And we want to make sure that um, we can prevent any further symptoms from occurring, stabilize the disease and prevent progression. So, so um, please bring those up to your providers, whether it's your advanced practice providers or your physicians and, and your nursing staff, of course. So let's now talk about what you can do when it's time to take action. So when it's time to take action, there is Nubeca. And so Nubeca, um, you can see the, what the bottle looks like here. Um, and it is a month's supply. So this is 120 tablets in the bottle. So it's, um, and we're going to talk about dosing here in a minute. Um, but Nubeca, it's important to note that the size of the pill is smaller than the size of a dime. And I know I had a lot of patients that always asked me too, whenever I worked in clinic, oh, Kel, how, how big's that pill? How big's that tablet? Um, and it is, I mean, it is something that hopefully that will be um, easy enough for you to swallow because we do understand that larger pills are more difficult, even with all the swallowing tricks that are available in the book, say with applesauce and et cetera. So, so that is really important. Um, and so new Becca, again, we are talking about it in the, um, where it's indicated in response to that non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer space. Um, and so also too, please note that we are now indicated as well with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer 
in combination with docetaxel, which is a chemotherapy agent. So I, I definitely want to point that out. Even though this presentation is directed more towards the non-metastatic space, um, we are super excited to be able to bring you all that new indication. And we will have um, another presentation to follow um, that will be directed more towards this new indication. So it's not to um, it's not to undermine the importance of, of uh, another new indication and another ability to help patients in a different setting as well. Um, and I also should note too, you guys may be looking at this restricted um, label at the bottom of the screen too. Please note that this is just, um, this is something we use internally. Um, and it's not that this information is restricted by any means. Um, so it's, it's really important that we're able to share that with you today as well. All right, so um, now that we talked about the size of the pill, we're gonna get to dosing in a little bit. Um, let's talk a little bit more about some important safety information before moving forward. So before taking new Becca, please again, talk to your healthcare provider about all of your medical conditions. Um, this also includes having kidney or liver problems. And that's because what they're gonna do is they may lower your dose. You may start on a lower dose than what you otherwise um, may have started on, or they may watch your lab work a little bit more closely. Um, and also, as we know, Nubeca is indicated for gentlemen with prostate cancer. It's not indicated for women or children. And so any, um, just in regards to an educational point, um, that it can cause harm to an unborn baby, baby and loss of pregnancy or miscarriage. Um, so please note for, for you gentlemen, using contraception throughout the course of the therapy is extremely important. And for one week after um after stopping the medication. So that's kind of our educational point around that. And you're gonna see that several times on the slides here. Since we already addressed that, I'm not gonna to touch back on that, but it's still really, really important. So let's talk about how Nubeca works. So, and oftentimes this is described as the mechanism of action. So if you're reading up on some literature um, about androgen receptor inhibitors and how they work, it's often defined under that, under that caption as mechanism of action. And so here, let me begin by showing you what testosterone does in men with non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer and how Nubeca works. And so in this first picture here, what you can see is that within every prostate cancer cells, there's all these special molecules called androgen receptors. And oftentimes we see them as ARs. So you, you may see that abbreviation, and that just stands for androgen receptor um, for short. And when testosterone attaches to that androgen receptor, one thing that it can do is it can cause the prostate cancer cells to grow. Um, and you can see that in the middle here. And so how Nubeca works is that it blocks the testosterone from being able to bind or attach to that androgen receptor. And that goes back to it being an androgen receptor inhibitor. And overall, this can help delay the cancer cells from growing. And that is one of our biggest things is that we want to prevent the cancer from growing. We want to stabilize that disease. Um, and so I think that I like how these pictures do kind of outline how Nubeca fully works for our patients. Um, and then again, another little important safety information. Um, this again talks about embryo fetal toxicity in regards to the use of contraception. And we already talked about that. So we're just going to continue to move forward um, with some more information. So let's talk about the clinical trial. Um, as I mentioned before, the clinical trial was completed in July of 2019, and this was from the Aramis trial. Um, and so the Aramis trial looked at Nubeca in the non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer setting. Um, this has um, actually one of the largest clinical trials of its kind. Um, we had 1,509 uh, patients, um, be enrolled on this trial. So thank you to all of you gentlemen, if you were listening, if you were involved on this clinical trial. And um, our gentlemen were randomized on a two to one basis. So 955 gentlemen with their non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer received hormone therapy plus Nubeca um, versus 544 gentlemen receiving hormone therapy alone. Um, and again, hormone therapy is um, classified as drug treatments or surgery that lowers testosterone levels. Um, and what we looked at in this clinical trial, the Aramis trial, is that it looked at the um, length of time living without the prostate cancer spreading to other parts of the body, which is also called metastasis-free survival. So that was our primary endpoint, if you guys are familiar with clinical trials. Now we also had a, um, our first secondary endpoint, if you will, was looking at overall survival. And this showed that the study also measured how long a person may live after starting the therapy. Which is what, um, which is also called overall survival. 
Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the new indication with the metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer setting, uh, the clinical trial that gained us that FDA approval just last month in August was called the Aresens trial. So again, I know it can be a little confusing because Aramis with non-metastatic and Aresens with the metastatic hormone-sensitive space, they do sound very familiar. But if you're interested in learning more about those clinical trials, um, that at least will give you that information to be able to look that up as well. Um, so before moving into some of the efficacy data or how well the, um, the clinical trial went, um, what we're going to talk about here is that along with being very um, open and honest and transparent with your providers about any sort of um, underlying history um, that you may have so that they can best treat you and pick appropriate options um, that may best work for you. We also want to talk to, um, have you talk to your healthcare providers about medications that you're on, um, because that's so important to make sure that something that they may be giving to you new to help to treat your prostate cancer may not interact with something that you're already currently taking. Um, that makes sense, right? And so this kind of goes back to making sure that um, you have a nice little list that you keep with you of updated um, medications, doses, um, how often you're taking those medications. Um, uh, with you with your in your pocket. So I had patients that would bring me a little piece of paper that worked out really well. Um, I had patients that would take pictures of um, medication bottles um, and bring that in with them in the clinic. Or um, let's see, I mean, you could also, um, along with this, I mean, there's all different things that you can do to be able to remember what medications that uh, you're taking. Um, but long and short of it, make sure that you include all prescription medications, non-prescription medications, vitamins, herbal supplements. I mean, I think whenever we think about medications, sometimes we only think about the prescriptions that we're taking, not the vitamins or the herbal supplements that, that can be just as important. Um, and also can have some drug to drug interactions with some of the oncology agents. So really important that we have a nice comprehensive list of everything. So however you wanna work that, make sure that, um, that you work with your providers and your team to get a good list and then keep one with you. It will definitely make things easier as you kind of go back in um, and people are asking about those. So let's look at um, the efficacy that Nubeca provided. And so in the clinical trial or the ARAMIS trial for non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, uh, Nubeca was proven to be effective. In fact, the study showed that Nubeca delayed the spread of prostate cancer to other parts of the body. So what you can see here in this graph is that hormone therapy plus Nubeca um, was 3.4 years versus hormone therapy alone at 1.5 years. And again, remember, this is for metastasis-free survival. So that is from the time that a patient was deemed non-metastatic um, on their imaging to the point whenever they uh, did show metastases or cancer that has spread on their imaging, it was approximately 3.4 additional, well, 3.4 years versus 1.5 years on hormone therapy alone. Um, so men lived more than twice as long without the cancer spreading compared to hormone therapy alone. So, um, and we're gonna talk about some of the other endpoints too, but I think this is a really important one uh, since this was our primary endpoint to start here. Um, and then moving forward into overall survival results. So Nubeca has shown to be shown to significantly extend overall survival, which is how long a person may live after starting therapy. There's a 31% lower risk of death. Um, so it extended overall survival by lowering the risk of death by 31% compared with hormone therapy alone. So um, anytime that we can see overall survival benefit with an oncology agent, um, that gets us excited as providers um, and medical staff. So, um, so I think this is a nice ed point to talk to you guys all about, along with metastasis-free survival, that we were able to achieve overall survival on our clinical trial, um, uh, on the Aramis trial. Now, this is a new piece of information that we added in um, Actually, with the with new indication comes new label updates, and this is uh, this is something that is new. So, for those of you that may be familiar with Nubeca, that may be familiar with this particular set of information, um, this may be something that may be um, new to your eyes. And so, um, with, so we we did add that one of the serious side effects includes heart disease, which is the blockage of the arteries in the heart. Um, it also encompasses ischemic heart disease, which can lead to death, and has uh, and it has happened in some patients 
during treatment with Nubeca. So please talk to your healthcare provider. Um, if you have any underlying cardiovascular history, um, any heart problems, and what they'll do is they'll just continue to monitor you for signs and symptoms of any heart problems during your treatment with Nubeca. Um, and also too, a lot of times this is, um, this is a team effort. So it's a multidisciplinary approach where you're working with maybe your urologist or medical oncologist, um, as well as your primary care doctor um, or your cardiologist to say whatever um, they may be monitoring, whether it be hypertension or high blood pressure, whether it be high cholesterol levels um, or high fats in your um, or high fat levels. Um, so it's just really, really important for them to continue to monitor that. Um, so call your healthcare provider or get medical help right away if you get chest pain or discomfort at rest or with activity or shortness of breath during your treatment with Nubeca. So let's talk about dosing. So this is some really practical and helpful information. If this is something that, um, that you may start taking um, or, um, or if you know somebody that would be a good candidate for it as well. So, so New Becca, this is given, it's an oral tablet. They come in 300 milligram tablets. Um, how you take in is two tablets in the morning with food and two tablets in the evening with food. So that is a total daily dose of 1200 milligrams. Um, and it's so important. I know that's one of the most common questions. Oh, do I have to take it with food, without food? Does it matter? And yes, with New Becca, it does matter. So please, it's two to two and a half times better absorbed when taken with food. Um, and again, it says that the pill is not the actual size. So again, remember it is smaller than the size of the dime. Um, so I know it kind of looks a little bit like a, a quote unquote horse pill in this picture. Um, and please take the new bucket exactly as your doctor tells you. Um, and so by going uh, along with what dose they prescribe you with as well is really important. So please swallow the tablets whole. We're not going to be crushing the tablets. And also if you miss a dose of Nubeca, that's only natural sometimes whenever we're taking an oral agent. So take your normal dose as soon as possible prior to the next scheduled dose. I just caution you to please don't double up on your daily dose either. So um, you do not want to take two of those doses together to make up for a missed dose. So when in doubt, call the office. And I mean, it's not the end of the world. Say you missed your morning dose um, and it's too close to the evening dose to take that morning dose. Just take your evening dose and restart on your normal schedule the next day. And again, when in doubt, call the office and they'll be able to direct you appropriately. Um, and then moving down to another piece of important safety information that was actually just added again um, with a new indication to the label, so maybe new to a lot of you, is that of seizure. So treatment with Nubeca may increase your risk of having a seizure. So you should avoid activities where a sudden loss of consciousness could cause serious harm to yourself or others. So please tell your healthcare providers right away if you have loss of consciousness or a seizure. So um, this is something new that was added to the label with the new indication and very important for us to talk about. So um, here are a few more things that we want to learn. We want to have you learn about Nubeca as well. And so um, here we, we would like you to follow your doctor's instructions while taking Nubeca. Um, sometimes your, your healthcare provider may have you change your dose if needed, temporarily stop your dose or completely stop your dose um, with of Nubeca if you have certain side effects. And so that's not uncommon. Say there's something new that happens, you call in and they may say, okay, hold, hold the medication. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna treat those side effects. And that's not uncommon if, if something new should, should crop up, if you will. So you should continue your hormone therapy. So whatever um, androgen deprivation therapy agent that you're on, we're gonna continue on those agents while you're on Nubeca, um, unless you've had surgery to lower the amount of testosterone in your body. And that's with um, that bilateral orchiectomy um, or removal of the testicles. So if you take more Nubeca than prescribed, you also wanna call your healthcare provider right away. And we're gonna talk about some um, kind of discontinuation rates and how many people needed to temporarily stop and restart their medication or completely stop their medication while they were on the clinical trial as well. Um, and also too, there's a nice little tip reminder here. Um, I know it's sometimes hard to remember when to take a medication and everybody has their own little tr tricks to the trade, if you will. And so you guys may be sharing some of this amongst each other as well. Like, oh, I, I do this or I do this. Um, so one thing is, is we all have our trusty phones with us now. Um, and there's great alarm settings on them that you can set little alarms for when your medications do. Um, we also have a, um, a nice patient starter kit um, that has little 
um, reminder caps for the tops of the medications that say what, what dose you took, whether AM or PM dose. So that can be helpful. Some people will put it on the calendar or put it on the fridge, what dose that they took. Um, so anything that um, is helpful in remind, reminding you um, that you need to take your dose or you already took a dose, um, by all means, I mean, spread the word and, and help each other out with things that may be helpful. I mean, there's a lot of oral medications in the space now. So I know this is something that um, um, may be common practice amongst uh, a lot of a lot of people. So the next piece of important safety information, we're actually going to talk about um, moving forward in regards to safety. So I'm not skipping this, but we're going to touch back on this information again um, here on the next slide. So let's talk about some potential side effects that may happen. So um, with Nubeca. So on the clinical trial of the ARAMIS trial for non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, the most frequently seen side effects on the treatment arm, which is those patients that receive Nubeca plus ADT, um, included feeling more tired than usual. So that's that term that you guys hear, fatigue. Um, and this is this encompasses all grades. So um, you'll see breakdowns whenever you're looking at safety data on clinical trials between all grades that encompasses um, more mild symptoms uh, as well as severe symptoms. And then you'll see some grades three and four data. And that typically encompasses those more severe reactions. So we're going to focus on all grades here today. Um, so you can see that 16% of patients had some fatigue um, on the treatment arm versus hormone therapy alone at 11%. Then we're looking in pain in the arm, leg, hand, and foot. That was 6% versus 3%. Rash, 4% versus 1.4%. Um, and then these bottom two are some lab abnormalities. So what we're looking at here is decreased white blood cell count, which is also called neutropenia at 20% versus 9% and changes in liver function tests at 16% versus 7%. So I want to touch back on uh, kind of two things here. So first is the fatigue. Now, as you guys all know, with hormone therapy, fatigue is something that we talk about a lot. That is a common side effect. And so I just really want to, um, I, get, I think this is the nursing side of me coming out, um, but just please have an exercise regimen in place. Make sure that you're doing something on a, day, uh, on a daily basis to help kind of push through that fatigue. Unfortunately, there's not a magic pill to help to, to cure the fatigue associated with the hormone therapy, but exercise can be very, very helpful. So if you walk once a week, maybe try to increase that to two or three times as long as you're able to. Um, so just kind of slowly increasing that exercise can be helpful to combat that. Um, and also on the other side of it, if you're having trouble kind of implementing a regimen on your own, which can be, can be a struggle for some, um, and you need some accountability or you need help with some exercise regimens, uh, physical therapy is an awesome option. We love our, con our uh, colleagues and coworkers in our physical therapy departments. Um, and so utilizing them or asking for a physical therapy prescription may be really helpful for you to get you into routine, to learn some exercises, to help work through some of the fatigue that you may be experiencing. And then kind of, um, circling back down here to these decreased white blood cell count and changes in liver function tests. Now these are lab abnormalities. And on our clinical trial, on the Aramis trial, these lab ab abnormalities were captured within the first three months for six to 12 weeks on uh, the clinical trial. So as long as, I mean, you're, every provider in every office is a little different with how often they take lab work, but I think it's really important to, um, to make sure, I mean, oftentimes with the start of a new medication, they may ask you to get labs a little bit more frequently. Um, and it, I think it's just important to note that within those first three months, that if a lab abnormality should occur, it would be present during that. And when you're watched a little bit more closely um, at our practice, we used to do every four weeks. And then at three months, if you're doing well from a sim symptom standpoint, as well from um, your lab values, we would say we let you fly. And then you could come back on a regular basis, whether it's every three months, every four months, every six months. Um, so whatever your normal regimen is. And every office is gonna be a little different, um, but just nice to know that uh, there are protocols in place. It's a little different from office to office, but within the first three months, any of those lab abnormalities on Nubeca would be captured as well. So, and then just highlighted at the bottom, I mean, discuss side effects with your treatment team. Again, please talk to them about anything you're experiencing. Um, if you have a loved one that's coming into the office with you too, I mean, um, I think it's really important to speak up uh, for the caregivers out there. 
speak up, talk to the providers about what you may be experiencing as well. Sometimes the sometimes our gentleman going through it may not under may not notice a symptom, and you may be prompted to be like, "Hey, yeah, that is going on." So share it with the team. So moving forward into some of the more serious side effects that happen on Nubeca, um, they were moderately higher than those on hormone therapy alone. So serious side effects happened in 25% of men who added Nubeca to hormone therapy versus 20% of men who took hormone therapy alone. So um, to kind of dive deep, a little deeper into that, that happened in 1% or more of men who added Nubeca to their hormone therapy. Um, and what, what were some of these things that included your... Um, uh, not being able to urinate completely, pneumonia and blood in the urine. And so, and then at the bottom here, this important safety information, we already talked about embryophytotoxicity toxicity um, and the fertility issues. So that's, um, that's again, repeating that important information that we already talked about. So the next, um, the next little topic that we're going to talk about is uh, looking at discontinuation rates. And this is all based off of the clinical trial data. And I think this is really important to point out that there was no increase in permanent discontinuation due to adverse reaction when Nubeca was added to ADT. So as you can see right here in front of you that you see 9% and 9%. So it's identical. Nubeca plus AD had a 9% permanent discontinuation rate as well as ADT alone at a 9% permanent discontinuation rate. And for patients that had to permanently go off of the medication on the clinical trial, um, what happened? Uh, it, these particular reasons include a cardiac failure at 0.4% and death at 0.4%. And now moving into dose interruptions and dose reductions, and you may be like, what does that mean? So when we're talking about dose interruptions, men who had to stop taking Nubeca and then started again because of other side effects. So that was 13% of patients. And some of the most common reasons or side effects that caused men to stop taking Nubeca and then restart it again included high blood pressure, often caused a called hypertension at 0.6%, diarrhea at 0.5%, and pneumonia at 0.5%. And then we had dose reductions. So men taking Nubeca who had to reduce their dose because of side effects. And that included 6% of patients on the clinical trial. The most common side effects that caused men to reduce their dose included fatigue at 0.7%, high blood pressure or hypertension again at 0.3%, and nausea at 0.3%. So I think these are kind of nice numbers to be able to look at and see how many patients it did affect that they needed to stop and restart or dose reduce because of intolerable side effects. But, um, but moving forward here too, um, this is an extremely important topic talking about support services, um, for men taking new Becca. So we have, and you can see down here, it's actually scattered all over access services by Bayer. That is the name of our support services here at Bayer, um, for new Becca. And so we're here to help with assistance um, in understanding the insurance benefits, um, access to nursing, uh, assistance with insurance coverage barriers, and also connecting with financial assistance to help pay for new Becca. Um, and so talk to your providers. Say they're oftentimes aware of a lot of these different support services offer, offered by access services by Bayer, whether it's a $0 copay uh, program for commercially insured patients or foundation support for underinsured or uninsured patients. Um, or whether or not it's looking for grant funding for patients that may have large copays. Um, I mean, so there's all different things that they're, they can help with, and that's not limited to it. Um, I should also mention that there are free trial programs to get you started on it. This is a specialty medication and it has to go through a specialty pharmacy. And so oftentimes with that, prior authorizations are definitely needed. And sometimes it's really nice. I know it's you want to get started on a medication whenever you know, um, say, hey, my PSA is going up despite having those low levels of testosterone. I need to do more. Um, and they can get you started on the medication very quickly by some of these free trial programs or a free sample program uh, for one month on both ends. And so um, please talk to your providers, talk to your team because they're well versed um, with a lot of these options that are available for you just to really help to offset some of that um, uh, kind of the financial side of things. So, um, and 
I, I like this little important tip because I am such a, um, I, I definitely do this myself. So whenever a number that you don't know appears on my phone, I, I tend to think it's spam. Um, but I will say this is one of the hurdles in regards to getting a medication um, is that access services by Bayer will be calling to be able to help set up delivery of the medication if they start you on a free trial program or, or you go through these services. So it's really nice if you're able to kind of plug in the number under your phone and maybe label it access services by Bayer. So whenever they do call that you're like, oh, it's not spam and you're able to answer it and get your medication a lot quicker too. So just a ni really nice, helpful tip of um, something that we, that we see actively going on that, um, that may prevent some issues moving forward. Um, so the next topic is extremely important here that we're going to discuss, and it's looking at, um, at our caregivers, our loved ones that are supporting um, all of you going through your prostate cancer journey. And I know we may have a lot of uh, caregivers listening to this as well. Um, and um, it is so important um, that we support our caregivers too. So we want to support our, our gentlemen going through their prostate cancer journey, and we want to support our caregivers. I oftentimes say, if we're not taking care of ourselves, we can't take care of somebody else. Um, and that just reigns true with this as well. So, um, it may be really difficult at times to be able to focus on yourself when you're giving so much to, to somebody else. And so just taking those moments to making sure that you're eating healthy and exercising, um, doing things you enjoy, that can be something that, um, that you may just, and you may be like, oh, I haven't had lunch with my friends in a while, or um, I really enjoy going for a walk. It's a great stress reliever, anxiety reducer, just really kind of going back to doing some of those things that you really love. Um, asking for help. Uh, this may seem so simple, but it is something that is extremely hard for a lot of us to do. Um, asking for help from family members and friends and caring for your loved ones. And um, one of the big things that a lot, and I mean, this is just why you guys are all here today for PCRI is seeking out help from a support group. Um, support groups are invaluable. I think they're so incredibly important. There's support group for patients, there's support groups for caregivers. Um, and I can't underestimate the importance of our mental health, mental health professionals as well. Um, I will say sometimes that there's negative connotations associated with our mental health professionals and seeking help in that manner. And uh, that is not true. It, they can be an invaluable resource for all of us as well. An unbiased view of what may be going on to be able to help too with anxiety and stress and talking through things. Um, I mean, we know that this is not only a physical journey for our prostate cancer survivors moving forward through their journey, um, as well as an emotional journey. It is a roller coaster ride. So please utilize the resources that are necessary. Um, and it's also a roller coaster ride for our caregivers as well. So um, just some just some nice little helpful hints. Um, at the bottom here, you can see that it says cancer care provides resources such as booklets, which is caregiving for a loved one with prostate cancer, as well as other information and support. So this is just one of the many websites that are available out there to help. Uh, PCRI has so many resources available to you guys as well. And they're one that is actually listed on this website too, along with many others. And so, um, so please, if you need um, any sort of help in that regard, um, just by uh, looking up some information, you'll know that you're not alone. There's so many other people that are going through this journey as well, and they're there to support and to help. Um, so that's, that cannot be um, overstated. And then now um, kind of moving into what should you discuss with your doctor as well. Um, this can be really difficult because oftentimes you have so many questions, whether it's at the beginning with your diagnosis, what your standard of care therapy options may be, whether surgery or radiation, or maybe you're diagnosed in a state where it's metastatic um, at your diagnosis and what treatment options you're going to be going through at that point. So many questions come up along this journey, um, as well as starting on new therapies such as new Becca. So this, for example, just right here in front of you, is just a few examples of questions that you can ask your doctor and start some conversations that may be really important. And I'm not going to read off uh, these verbatim to you, but I think it's really nice to help to get kind of the wheels going, if you will for some important questions that you could be asking your doctor if this therapy could be appropriate for you. Um, I also like to say, I mean, um, having something that when you think of a question, write it down. Um, if you have a little notebook or you can write it in your phone, there's a lot of different options available out there that can help you utilize um, 
just something as simple as a pen and a piece of paper to write those questions. And then when you go into the office or into the clinic or the hospital where you're seeing your, your, your healthcare providers, um, sometimes it can be a bit of a whirlwind. And so, um, and when they come in and they're saying, do you have any questions before, um, before they leave, you could be like, oh no. And then when they leave, like, oh, I really wanted to answer all of these questions. If you have them written down, you can at least pull out your notebook and say, yes, I do. And give that to them because oftentimes in in the thick of things you forget. Um, and that's only natural, we all do that. So just some helpful hints to write those questions down, write the symptoms down you may be experiencing, bring it in and have that nice robust conversation with your healthcare providing uh, providers and the team to make sure that you're treated um, treated appropriately in regards to, to, to symptom management and treatments moving forward. So just some helpful hints. Um, we do have a really great patient facing website um, for new Becca. So a lot of this information that we're talking about today, you don't have to remember at all. You're not getting quizzed on it. So um, I will say it's on new Becca dash us.com. Um, and there is a nice patient brochure. If you want a paper copy of the information as well, that's on there too, um, as well as some patient testimonials some videos, there's all different things um, that you can find. So uh, lots of resources available to you all. Um, so that's it. And those questions are also in the patient brochure. So with that, um, I also just want to say that uh, please remember that we're all here um, in your corner to support you along your prostate cancer journey. And I just really want to uh, say a big thank you to you all for joining us today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the PCRI conference. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Kelly. Before we start our Q&A, I would like to once again thank our sponsors, Bear Pharmaceuticals, Pfizer, Estellas, Janssen, Abvi, Advanced Accelerator Applications, Blue Earth, Dendrion, MyEvent, and Tolmar. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay up to date on the latest videos just like this. Next up, we have our conference Q&A with Dr. Moyad and Dr. Scholz. Dr. Moyad has done an incredible job moderating this conference. We're so incredibly grateful to him, for not only for his moderating, but his research and the clarity that he brings to all of us. I am so excited to have him and Dr. Scholz together once again. As you may know, Dr. Scholz is our founder and executive director here at PCRI. He is a full-time medical oncologist who has specialized in the treatment of prostate cancer for over 25 years. Our team would like to say a big thank you to him. So without further ado, we welcome Dr. Scholz and Dr. Moyad. Here we are, Mark Moyad from Michigan, the great Mark Scholz, the other Mark all the way out in California, going through a heat wave. Here I'm at about 65, 70, brilliant colors, not dealing with these issues. But it's time to cover the last part of the program. I have a surprise for you, my friend. We've been doing this for 12, 13 years. Do you like my shirt? Yeah, I was, I was kind of wondering about that. Where's the tie? So I've been working behind the scenes aggressively with PCRI. And we decided that today was the day I'm gonna look like Mark Scholes. So oh. I'm taking this off. They sent me a Mark Scholes tie. You know what a Mark Scholes tie is, right? It's where you turn off the lights and it's so blinding, you can't sleep. You basically glow in the dark like a glow worm. So here it is. This is in deference to our one of our fearless leaders, my partner in non-crime, Dr. Mark Scholes, how does that make you feel? Expand. What, not you, I'm only seeing the top third of your tie, uh, Dr. Moy. Let me see the whole thing. Can you pick it up there? All Look, right. Right? Just I, This is a classic Mark Scholes tie. It doesn't whisper. It yeah. screams at you. It, yeah, it screams what, at you, know, you and I, scares you. But, when you told me it was a Mark Scholes tie, I was looking at this because last time, you know, you stole a jacket out of my closet for the, uh, <laughs> you know, for the intro which I had to wear throughout the whole thing. It was, you know, red as a fire truck. And the this, so I assumed that this was actually one of my ties, but I'm mm. disappointed to see that it's not. And it is a good looking tie. Since you're never going to wear it again, do you want to stick it in the mail after this is over? And I'll, no, no, um, I, I will wear it again at our next Q&A in March when we are, we are together in person. I am going to personally bring this out to California, that and some water, because you people always seem to need water out there. <laughs> and in the Great Lakes, we have plenty of it. 
but I'm going to mm -hmm. bring this out. And yeah, this is in complete deference to you. It's, I just can't look down at it. It's sort of, it sort of makes me, I can't, <laughs> it's blinding in a way in terms of just, I, oh, it's tough. Well, I know, uh, yeah. I know it's shocking. So I tried to wear a conservative one today. So this is one of my tame, quiet ties. This is, uh, I thought I didn't want to frighten the audience. You know, the, Dr. Schultz has such dreadful judgment. He wears crazy ties. So this is a, a low key tie today. And uh, I hope it makes everyone comfortable. Isn't that incredible? Because you um, you went conservative on me on the ties and I went sort of radical like you always are. But then again, you went with the castaway look, the Tom Hanks movie with the beard. So, I, I you know, you know, we're fitting in there quite well. I got one thing to say before we get started. I have a cup of green tea with me. Right. And I thought green tea is perfect for our Q&A today, because when I think of Mark Moyad and Mark Scholes, I think of green tea. Do you know why? This is an educational moment. Green tea has two uh, competing compounds that are in perfect balance. One is caffeine, 1,3,7-trimethylxanthine, one of my favorite compounds in yours. But the other one is L-theanine, which is a calming agent. So nature beautifully put together a calming compound, amino acid, with caffeine. So you get a little bit of a heart rate increase, but at the same time, you stay calm during the entire process. So you and me, my friend, are the green tea of prostate cancer. I'm the calm. Right. <laughs> well, uh, with that, I, you, you promised our audience that we would be talking a little bit about uh, some of the alternative stuff today. And I have a few questions I want to put to you. But uh, before we do that, we've got some pure gold to review. Uh, okay. I have, um, uh, should we jump right in and start talking about Dr. Klotz? Our, yeah, our yeah. amazing, uh, hopefully future Nobel Prize winner for the uh, changing the whole, uh, the whole world on active surveillance. Uh, one thing he mentioned in his talk was that uh, we're now up to 60% uh, of men who are eligible for active surveillance in the United States are actually getting active surveillance. And he's happy about that because when he started on this journey, less than 1% of men were on active surveillance. And that's a gigantic change. So if you take two, oh, there's probably about 110,000 men eligible for active sur surveillance in the United States every year. So maybe that is about 65,000 are actually getting active surveillance. So Dr. Klotz almost single-handedly has saved 65,000 men a year uh, from uh, unnecessary radical treatment. So. It's quite an honor for us to be able to talk about and review the, this amazing man's accomplishments. And uh, it's a, uh, uh, incredible stuff. So, uh, so that's just a background to his overall brilliance on active surveillance. He covered so many subjects. I don't know if there's anything that sticks out in your mind right away that you want to talk about. I've got a few thoughts, but what do you think, Dr. Well, what sticks Moyer? out in my mind is just the incredible questions the moderator threw out at him during the entire session. <laughs> But if you notice, and I want you to think about this for a second, uh, if you notice, and of course, kind of joking, but I did say to him, and I, you may want to comment, I did say, is it possible the system that you were in helped you or encouraged you to want to pursue active surveillance? I thought that was an interesting question. And he said, yeah, you know, because in the Canadian system, it's a very much a preventive medicine game, right? And even our government will agree, the General Accounting Office, I used to read these reports when I was much younger, that the one thing that Canada does is they put a lot of emphasis on prevention, a lot of people, a lot on preventive services. And he, he thought about it and said, yeah, you know, we're really encouraged here um, to basically think that way. So I just, I don't know if you had any comment. I just thought that was really interesting. Oh, no, no. I, 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 we could talk the whole time about Dr. Klotz, but Particularly to that point, uh, so he said he thinks in Canada that 90% of men that are eligible for active surveillance are indeed being pursued with active surveillance, whereas wow. it's only 60% six, in the United States. Um, and you asked him about that. And one of the, uh, you know, why would it be more successful up in Canada? And he talked about how they just have a smaller, it's a smaller country, smaller community. So as big as he is, even in the United States and throughout the world, imagine what a giant he is in Canada. So yeah. it's sort of like when Dr. Klotz speaks, everyone listens in Canada. And so I think it's just his personal influence over the over the medical community. He said, I think there's like a thousand urologists in Canada where we yeah. know in the United States, we have about 15 to 18,000 urologists spread over much larger area, many more uh, variable demographics. So 
Uh, so that, um, I think it has to do with, his, didn't he get some sort of uh, honor from his government? I think you, you yeah. called it out in the- yeah, uh, one of the what, highest honors. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. It's so. medical work. So so it's just, I think it's just his amazing influence in that country. And of course, he's influenced the United States too, but uh, we're a much bigger uh, uh, you know, piece of the pie down here. And it was interesting what he said. I asked him, well, I'm, I said, I always like to play devil's advocate too in these questions. I don't want everyone to get away and thinking he's got the perfect system. I said, you have these long lines. So it was interesting what he said. He said, in oncology, we actually don't have the kind of lines they have in other places that people get treatment mm -hmm. fairly quickly. So I thought that was interesting. And I just wanted to bring that up before we started talking about, about things, but- um, About the medical stuff. So let's, let's jump right into that because there was a couple of things which I'm going to- uh, I don't want to say dispute with him because I'll lose every dispute with Dr. Klotz, but I'll, but I'll comment on uh, one, of course, is uh, something that, uh, you know, he came up and gave me some ammunition from my point of view that, you know, the random transrectal needle biopsy is, should be the thing of the past. We're talking about the 12 core around the clock um, attempt to make sure that no one misses cancer. This was developed in the late 1980s and uh, changed the whole landscape of care um, and uh, we started diagnosing early stage cancers for the first time on a regular basis. Uh, but he, he quoted some fascinating statistics. He said that the chance of dying from a random biopsy is certainly, I said dying, I'm not talking about bad infection, yeah. uh, is certainly less than one in a thousand, but probably more than one in 10,000. So say, wait a minute, we're taking perfectly healthy people and rarely killing them with random biopsies. Uh, yeah, and so, it's true. I never so, thought of that. So his, yeah, so he uh, went on and said uh, that he's using his influence in Canada to try and push for transperineal biopsies. And I'm not totally sure everyone understands what a transperineal biopsy is. Instead of going through the rectum, they go through the skin between the scrotum and the anus. It's a longer shot. The needle has to go further to hit the prostate. But it, since it doesn't go through the rectum, the risk of infection is much lower. Uh, so that, I think, is one potential solution. I think there's a couple other things to consider to get away from random biopsies. One is that high-quality MRIs uh, are good. Um, he is not quite ready to completely do a transfer over because he mentioned that, that small spots can be missed on MRIs. My come back to that argument is that small spots are unlikely to spread and you can get an MRI every year. And if it grows bigger, you can catch it before it spreads. Mm. Uh, the other thing, there is data out now showing that if you just do two or three targeted biopsies through the rectum, that the uh, incidence of infections is as low or maybe even lower than perineal biopsies. So, um, so it's the it's the repeated stabbing over and over. It's like, hey, we're just going to make sure that someone gets an infection someday. We'll just keep stabbing until it occurs. And uh, that is a problem. And uh, so there are different solutions, MRIs, fewer numbers of biopsies, transperineal biopsies, as he talked about, but that takes a while for the doctors to learn how to do that. And uh, and it can be more uncomfortable. It takes uh, it takes skill. Some people are putting people to sleep for it. You raised that issue, Mark, and I appreciate that because maybe you can talk about the fact that as you give people in, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s anesthesia, um, some of us are going to have lingering memory problems afterwards. So I mean, I'm going to try to be careful because you know that I you know that I'm a rah rah for the surgeons and I'm a rah rah for the radiation oncologists. And I know one of the biggest disappointments as a brother from another mother is that I support surgery. And I'm, I'm sorry that we will go to our graves together having, because I can't agree. No, with no, no, I agreed with everything you said, my name would be Mark Schultz. So my point <laughs> is your attention to detail is incredible because I, I'm not going to be too nice here too. It's like my brother. I adored my brother, but if I gave him too much kudos, then I would, I felt like he would beat me up sometimes. So <laughs> What I'm saying to you is not only do you have the attention to the detail, you have a very full clinic, a very full life, you know, and so I'm really glad you noticed that because that passes by many people. What I like to tell people what I've learned in the area of health is that the human body doesn't like to be messed with unless it has to be messed with. Meaning you better be sure you need anesthesia. You better be sure it's okay for be, you to be cut into because when you have certain surgeries, for example, pediatrics, you develop things called adhesions and those can become a problem. I won't give this whole speech, you know, and then subjecting the human body to over and over again, anesthesia has cognitive potential issues. Now, so we're talking about some things are elective, some things are necessary, but it's, so can you answer that for me? Because his answer was a little surprising. One of the drawbacks 
of parent eels is that a lot of people have to put you under general still. But he says that's changing and it's shifting. So what's the what's the truth on that right now in the U.S.? Well, I I my sense is that the this uh, talk about transperineal biopsies uh, is uh, for a select subgroup of people, uh, people that are at higher risk for infection. Um, the people that have been pursuing it in the United States that I know are those that um, have done an immense amount of research and are are frightened by the possibility of sepsis with a transrectal biopsy. Uh, I try and reassure them that if they can talk their physician into just doing a targeted biopsy instead of jabbing needles randomly all through the organ, which uh, good studies show now doesn't really add any new information, uh, that you'll be fine. The problem, uh, of course, is with transperineal or with a regular transrectal targeted biopsy is your doctor, has your doctor done enough of this and is he skillful enough so that after he's, the biopsy comes back and says, oh, it's not cancer. Did he miss the spot or did yeah. he have the needle in the spot and it's not cancer? So you, you uh, for people who are doing targeted biopsies alone, you certainly have to have a highly skilled doctor that can hit the target and uh, say, well, my gosh, can't everybody do that? No, I think this is one reason that they still like to do random biopsies is kind of CYA, cover your ass, make sure that if I don't hit the target, at least I'll get some other information. How many, this is, I, I, I know some people hate these questions, but I think that they're good because it puts in perspective. If you're going to go see someone that's doing perineals biopsies and they're just converting over, I told them, I don't know if you heard, I said, I don't want to be patient zero when you're starting to do <laughs> perineals. And I, I don't know if he caught that or not. Nobody wants to be the first one, but no one wants yeah. to be the test subject. How many, how many biopsies should someone be doing a year to feel comfortable that they're really learning? Are we talking 10 a month, 100 a year? I, what do you even say to that question? Well, you, first, it takes special equipment to do this, and, uh, and it takes special equipment to do targeted biopsies. Um, the, the fusion biopsy technology that we have uh, is good, and it, uh, it can make an average biopsy are better. So the equipment is, uh, you know, the, where they can visualize the, the, uh, the radiologist goes in and finds the target, and then they draw it on the ultrasound for the urologist who's doing the biopsy, whether he does it transrectal or transperineal. So if this is a doctor that's been doing biopsies for a while, and uh, now he's getting uploaded to this new technology, I would say just 5, 10 practice cases, um, they should be competent. And I think they don't need to do, you know, 10 a week to be competent. I think you could do one or two a week and be competent. But it's a, um, so I don't think it's so much that the doctors uh, don't have the ability to do it. I think the problem is, is that there's just an unwillingness to trust their skills. And they still, which I, I keep coming back to this, we don't want to be doing 12 core biopsies. This is the statistics that Dr. Klotz quoted. I never had any statistics. What's real mortality rates from 12 core biopsies? We know that 2% of men, one out of 50 gets sepsis. Um, so you and I know you can't have cases of sepsis happening over and over and over again without someone dying now and then. It, it's inevitable. So he, he recognizes that. And, uh, and their solution is to do transperineal biopsies. I think it's one of three options. The other two options being trust the MRIs, go to a good MRI center, or limit the number of biopsies transrectally and do targeted biopsies. He didn't bite completely on the sandwich I threw at him at that moment. I said, so you can answer this. I said, well, what about really big guys? Because everybody's getting bigger, big, which means big prostate, big guys. And you know, what about getting to the anterior or other parts of the prostate? And we were running out of time, but what say you about the ability of perineals to get to those other areas and to handle really big prostates? For some reason, people talk about bigger prostates being uh, more troublesome. And that what they say is that you have to stick the needle through more prostate tissue to get to your target. And, and you're worrying that the needle may track off and miss the target. Well, you have an even longer target when you go transperineally. So I don't, um, I honestly don't have any trouble with anterior um, uh, biopsies in big prostates when you go through the rectum. And I think the people doing the transperineals, I don't do transperineals. Uh, I think they are, uh, they figure out how to deal with it. So I don't think that the, the overweight patients 
present a bigger uh, problem. I think it's just an issue of, uh, you know, do you have a doctor that has the ability to hit the spot with the needle? And if these people are doing, uh, have good equipment and they're doing it regularly, they should be able to do a good job. Can I leave Klotz for a second and stay in this subject and then come back to him? Do you mind? Because part of the reason we do this Q&A a little bit off the cuff is that it stimulates thought and it stimulates some things in our, in our relationship when we're talking off camera that I think about. And so I just want you to comment on it because a lot of people might not know. There have been a couple of friends of ours <clears throat> that you sent for a special type of biopsy. And I learned, I did learn this through you. I mean, I know that most of your knowledge you've learned through me, but once in a while I've learned some stuff through you and you use the word in bore biopsy. And mm -hmm. I said, what in the H-E double toothpicks is that? Because nobody could find, everybody was doing, let me set up this situation. We had a friend, everybody was, was biopsying this poor guy. They were biopsying so, so much, it was basically the equivalent of a radical prostatectomy. I mean, it was really ridiculous. And then finally, we, I remember when you were talking, you said, well, I'm sending them to so-and-so down the street. I think it was UCLA, just to give them little props, even though they don't have a very good football team. So I, I said, what are you going to do there? He said, he said, they do an in-bore biopsy and they found it. They found this tumor that was causing the rising PSA. So can you give us a little bit of knowledge on in-bore and what's that all about? All right. So we've been talking about ultrasound directed biopsies, which is convenient. It's in the office. Uh, the uh, uh, issue though, is if you're missing a lesion, is it, is there, uh, they're doing co-registration between the MRI images and the ultrasound images and then they use that co-registration to direct a needle toward the spot. Well, they're, look, they're directing toward a spot that's been visualized in an MRI. So a simple question is, well, why don't we just target the spot when they're in the MRI? And mm. when they say in bore, they mean that you're in, inside the MRI. That's what in bore means. Mm. So they can actually see the needle while the patient's in the MRI going in to the, uh, the, the worrisome spot or the shadow or a lesion that we're talking about. So it's, I don't know of any good comparative trials, but logically you can see why that if you've got a tricky or a very tiny lesion, uh, that uh, having the uh, lesion targeted while you're in the MRI might be the best way to go. It's the reason yeah. we don't do it routinely is it's a much more arduous process. It takes, you know, a couple hours uh, to set everything up. And, and uh, so we don't do it if, if people have easy, uh, easy to attack pro, uh, spots, but if they have something small that's in a difficult location, an in more biopsy might work for them. But you know that's important for your audience, our audience. It's uh, it's there's a small percentage of men who are getting biopsies. PSA just keeps going up and up and up. They know the cancer somewhere, they can't find it, and this becomes this becomes one of those options when someone's frustrated with what mm -hmm. we just described, correct? The, the other thing that's gonna come up is we spent so much time talking about uh, PSMA PET scans throughout uh, this, uh, this whole conference and the, you know, the treatment using the same technology called lutetium or plevicto. Uh, but in terms of trying to find a spot of cancer in someone with a high PSA that doesn't seem to be registering anywhere, PSMA PET scans, uh, and it was mentioned briefly by one of your speakers that you can do an MRI and a PSMA at the same time. PSMA is a great way to cross check and see, are we missing something that's, uh, that's not being picked up in the MRI? And, and it is uh, probably almost as good as MRI, but it uses totally different technology. So things that aren't showing up on an MRI would be more likely to be seen on a PSMA PET scan. So uh, problems can sometimes be insurance coverage, of course. Um, gotcha. but, uh, other than that, the, uh, PSMA PET scan, I think we're going to see, uh, being repurposed for uh, a lot of things besides what we've talked about mostly in this conference, which is about staging people for, um, you know, with advanced disease, are they responding to therapy? Will, will Plavicto be an appropriate treatment? Uh, other things, uh, checking for someone with a high PSA, that's one. And then uh, I'm not sure we've really covered PSMA PET scans for men with a newly diagnosed intermediate risk or high risk disease. So maybe we'll swing back and cover that. before. We'll, we we'll definitely swing back. <clears throat> so I'll take you back to, let's go back to Klotz for a second. Um, uh, he got my one question, right. was one of the last time the Toronto Maple Leafs won the Stanley cup. It was a long time ago. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, then we started just kind of covering some basics on active surveillance that people should know. The first thing I, I mentioned to him, which is so important for your audience, I keep saying your audience, but our audience, but is that 
I asked him straight out. I said, you have the data. You have one of the largest series. What's the number one cause of death in people in your cohort of active surveillance patients? What, if, what, what disease? And he said, cardiovascular disease. And I just thought that was a good moment. So we could just put some things in perspective in the active surveillance group, because I think that should get so much attention, so much more attention if you're put on active surveillance that you might want to go back to your primary care or sign up with a cardiologist and make sure all the pipes are clean. Well, thank you for uh, setting that up for me because one thing I wanted to make sure that we talked about and something that I've sometimes sensed sort of a lukewarm response from you, Dr. Moyet, um, it's routine for me to get CT scans for coronary calcium scores in all my men that are over age 50. Uh, and uh, I don't know why... I have to swing in mean, this, like everyone knows that, right, Dr. Moyen? Isn't that like, shouldn't every man over age 50 have a CT scan for coronary calcium score? Well, I mean, the coronary calcium is, is <clears throat> the indications really for intermediate. Uh, so, so people don't know if you're high risk, they don't know if you're low risk and it just wants to add more value. And then it picks up the amount of calcium basically in the arteries that you know help feed the heart. So it's turned out to be an incredibly valuable tool for the people that need more information about how they're doing cardiovascular wise. The catch, which I always like to remind people is sometimes it can pick up some calcium, some other places or some spots and other places like the lungs, and then they got to go pursue that. But to answer your question, it's definitely in the past few years gone from something very interesting to now much more mainstream with potentially less radiation and lower cost. The other thing that's starting to compete with it, which is really interesting. So you have two types of CT. You have the CT calcium score, which you're a big fan of, and I, I've known you a long time and you have been, and I couldn't agree with you more that they are not utilized enough. And then now in people that they're really having trouble with who are potentially very high risk of cardiovascular disease, some of the doctors are approving a CT angiogram. So, oh, yeah. right? And yeah. So what happens with the CT coronary calcium score is you can see inter, you can see, so let me just look at this. This is pathetic. My life is so pathetic. I have all these little things on the desk here. So if your blood vessel is a straw and it's basically equivalent to the same size, so that means you really got to take care of your arteries because they're not that big. So some of these coronary arteries are small. And so it picks up calcium, for example, for sure on the outside, on the wall, what, what the little buggers do with cardiovascular disease is that plaque also builds up internally and starts to call what's intraluminally. It's on the inside of the straw. And sometimes the, and off, a lot of times the calcium score can't pick that up, but the CT angiogram can. And I just had a doctor friend of mine get it. He was done in about 10, 15 minutes. It showed beautifully all of his vessels and how much plaque was inside the vessels. And he called me last week and he's a, he's a urologist in Arizona, one of my good friends. And he said, why don't more people know about this? And I said, I don't know. I don't know why more people don't know about the calcium score and CT angiogram, but let me play devil's Dr. advocate. Moyet. Let Dr. me play Moyet. devil's Dr. advocate. No, no, Dr. You. Moyet, have you had a CT angiogram? I have had a calcium score, not an angiogram. I'm not ready. I'm not ready yet. For them to now, what the is this preaching, preaching CT angiograms? I mean, I, we would prefer that you didn't die of a heart attack too. I know there's some people that feel differently, but I think that it it's uh, it's reasonable. To, now, the reason for the CT angiogram, the reason against it is it is a little more involved. It's a little more expensive. That's right. The argument for it is that it detects what's called soft plaque. That's right. So uh, hard plaque, hardening of the arteries, calcifications, that's what the CT, um, uh, the CT uh, calcium score provides. Uh, the CT angiogram, as you point out, is a much more definitive test, a little more involved. Um, but for, I think, anyone that has discretionary income, uh, and we're looking at the number one cause of death in guys number in our one. age group. Number one. Pre, let's say, uh, not only that, number one preventable type of death. You know, yeah. there's, there's other uh, things that take people out we can't really prevent. This is preventable. So, uh, yeah, thank you for mentioning that about the yeah. CT angiogram. And I'm going to check with you in September to see if you followed through on this. Well, I mean, another way to look at it is if you're worried about your risk, because a lot of people, this happens in women's health too. No one can truly, nobody has the 
foresight or the ability on, on many patients to tell you exactly what your risk is. Some things, some things on your numbers and your family history look high, some things low, and it sort of breaks that tie. That's the brilliance of these tests. But let me tell you, let me tell you a story. I, my uh, tennis teacher, um, who I've been playing much better with lately, um, he is about my age. He used to play t- a professional tennis, a uh, fit, amazing man. This, it turned 65, healthy guy. So we got his cholesterol back. His LDL was 65. His dad is 94 and his mom is like 89. And you're saying, wow, this man is low risk for for coronary artery disease. Statistically true. Only probably only 5% of people in his with that profile would have significant plaque. Coronary calcium scores measure plaque. Uh, And so we get a coronary calcium because it's just it's just check the boxes in my practice. He has, he's like in the 90th percentile of plaque. Mm. So how does that happen, Dr. Moyet? So that how that happens is the old saying we memorize going back to public health, which hasn't changed, that, and people argue plus or minus, but roughly one out of two heart attacks or cardiovascular events still today happen in individuals that seem to have average risk. So we have a lot, it's like PSA and MRI. We've got all these great things and in cardiovascular medicine has all these great things, but it's not perfect. There's still a large percentage of people out there that get away. They don't, they don't, you can't predict exactly their outcome. These are the people that need to learn about CT angiogram and the pluses and minuses of them and the coronary calcium score. And, you know, another way I look at CT angiogram and thanks for making me feel guilty. I haven't had one. But I, I bet you I will get one in the next few years as I become more comfortable with it. I, I kind of look at these tests as when people can't clarify your risk, it's sort of cut to the chase now. Let's just, mm-hmm. just, let's just, let's stop, let's just stop just juggling about and let's just get to the answer. And mm-hmm. so have you had a CT angiogram? I have. And uh, I've also had a- Yes, um... I knew you had. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, I'm a statistician and these are, uh, it's, it makes perfect sense to try and protect ourselves against those unexpected disasters. And uh, this, the coronary calcium score is super affordable. I mean, you can get them for like 150 bucks here in yeah. California. It takes five minutes. Uh, there's no IVs, no needles. So, um, so as a screening test, I tend to go for CT uh, calcium scores. If we find any calcium, uh, you, they, what they do is they profile you on these. Uh, they'll say you have the same amount of plaque as other people your age. You have more plaque. You have less plaque. I always joke that, you know, being an average American is uh, in terms of plaque is not a good thing. That's the number one cause of death is plaque. Yeah. And so uh, so if I find any plaque on these, then I, I have them go see a cardiologist. I tell them that they quite possibly could benefit from statin therapy, which may stop further plaque or even reverse plaque sometimes. Uh, diet and it goes on and on and on. But anyway, I think that was really cool that both you and Dr. Klotz emphasized that because these active surveillance fellows are living normal life expectancies from a prostate cancer point of view. So it makes perfect sense to focus on those other problems. Let's talk about just one last thing. As I mentioned, we could spend the whole time talking about Klotz. The man's so amazing. Um, He talked about uh, a mutation called BRCA2 that is... um, uh, and it was well described, uh, beautiful slides in terms of this mutation that you can pick up with these uh, simple genetic, you know, mouse swabs or a blood test. And it, it, I think it's what, 5% of the population has this. And, uh, and that he thought pretty empirically, you shouldn't do active surveillance in those folks because the majority of them, if not all of them, eventually are going to have the uh, prostate cancer convert into something a little more aggressive and then they'll need treatment. Yeah, um, yeah. I, if I had been questioning him, I probably would have said, but aren't we prepared for that eventuality in all men that are on active surveillance? And every year that we postpone therapy, aren't we doing our patients a favor, not only in terms of postponing the side effects of treatment, but possibly grandfathering into better technology. So, uh, so I, I, I understand his reticence about uh, uh, doing active surveillance in people that are BRCA positive, uh, but I don't, it doesn't seem to really fit with the overall philosophy of active surveillance. So I don't, I would not be as as emphatic about not doing active surveillance. And anyone that does active surveillance, it's always a bunch of pros and cons. If I'm talking to a man who says, look, I haven't been sexually active in in five years, 
why would I be pushing him on active surveillance when I know I can refer him to qualified radiation doctors that will essentially cure the disease or eliminate any f- future problems? And, uh, and the only downside being the possibility of erectile dysfunction. So, um, you know, the other ugly things that we think of these days of incontinence, whatnot, are mostly associated with surgery, not with radiation. So, um, so anyway, right. that was the only thing I know we could go on and on about. Class. No, but Maybe that's a really, another. I forgot about that. That's a really good point because do you ever get sick of me just being right a lot in terms of my predictability, whether it's in my uh, medical journal publications or what I write in the newsletter? I mean, do you ever get tired of just that kind of genie effect that I have, the prognostic effect? Do you realize the last time the clots was at the conference and a couple of the active surveillance people, I said, is it true now that all these people like Scholes and these others on advanced patients are doing genetic testing? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, okay, I bet you we're three to five years away where all of your active surveillance patients, you're gonna start doing genetic testing. And they gave me one of those, you know, I get these once in a while, ah, uh-huh, my head's amusing. And I reminded him off camera, do you remember what you said to me now? Cause now he's <laughs> testing everybody. It, were, it was clear that we were going this direction. Now, yeah. what you bring up is very interesting because I brought up data from Israel from the Journal of Urology and other places that show that they were monitoring people with BRCA2 on active surveillance. And some were suggesting that they do just fine in the short term. And some were suggesting that you just got to monitor them more closely. I don't know if the answer is, but you bring up a good point. I mean, if someone comes into your clinic and says, I'm BRCA2 positive, can I still be on active surveillance? You're saying that you would still monitor them, but more aggressively. Yeah, I mean, we we talk with all of our patients, not like, hey, I'm the doctor, do what, do what I tell you. What we do is we educate them about the risks. So in our little diatribe about heart scans, I try and make it clear, hey, your number one risk of death isn't prostate cancer, it's heart disease. Yeah. So I try and get some buy-in in terms of the statistics. Now, if I have someone push back against my uh, my counsel, I'm happy to say, oh, for your particular situation, hey, you're not sexually active or whatever, they don't want to do active surveillance, great. Uh, you have people at the other extreme, though, that, you know, young men with three girlfriends, uh, you know, they're going to take be willing to take a little more risk, to preserve erectile function uh, than, uh, than, you know, some older guy that is, uh, you know, I packed that in a long time ago, Dr. Scholz. So, uh, so it's not just uh, this idea that every patient's the same. People have different goals. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. But it's amazing how the genetics, think about this. When we were doing this conference 10, 15 years ago, if you brought up the word BRCA1 and 2, people go, why are you talking about breast and ovarian cancer at this conference, right? And now yeah. it's become mainstream and has to be a discussion, in my opinion, with anyone that's being diagnosed with prostate cancer. So that, I'm really glad you brought that up. All right, should we move on to Dr. Johnson? Uh, the, I think uh, so, but I, I, I'm still focused on the fact that you have a tennis coach. That is, I, I don't know if I should find that intriguing, but I... I I want to bring up some bullet points and with your quick comment on Klotz's talk, and I promise you we'll go on because truthfully, we're only about 40 minutes in, and this is, was one of the most important moments. So they also, I also had him comment on the enzalutamide trial called the ENACT trial, where they gave anti-androgen uh, for active surveillance. And the reason this is intriguing is that we published a paper together of someone who had more intermediate risk that seemed to have a response. It was one of your patients. And this goes back seven or eight years ago. So I want you to comment on these drugs that are being used in the active surveillance population and why aren't they hitting home runs? Well, this is something you remember you and I talked to the manufacturer and, and helped organize that trial. Um, we dropped out of uh, participating because they wanted to do random biopsies on everybody. And I said, we don't do that to our patients, but um the, um, so they did the trial, and it was a well-performed trial, uh, and I think what you're alluding to is that uh, although the men that got the Xtandi, the hormone therapy for their, for their active surveillance-esque type disease, yeah. they, um, uh, they did better, but they didn't do dramatically better. And right. uh, I, in looking at that trial, I thought it was because of the 12-core uh, random biopsy thing. I think we're still over-treating prostate cancer pretty radically. And 12-core random biopsies can find little tiny amounts of grade four disease. And in the industry, that's a trigger to just, you know, go ahead and cut their prostate out or radiate them. And 
Dr. Klotz alluded to this, and thank you for bringing us back to it. He's, he's saying something to the effect, is it possible that cancers that we don't see on MRI, even though they may be higher grade, they would by definition be small. Is it possible that those small cancers are not dangerous? Does, it, does prostate cancer need to get big enough uh, to be seen on an MRI before it is dangerous enough to spread? And uh, this is an unanswered question, uh, but I think that in my own experience with, in this realm, it's, I think that that, if that uh, hypothesis will probably be proven to be the case from what we know about prostate cancer. And what, one to, reason to support it is I, throughout my career, have seen a lot of men come in with big, chunky cancers in their prostate and they're... Um, they get, their, they get scanned, they get uh, staged. And now, of course, we have even better scans in PSMA. And we're talking about really large tumors. And I'm talking about something that got big enough to be seen on an MRI, and it still hasn't spread. Mm. So, so the, the spread of the cancer, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio between uh, tumor size and spread, but there's definitely a connection. Everyone knows that there is. So if we play that backwards and we say, well, if the, many of these large tumors are not spreading, um, might we not want to take a chance that these very, very, very small tumors are at very, very low risk for spread? Yeah. And, uh, and so that, if that hypothesis proves true, then it would be very sensible for us to just do good quality MRIs. And if people aren't seeing new problems, now how does this circle back to the clinical trial? Well, it, when you start sticking needles randomly uh, over and over and over into large numbers of men, you're going to find most men have little specks of grade four somewhere. And that means that the treatment didn't work. You know, they, they, they progressed on to high, high grade disease and then they have to have treatment. So when we do active surveillance, we don't randomly stick needles in everyone. And we find that over time that relatively few men progress in active surveillance. Whereas you go to UCSF or Johns Hopkins, where they harpoon their butts repeatedly, you'll find that within five years, about half of the men end up getting some sort of radical therapy that we were originally on active surveillance. So, um, so this is a unanswered question. Dr. Klotz being five miles ahead of everyone else articulated this. And I think that the problem with that Extandi trial that you and I were part of designing, which where they gave half of the men with low risk disease, low intermediate risk disease uh, surveillance alone, the other half got Extandi. And then they saw what happened over the ensuing years. And there was a a lower incidence of treatment in the treatment arm. In other words, less men ended up with surgery and radiation, but it wasn't dramatically lower. It was only about maybe 20% lower, which with Xtandi is a butt kicker drug. This is a powerful yeah. drug. Why wouldn't it just stomp all over early stage cancer? Yeah. And I think it comes down to, you know, these little tiny specks that they pick up on random biopsy, frighten people into treating. And the toxicity wasn't negligible. I mean, you know, there was fatigue and there were other issues and, I don't know. Well, I just, I just, just mentioned the other issue. Yeah, uh, the number one other issue, the other issue uh, is uh, breast enlargement. Good point. <laughs> yeah, mean, that's, that's a pretty high price to pay for uh, for uh, postponing your uh, surgery or radiation for a year or two. Anyway, yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you commented on it. And so the last few items when we'll leave him because I didn't get to comment. I had a really funny joke for Klotz and I, I couldn't I couldn't add it. So I'm going to add it with you because, you know, I was telling the pros and cons of the Canadian system, you know, if we adopt it. And I loved his answer. He said, you know, we should find something in the middle. And I always said, well, uh, Lori Klotz, if you think health care, if you think if you think health care is expensive now, just wait until it's free. So <laughs> I just, you know, the point being that, you know, I know everybody wants I, everybody should have access, but. Um, you know, it's, it's going to come at this tremendous cost, which I think is great, but people got to get ready. But um, yeah. anyway, I don't want to touch we that. We could do, we could do, do a whole, we could do a whole conference on costs, testosterone replacement therapy, inactive um, surveillance. Does that scare the living daylights out of you or not? He didn't bite. Do you want to bite on this one? When you say bite, I mean, we, we do give men on active surveillance testosterone, um, when their testosterone levels are low, I, okay. I don't know why, why not? I mean, other men on active surveillance have normal testosterone levels. Okay. No, I'm glad this is, this is why we do the Q and a, because, you know, we live in a, we live in a world where some of us have to be very PC once in a while. And 
he PC'd this answer. He he said, well, you know, I'd like more data. It looks interesting, but sometimes it scares me. And I understand. And I this is why I have to ask you candidly, do you have people on active surveillance on testosterone replacement? And you said you absolutely do. So that is great. The other thing I said to him, which you and I have never talked about, is I said, what if you go in, this happens, and I know you've seen this, you go in, you get a, you get a follow-up biopsy, and your follow-up biopsies are all negative after you were already positive. He said, these guys, you really have to, these guys get more of a waiting period that you, he has more faith in those people that have a negative follow-up biopsy that they're going to, he has an increased confidence that they'll do well. Do you agree with that? Oh yeah. There's good literature to support that. So what it's saying is that the original tumor that was picked up was so tiny, even though they jabbed the prostate a dozen or more times, they couldn't find it. So we know that men that have tinier tumors are are less likely to progress than men that have larger tumors. That's uh, so that that's not surprising. So how often, if I'm coming in and you're going to follow me on active surveillance, how often am I just? I, can you give any generalizations? Because the only reason I'm asking this is this is the number one question I've received over the past few years. You know, how often do you want me coming in for a visit for a PSA? How often just to get an MRI? I mean, are there any generalizations you can say in the next sixty seconds of? What? Oh yeah, I like, mean, yeah, important. I tell our, yeah, I, I tell our patients that uh, that have uh, PSAs that are normal to start with that uh, we uh, get their PSA twice a year. Uh, we usually have them go to a lab near their house and uh, we check in with them uh, on a video conference, and then we get a good quality MRI once a year. So that's uh, that's yeah, we've been doing that for for many years now, and it it works very nicely as long as you have. Uh, center of excellence to do the MRIs. And uh, and now, of course, we've, there's an interesting problem with active surveillance uh, is that there's so much background noise from excess PSA due to low-grade, uh, probably autoimmune prostatitis, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, which may be the cause of BPH or prostate enlargement, though it's never been proven. So that uh, confounding factor used to make everyone nervous. We call it PSA density. That means where the PSA is uh, too high compared to how big the prostate is. And, uh, and the concern is, well, is it cancer? Are we missing it? And uh, so this is where the PSMA PET scan has come in. It's been interesting to cross check and make sure we aren't missing something. Is, you know, God forbid there's something outside the prostate that's creating extra PSA. And uh, it's been very gratifying to see that these, this very common problem where men are running high PSAs from inflammation, prostatitis, not from the cancer. Uh, even though they have a low-grade cancer too, um, that they uh, that we're not finding that oh we missed it. There's a cancer out there that these are confined cancers, and it gives us an additional uh, sense of confidence that uh, that active surveillance can be continued safely in these men. Even some of which are running higher PSAs have high PSA densities that uh, make everyone a little uncomfortable. Yeah, that's that's great. And any comment now. I think God or someone's shining light on me because of the tie. And I just got to close this a little bit so I can, so people can see my half pretty face. Uh, any comp, you know, the other thing I found fascinating, not on clots was the age issue. You know, he, he said, he said, there's this idea that if you're young, you can't be on active surveillance, but in reality, it's the old guys you worry about transforming a low grade disease into high grade disease. So a quick comment on age uh, and, and getting into active surveillance. Yeah, yeah, I, I would just validate what he says. And he also commented, of course, that the younger men tend to value preserving sexual function more than, than the older men. Not, not to say that's a firm rule of thumb, but it's generally true. And so the value added uh, benefit of doing active surveillance when you're younger from a quality of life perspective is even greater. So I made, I made Klotz's head spin when I showed him the number of vocal therapies available when patients are looking. And I did this on purpose. And the reason yep. I did this on purpose was to say, look, this is not as easy as you think it is now. If, if you're a patient thinking about focal therapy and you look at this menu, this is a pretty big menu and it's pretty intimidating. And I think thank you for bringing thank you for bringing that up because we yeah. probably need to find someone to give us a talk on focal therapy for our next conference. I hate to I don't want to make it hard on our planners, but um, yeah. yeah, it's interesting on that long list. Every which every one of those is a valid possible uh, approach for focal therapy, 
is it, it isn't, does not include the, the most common treatment that I use for focal therapy, which is radiation. Yeah. So point. the reason that I've moved towards radiation for focal therapy, and we do a lot of focal therapy is because the doctors who do radiation have been doing it a lot longer than those folks that are doing those new treatments. And success with focal therapy is much more determined by the accuracy of the treatment than the type of treatment. And uh, so radiation therapists, you know, they spend years figuring out how to deliver this very powerful treatment with great precision. And uh, all the other doctors, they're kind of learning in their, you know, in their garage, you know, well, this sounds like fun. And then they, you know, they kind of, many of them are not radiation doctors and many of them are not interventional radiologists. They're repurposed surgeons. Yeah. So, um, so this problem of quality control for focal therapy, I think is the number one problem. And these are patients that are often being treated with low, small tumors. And the guy goes in behind the curtain, like the wizard of Oz and says, you know, pulls a few things and they says, comes out, okay, we're done. And you won't know if it really got the cancer or not for a long time, because it was a relatively small concern to begin with. So it's hard to figure out who really knows what they're doing. But uh, what, what's been your favorite methodology for, I'm sure you've referred some friends or, or clients for focal therapy. Do you have a, a go-to? I, a go-to I honestly, approach? this this gives me a migraine headache. When I, when I wrote up, when I was typing this up, I thought I'm getting exhausted just typing this. And so what I immediately comes to mind, and I'm sure you're not different here, and includes the radiation focal focally. If someone calls me or wants to ask, I find out who's doing it and how many have they done. I kind of go, I kind of defer back to my, to my, my thinking over the past 30 years, whether it's surgery, radiation, whether it's pathology and second readings like Epstein, I think, well, who's done the most here? I got to find out who that I, I always say, whether it's hyphu, cryoablation, if it's laser, abla- I want to know who the top three are in, 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 geographically or in the US or globally. And I want to try to get that information to patients of who who are doing the most, who gets the gold, who gets the silver and who gets the bronze. That's the yep. only way I yep. am making heads or tails of this, Mark, honestly. It's very, it's very, very difficult. And the other thing, honestly, it sounds kind of pitiful, but online reviews from satisfied customers. Uh, it's I hate to say that, but this sort of... Uh, information from behind the scenes, people that have been through it, are they happy? And how far out are they from their treatment? Are they staying right. cured? So it's uh, there's a lot to focal therapy, but there's a lot of upside to focal therapy. Uh, the idea of being able to get rid of the tumor and reduce your risk of erectile dysfunction by possibly 80%. Uh, so so if you take your average 65-year-old and you give them radiation or surgery or something like that, you're looking at a 50-50 chance that they're going to not be able to get erections, even with Viagra and Cialis. Yeah. Uh, they're going to have to visit Dr. Brady and, and talk about injections or implants and things like that. So uh, with uh, modern focal therapy, I think the risk is more like 10 to 15%. So you're looking at a dramatic reduction in risk of erectile dysfunction. That's why people want to talk about focal therapy. Yeah. And then I... To be fair, I always say, don't forget to ask the second question. How much does this cost? <laughs> I mean, it's big business. It's, now, I that's mean, maybe that's uh, another reason that I've gone towards radiation is the radiation is covered by insurances. Where point. if you look at these at these uh, high foods and these cryos, $25,000, 30000 You said it. I didn't. No. Yeah. I mean, so it's big bucks. It's It's big bucks. There's some incredible people out there. You know some of them, and we we need to get the word out about them. But the idea that Jay just jump in the focal therapy pool it makes me scared. Um, yeah. I'm going to leave clots with something I rarely do, and it's kind of like it's kind of in a sense going back to you CT angiograms and all that. Part of the reason I'm sometimes not too aggressive even on myself or in talking to you is I also think that you deal with a separate group, and meaning that you you deal with a lot of people who are you know they know their numbers. Uh, They're trying to do everything possible. But truthfully, if you look at globally and throughout the United States, most people on average don't know their LDL. They know their PSA, 
when they're diagnosed, but they don't know their LDL. They don't know their HDL. They don't know their triglycerides. They don't have a home blood pressure monitor, which I think everybody should have, which I have from a company like Omron. No, I don't work with any of these companies, O-M-R-O-N. They should be telling their doctor their average blood pressure. They shouldn't be getting it once a year in the office. Uh, they should know their blood sugars. They should know what prediabetes means. And so when you, when you look at all that and you slice and dice the knowledge level, and I'm not just talking about the public. I've seen this also with healthcare professionals. When you slice and dice what people know about the, their numbers when it comes to cardiovascular medicine, very few people have extreme knowledge, like intimidating knowledge, right? And then you're going to start talking to them about coronary calcium, and now you've lost them. So the reason I'm mentioning this is that there have been some big studies on people getting a coronary calcium, just the average person, and they find a lot of calcium, and then they follow them two or three years later, and it did nothing to change their behavior. And I'll tell you why that happened, because they didn't know anything to begin with in terms of their basic numbers. And now you're taking them from fifth grade right to senior in high school. It's intimidating. So that's mm -hmm. sometimes, so I'm gonna, you inspired me to bring in a Moyed moment. Klotz and other people have talked about this two-year trial called the MEAL trial. Active surveillance patients essentially increasing their consumption of plant-based foods versus a control group. And after two years in JAMA, they reported, it was a great trial. I know a lot of researchers, amazing work. And then, so people are using this trial to say, well, diet doesn't make a difference after two years. Well, I just got a few quick things to say. If cardiovascular medicine is the number one cause of death and active surveillance, then dietary changes make a difference because we know they do on the cardiovascular side. That's number one. Number two, can we please start learning from breast cancer? In breast cancer, when a trial shows a benefit with diet to reduce the risk of progression or relapse, what they find is the group that's following the intervention has a pretty significant cardiovascular uh, marker change, which probably then translates to a cancer change. In this trial, you did not see dramatic weight loss. You did not see dramatic drops in cholesterol. You did not see dramatic drops in blood sugar, right? You did not see dramatic drops in blood pressure. So if you look at all the cardiovascular risk markers, even though the quality of their diet is increasing, when you compared them to the control group, they were a little bit better, but they weren't dramatically better. So how can you answer this question? I can. In breast cancer, they've done this. They did a trial called WINS. They did a trial called, for example, WHEL that didn't show a benefit where all people did was eat more fruits and vegetables. But when on the breast cancer side, they see a benefit, they see it that it also comes with a cardiovascular marker benefit. That's why I'm always telling people, don't just follow a diet. See what the diet does for you personally in terms of your big four. And the big four, again, are blood cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, belly, BMI, your weight. It, is your diet not just making you feel better, but is it changing those numbers? And if it's not changing those numbers, it may be time to find a healthier diet. But well, what about, I just had to what, put I just had to put that in, and I'm throwing that well, away. Well, no. So what you're saying is that if you uh, if you want to extract the value of different lifestyle or dietary changes, measure the outcomes to make sure that you're really doing it instead of kidding yourself. That's right. That uh, is is um, is a wonderful piece of uh, wisdom, and I think you should just briefly revisit how we spent the last conference talking about these ozempic type medications yeah. that take yeah. the majority of us who are not able to execute that type of self-discipline with a, an injection in the skin once a week, causing dramatic weight loss and altering many of those measures that you're talking about. Yeah. I, and so what, what you're saying to summarize is exactly right. What I, what I always say when I'm teaching is that Diet is subjective. You're making changes and whether or not you feel better, that's a subjective feeling. I, fe I feel better. I, my sexual health has improved. You know, you, you're kind of, that's subjective. But then you have your objective parameters that evaluate your diet. It's sort of your PSA or your MRI, right? But your objective parameters are the things I talked about, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, and is your weight changing? That tells you 
that gives you an idea objectively. And so everybody should rely on some type of objective markers. Now, if you need more help, because people always want to also say that diet's the answer to everything. Well, it's not. It's the diets. It's not diet. It's diets. In prostate cancer, virtually every diet has been tested on some level. And I'm going to tell you a quiz that no physician would ever probably get right. And this is a quiz we do. One of the largest amounts of weight loss seen in any dietary change was down the street from you where they put people on a low carb diet and they lost an average of 20 pounds on androgen deprivation therapy. It was called the CAPS-1 trial. My point is one diet doesn't fit everybody, it, but what happened was they, they had great weight loss. So that's a marker of success, but a lot of people are frustrated and it's understandable. It's so understandable. So now you and I have been talking about these different drugs that are available. Um, semaglutide, which is essentially Ozembek, Ozembic and the new one, the, the actual FDA approval is Wegovy, W-E-G-O-V-Y. The problem with it, the drug is such a gigantic hit that they're having trouble in the manufacturing process. But when you see commercials on TV, and I really don't like these commercials, I don't find them that exciting. Rebelsis, Ozembic, and Wegovy are the same drug. They're just in different, different dosages and formulations and delivery systems. So the average weight loss in these trials has been running 15 to 20% of body weight, which is starting to compete with bariatric surgery. You have patients on Ozembic. I educate a ton of doctors who have patients on Ozembic and they're seeing this kind of weight loss. I just gave no, it- So 15, let's, let's do 20, let's do the numbers. So 20% of a patient uh, who weighs 200 pounds- Right. Is 40 pounds. It's crazy. It's, I, it's, it's, it's a, wacky. It's incredible. Now, what's the catch? The catch is it's enormously expensive. You have to give the self-injection generally every week. And right now it's so difficult to find. And as, as long as you can get through the first few months, because you have nausea, you, it, it's in, you have an aversion almost to food. So the reality is, in, since we talked about this last time, just a few months ago, I've given a couple talks in the United States to doctors and nurses. At every single talk, I've seen a doctor or nurse that looks 40 to 50 pounds less than what I've known in the past 20 years. And they go, hey, Dr. Moyed, I, I'm taking that. And I go, yep. that's just unbelievable, right? Yeah. But what's really incredible is that they're about to get a competition. And this is the great thing about this category. Terzepatide is a competitor. It's what we call a dual it has a dual mechanism, mechanism of action. They're getting about almost 20%. So the category is going to blow up. You're going to have more competition. But also remember, I don't want to, you're also going to, we're also going to learn some catch over the next few years we didn't know, whether it's acute cholecystitis. There, there's been some noise. But the truth is, when you lose that amount of weight, it's going to come with a catch. And the catch right now is price. It's really, really hard to get. And there is nausea and GI issues that you have to work through. And Mark, the most important point is, when are we going to start realizing that when people are put on bariatric surgery or these medications, and God bless them, they're wonderful medications, the way they work is that if you cut back dramatically the amount of food you're eating, it's not like you can keep eating what you're eating, hang out at the McDonald's drive through when you do the calculations, these people are getting 800, 900, 1,000 calories a day. They're still, they're still restricting what they're eating. It's just easier to do that because you don't want food anymore. It takes away, it takes away that drive. But these are- that's what my patients, Yeah, that's exactly what my patients they say. I just, I eat a third of what's on the plate and I don't want anymore. I, I, exactly. I look at the food on the buffet and I'm just not interested, which is- Exactly what we would all hope for. Yeah. All right, let's yes. move on. I'm let's really move on to Dr. Johnson. I'm, I'm yeah, so wanna... glad. Here's an hour. We gave an hour to this, but I'm so glad. When in doubt, talk to your doctor about the possibility because Mark Moyet has made fun of the weight loss category for 30 straight years. And finally, he got pie in his face. There's a category of medications called the GLP-1s. And they come in a variety of different dosages and forms, and they are helping people lose weight. And exactly. they're not only doing that, they're also fulfilling the Scholes Moyed criteria, their objective parameters, their blood sugar, you know, not just their weight, their blood sugar, their blood pressure, they're reducing their risk of cardiovascular events. It's giving you all those things too. So, how can you not be excited? But remember, like everything in life, including this tie, 
everything comes with a catch and you just got to be, you got to be educated on the catches. Dr. Johnson's talk, I think, is going to become the de facto standard for people who want to understand PSMA PET scans and want to understand Pluvicto uh, uh, lutetium therapy. And I thought it was an amazing talk. Uh, it was so exciting to see the technology and all its intricacies, and it was so beautifully presented. And I think that, that uh, he is going to become famous for that. One thing that really struck a sour note right in the middle of the talk, which probably went past people, uh, maybe and uh, maybe didn't go past people, I think we need to talk about. And, and that is that despite all the, the, the razzmatazz, that the improvement in survival was only four months. Um, we need, we've had to address this problem uh, with other treatments, like uh, with Provenge, with Zofigo, with Taxotere. Taxotere was shown to only cause a three-month improvement in survival. And for, year, the urolog- for many years, the urologists wouldn't refer their patients to oncologists to get Taxotere because it only caused three-month improvement in survival. Now, these people selected for these clinical trials the ones that didn't get the treatment lived on average less than one year. We always talk about how long people live on when they have prostate cancer, but they selected out all the people with the most dreadful type of disease. And so these um, patients that didn't get the Pluvictu lived on average less than one year. So, uh, so when they tested Taxotere at an earlier stage in men that had not become hormone resistant. Now, these are still men with serious cancers. They have yes. cancer yes. in their bones. They have cancers around their body, but they don't have hormone resistance. So they're not on their last legs. And if you look at the average survival of that group, the ones that didn't get the Taxotere immediately, they got it delayed, but they didn't get it immediately. Uh, compared to the men that got Taxotere at an earlier stage, there was a 17 month improvement in survival. So now the people that quote, didn't get immediate taxatere, they got it later. So basically it was saying that the earlier you got the taxatere, you did even better than the men that got taxatere later. So, so there's um, a very powerful leveraged way to use all these fabulous new medications. The excitement about them is totally justified, even though the trial that was used to get validation only showed a four month difference in survival. Yeah. And this is, why would they test people that are in such serious straits? Economic reasons. If they pick uh, people that have a five-year average survival and that we bump it out to 10 years, they're not going to get FDA approval for 12 Thank years. You. Thank so you. It, there is no other way to get these medicines on the market. Once it gets on the market, Dr. Kwan beautifully laid out who's eligible and uh, uh, on several occasions. So uh, so anyway, I think everything about Dr. Johnson's talk was fabulous and it was beautiful, but that four month uh, survival advantage has to be called out and discussed a little bit in the light of day, just like we have. So people can understand that, no, it's not just four months. Now, let's say that you are one of those patients with only 11 months to live on average. Does that mean that you only get four extra months? Do you somehow know that? No, unfortunately not. As they pointed out, there were three groups, people that get dramatic response, some response, and no response in about equal categories, one third, one third, one third. So you can just take two treatments and you're going to know if you're one of those dramatic responders. So testing the water with these medications this is true for all of general oncology, for cancer, for taxotere and all these sorts of things. If something's not working, you don't keep doing it. You switch to something else. Right. But if right. something's working fantastic, then you keep going. And so, uh, and there was some discussion about that, whether can you take Pluvicto past six treatments? And the cancer, of course you can, although you might have to write a check for it. So, uh, because your insurance might not cover it. But anyway, that's the, the whole problem with this four month. Uh, people come out and they love to talk about, well, it's really only four months. And it gets a lot of attention because everyone else is excited about it. And so yeah. people come in with this, well, it's only four months difference. Yeah. Please yeah. put it in context. It's only four months difference for the people with prostate cancer that are the sickest of the sickest of the sickest. You and I have been working together too long. I just realized that at this very moment, because I'm going to tell you that uh, I'm going to take the blame for that. When he said it, it immediately sprung in my head something that you and I, a lot of people don't know that we did when Dendrion first came out as the first immune therapy and they had Provenge and Provenge is still out. They reported this <clears throat> couple months survival and people thought, 
all this money for these couple of months. And then we asked them, we said, will you please break it out and, and actually explain it better? And they ended up doing it in further commercials. And I felt like we were part of the impetus of that. And they started to explain that a third of these men were still alive three years later, or some number, many years later. And I thought more people have to explain it. And it made me think of that moment. We were sort of rushed for time at that moment. But when you actually, when you, when you, when you understand how it comes to an average, that means you know there's just as many people above there as there is below. But you're, what you're doing is you're discounting all the people who are going years and years out, essentially, yeah. because for the person that fails on the first try or goes for 30 days, they're put into that calculation. So statistically, you're going to see a low number. But what you what really what really should be explained in these commercials is what percentage of men are still alive two and three years later, and mm -hmm. and people are always shocked when they learn the number. And so I couldn't agree with you more. I, I take the blame for that because I immediately thought we're going to talk about that, but we just, we were covering so much that I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. That's a big catch on your part. I appreciate it. Now, everything else about him was so, so polished and charismatic and beautiful. Right. I want to jump on and talk about Dr. Brady, another spectacular, I mean, we're so blessed with these amazing people that are so kind to come on and share their, their skills and their, and their experience. And Dr. Brady covered a ton of information, which, um, of course, is not my expertise, but I wanted to comment on his uh, experience because he sees a very subselect uh, group of people. He sees people that uh, many have had some sort of a disaster after surgery or radiation, which is obviously very sad. And I'll bet that many of his patients have already tried to fix it with someone else first. So I think a lot of time, Dr. Brady's seeing patients that, you know, like second try, you know, they, they went to someone else and they tried to help them with their incontinence or their, and the doctor wasn't that skilled. And then they go see the master and Dr. Brady tries to fix it. Um, so he had a comment, of, you know, that I thought was actually true, but I want to put in context. He had a comment that the worst uh, problems that I see are from radiation. And, uh, and the most difficult to fix problems are from radiation. And that's understandable. The reason is that bad radiation, which hits the surrounding tissues, causes those tissues to not heal well. And so someone who has surgical skills like Dr. Brady is going, can I even go in there safely? Will the tissues even heal after I try and fix this? That's yeah. a real mess. Um, so, but in my experience, with a selection of um, you know really top level radiation therapists who hit the prostate only, and they don't hit the bladder and the rectum as was so common in the past, uh, we just simply don't see these disasters. Thank God. Um, but if you go to a second tier center using older equipment, less experienced doctors, uh, I believe he is absolutely correct that the radiation therapist can do more damage than the surgeons can. Now, um, I and through the PCRI and through years of my efforts, we're trying to help educate people that they need to be really fastidious in terms of who they allow to work on their bodies. And I think with that preventative approach, um, I, don't, I don't agree with him because he also said in there a very common mantra you hear, you do surgery first, and then if it doesn't work out, you can do radiation later. Been hearing that. And I think it was a good mantra from say like 2002, 2004, when the radiation was terrible. You think of radiation back then, it was like a spray can. Like, let's just spray some radiation around here and see, see if we can get results. Now we've got pencil beam type radiation. So, so the, um, that idea of, well, we've got a backup plan, I think is almost a plan for failure. I want to plan for success. And uh, the type of men that we're seeing now have earlier stage disease than we've ever seen before with PSAs, PSMA PET scans, all these fabulous, we're talking about focal therapies, not whole prostate therapies. And uh, so, and then if people are wise and they go to top-notch people for their radiation, I think if you compare those results with the people that are getting top-notch surgery, which of course you want to avail yourself of the best surgeons if you decide to go that way, I am seeing less side effects from the top-notch radiation compared to surgery with as good or better cure rates. So, uh, so I just wanted to balance that viewpoint because I think he is seeing kind of the end of the line type people that have really been hurt badly. And I don't deny that that exists. And if you just go to the, you know, your radiation therapist down in the corner, it's a crapshoot. He may be fabulous. He may be state of the art. He may have the best equipment in the world. But are you really, as a patient, qualified to vet that situation and know if that individual is providing top level care? 
So that's the challenge. And uh, but I think that his viewpoint of things is is a little bit skewed by the fact that he's seeing some real tragedies on a regular basis. And I think he's the guy to go to if you're yeah. in that unfortunate situation. You know, whatever his opinion is uh, on most things, I can tell you that he's the guy who's got to provide the final cleanup. I mean, he's the guy that's got to come in and and clean a mess up. And there's not that many people, which is why you need to seek them out. And these are people that have been trained, you know, uh, our institution, other institutions, these are reconstructive urologists. This is what they do. This is their bread and butter. They fix things when it gets messy or at least try to make it better. And so the reason why we know this still occurs on a, on a large level is that I see, as you do, almost every single question that ever comes through for these meetings from the patient population and the audience. And inevitably, there's a ton of questions on, I'm having all these complications from this procedure, who do I go to? I see it every single conference. And so I think the greatest thing about Brady is we've highlighted that uh, there are these select individuals around the country called reconstructive urologists that you should go look at. And even Brady will recommend his favorite around the country to you. It's not just Brady, you know, there are other quarterbacks besides Brady. How did you like me to fit that in? And so you've got, <laughs> if you're looking for- Actually, I didn't catch it until you pointed it out. So I, thank I'm you. that fast, man. This is what 30 years younger than you looks like, baby. So um, I just, you know, we just, I'm not going to, uh, what we're going to do in the future is, because like I said, we have a guy, there's a person in the east, east side of the country, west side. I think we do a really big service if we provide regionally where some of the best reconstructive folks are, because these people are like gold. There's so few of them and they're so good at what they do. It's unbelievable. It really is. And so I'm really oh, I mean, glad he did. That you like him. And then, well, I mean, you do. Yeah, I loved him. He's uh, I mean, he, he briefly went through his credentials when he, when he when he started off. So so your average urologist has done four years of medical school, five years of of uh, urology specialty fellowship training. And then he goes beyond that, does two years of reconstructive fellowship. So all that's after college. So, you know, yeah. he probably had four or five years of, of, of university training. Yeah. So. You're talking about the pinnacle of, of refinement in terms of training. And of course, his uh, his communication skills and his humility about, you know, all the different things that men can do prior to surgery, of course, speaks to yours and my heart. We would like to see people start with the treatments that are reversible before you jump into the irreversible, which is the surgeries. And yeah. uh, that's yeah. exactly what he said. So yeah. let's talk. No, just I, I thought. Oh, I just thought, you know, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to highlight on, on ED or in the area of uh, incontinence, but I think what you walk away besides the 6 billion slides, which are incredibly informative, I think people need to go back through that talk and realize how many of their options there are from, from not invasive at all to very invasive. And I think he did a good job of showing you that there's a lot out there in that ocean. You know, it's not scarce. And some people do just fine with pills. Some people do fine with minimal intervention. Some people need maximal intervention. I think he did a good job of walking us through all of those. Oh, yeah, it was uh, it was fabulous. Now, let's talk just briefly about Dr. Uh, Dr. Yu. Um, you asked him a very pertinent question in terms of what is metastasis? I love Dr. Yu's answer to that. And I think one of uh, the ways to, yes, and I loved how he immediately broke it down into two broad categories. And I would, he didn't use this word, but I would say the two categories he talked about are micrometastasis and macrometastasis. And that does start to bring some clarity in terms of what we're talking about with metastasis. He also talked about low volume and high volume disease, which I think you guys covered really nicely. Yeah. I, th I don't have too much to add to what your discussion, but I think it's nice to revisit this whole concept of micro metastasis versus macro. The whole field of medical oncology originated out of the uh, hypothesis that macro metastasis must start as micro metastasis. It seems so obvious. But there was a guy named Bonadonna that was a breast cancer uh, uh, surgeon or oncologist, I don't know, from Italy. And he postulated that prior to being macro, there must be micro. And he said, we can give chemo to macro and shrink it. Maybe we can give chemo to micro and cure it. 
And that, uh, that started the whole process of what we've already talked about, that of giving effective treatments earlier and earlier and earlier to get more bang for the buck. And so, and this evolved into a discussion with you and Dr. Yu about when is it so low risk or low volume that the treatment becomes too onerous and there are too many side effects to justify the benefit. Maybe they're gonna already do so well because their disease isn't that advanced. And I think that's, uh, there's no answer to these questions. This is a, a, uh, an important concept, an important principle. I think every patient with potentially metastatic disease, that would mean they might have micrometastasis, uh, and any patient that has established metastatic disease, they always have to factor in, well, what about the ones we can't see? What are we doing about that? Well, we, the only thing we can do are what we call systemic therapies, hormone treatments, chemo treatments, immune treatments, and all of which could have side effects. So there's always this push-pull in terms of how much do you do, who do you do it in, and I was really grateful that you guys spent some time talking about that because uh, patients think, well, this is just above my pay grade. I don't think so. And I think that uh, this is something where people just say, well, what is my risk of having micrometastasis? One thing, of course, that's made this whole analysis much easier is the accuracy and the power of these new PSMA PET scans. And there's, that's been talked about a lot. So we always used to calculate the risk of micrometastasis. Well, how high is the Gleason score? How high is the PSA? How many needle cores are positive? all these analyses. Now we just do a PSMA PET scan. There's no cancer out there. Um, this hasn't come up in the conference, but I think that it has really impacted the way I decide how to treat patients that are newly diagnosed with intermediate or high-risk disease as it impacts how much hormone therapy, how much systemic therapy should they get as a preventative against micrometastatic disease. Well, historically, men with high risk got 18 months of hormone deprivation. Men with intermediate risk got four months, four to six months. And everyone knows that there's a lot of side effects from these uh, hormone blockade, Lupron type medicines. That being said, then uh, shouldn't we consider maybe cutting back on that type of treatment in men that have PSMA PET scans that don't show metastasis? We know the PSMA PET scans are not perfect, but the statistics are as follows. About 80% of men that have high risk disease with clear scans don't have micrometastasis. About 90% of men with intermediate risk disease who have clear PSMA PET scans don't have micrometastasis. So we need to start thinking of some of these high-risk patients with clear PSMA PET scans more like intermediate risk patients. And maybe we don't have to be giving them all 18 months of hormone therapy. Mm. Now, if anyone from academia is listening to this, they're, you know, they're you know, their stomach's turning and they're, and they're, you know, they're starting to ex explode because there's absolutely no clinical trials to validate this type of thinking. You know, how long it'll take when we have pure, absolute, unadulterated proof that you don't need to do 18 months in a PSMA pet negative high-risk patient? Eh, 10 to 15 years. So use, those of you that want to wait around for that, um, you know, follow the academic path. In the meantime, I think we have to consider that especially let's say if you have someone that's 75 years old and their median survival is 10 years. Now we're going to blast their, their testosterone for 18 months. They'll never recover normally. So they'll right. be hypogonadal right. the rest of their lives. They'll reduce their risk of, of uh, cancer coming back by about 10%. And, and, and so you say, well, how bad is it if the cancer does come back? Well, now we have PSMA PET scans, we can monitor these people. And if they develop an early small metastasis in their pelvic region, we can possibly cure them. So what's the cure rates in men that have small metastasis in someone that didn't have long-term hormone therapy? Uh, it's probably about 50%. So we're not improving survival or cure rates by giving this long-term hormone therapy in these high-risk patients with negative PSMA PET scans. So this, I don't think it's come up as a discussion point throughout this conference, but this is one of the biggest breakthroughs, I think, in terms of utilizing these PSMA PET scans, not only in the, metast the metastatic patients, but in the newly diagnosed to decide how much hormone therapy they need. Yeah, I think uh, it's really an incredible time. And I think you know what they kept going back i call them the mayo boys you know i call i call i call uh i call our two speaker the mayo boys and i don't know why it just sounds endearing or the, and uh they they bring back the idea over and over again that you've got to start looking into getting at least some type of pet ct why everybody's arguing that psma may be the greatest thing since sliced bagels the reality is there's just not enough people getting a pet ct period and i think <laughs> 
I, I think, you know, that it kind of goes back to our discussion. I hate to bring it back again. It goes back to the CT angiogram. We're going, hey, have you heard of CT angiogram? And we're forgetting the fact that most people don't get a cardiovascular workup that's that's intense, that gets all the little parameters checked and know their numbers. The same thing here. Uh, so I really think they did a good job of going through the different types. And I, again, we're talking about Evan's talk, but I, I think the reason why you jumped on that moment is it because it plays out in my mind all the time too. I don't know even know if there's a comment on it. There tends to be this thinking that if you have a cancer and if it's acting a little bit aggressive, you they use the word kitchen sink. You got to throw everything at it, including the kitchen sink. And I've always kind of learned over the years and through the decades that that might be true in some cases, but sometimes when you throw a kitchen sink at somebody, they throw the entire house back at you. Right. I mean, so can you comment on that, that sometimes and this is what we did not cover. And this kind of leads into this with Evan is oligometastatic prostate cancer. It's become a standard terminology now. Well, obviously, they're not throwing the kitchen sink at it. Right. Yeah. And yeah, there's, there's so, so many there's so many variables now with these oligometastatic patients. And since we can follow patients so closely, the reason we've been so aggressive in giving chemo and lots and lots and lots of stuff to these patients is that we didn't have any way to monitor what was going on with this, quote, invisible micrometastatic disease. Well, now we've got better tools. And so it's, uh, it's led to, you know, a big disturbance in the forest in terms of what is the right approach. And, and, and the bottom line is it has to be individualized. Uh, there's so many variables. How old is the patient? How many spots are there? Where is it located? What treatments have you had before? And did they work or not? All these variables need to be covered. Uh, it's so cool, though, that we have all this new technology available to us. This, uh, if you, my day-to-day -day life has become so much more fun in the last five, 10 years because I have 20 times more tools in my tool chest than I did when, if you go back to like 2005. So yeah. it's yeah. a, uh, and these tools are more effective, less toxic. They can be given in combination. They can, uh, and then we have better monitoring tools to find out if they're working. Yeah. So that's really, really exciting stuff. So I, now, to I want you to, I want you to comment on that. Plus, your your life is a lot more fun the past five years because you spent more time with me. It's not just the fact <laughs> that you have more tools. Let's just get honest for a moment. <laughs> We're having a blast. When I was teasing uh, Doctor Yu out, we didn't have the time, and you, I know you know this. So I just, people tend to think of chemo in terms of taxatier and they think of Jeptana, right? But there's there are other chemotherapies when the going gets rough and they need to, and oncologists need to reach in their bag that should be also discussed. And I, talk, I talked about carboplatin and some other ones. Can you just make a comment that you do have two chemotherapies at your back and call, but you do have another or others in special cases when needed. Can you just comment on that? Oh yeah, this is, a, I mean, I, I, doctor, you made a comment about running out of things to do. With genetic testing, we can find treatments from other cancers that might work for a, the specific uh, specifics of a prostate cancer patient that matches, uh, say, in a genetic abnormality that's in kidney cancer or in pancreas cancer. Uh, there are treatments for those that we don't normally use for prostate cancer. So there are ways to, to bring in these other uh, options. I would have Love to ask Dr. Kwan if he still uses any Yervoy. You know, his heart was broken when he tested Yervoy plus spot radiation on people with metastatic disease. And he was half of a percentage point away from a statistically significant uh, approval for Yervoy. Does that mean that it doesn't work? Of course it works. And so there's a lot of uh, other agents that can be uh, repurposed. There's a lot of things that are sitting on the shelf that aren't being utilized. Um, I think that that's a... Um, you know, that that idea of uh, running out of things to do, I don't think is really practical. There is a time when you look at the risk benefit ratios, he was talking about very, uh, you know, was very emotional about it uh, in terms of, is the treatment going to cause uh, so many side effects that it isn't justified for the amount of gain that it could bring? So that yeah. that type of analysis needs yeah, to be I'm, made when, I'm, when people are starting to wind down to, you know, they've really truly run out of options. I can answer this for Quan. This may be one of the more, this may be a very significant moment in our Q&A because this makes me wacky. And I can answer this for Quan. And I think you would concur that Quan is more excited than ever before about immune therapy. We do have Provenz that should be used as early as possible, right? When you're castrate resistant prostate cancer, when the PSA is low, that's better. 
We agree that's a tool in your toolbox. That's fantastic. But Quan has not lost his excitement on immunology. And I'll tell you why. And we have talked about this so many times because this guy calls me at five in the morning and I feel guilty if I don't answer. So I answer every time like an idiot. And then we go on these discussions and, and what I have told him and he's educated me and I know you agree with this is that what we're seeing in other cancers, including metastatic melanoma, is that as the disease becomes more advanced, it develops more mutations. As it develops more mutations, you're more likely to respond to immune therapy and immune therapy can help your immune system recognize that cancer is the enemy because it hides out most of the time. But what you need is a lot of mutations. So what Quan's doing a lot of work on is he's seeing that when you see it, more and more mutations build up, there's a certain point where he feels confident immune therapy can be given, which then leads to another point we all agree on, which is he's now of the philosophy, and you're gonna love this, that when you do liquid biopsies, you do another one after the treatment no longer works because the cancer keeps evolving. So it may have a handful of mutations, and then when you no longer respond to another therapy, it may have a lot more than a lot more than a lot more. So he says that one thing that's really changed his practice is that he's starting to do garden 360s and other types of liquid biopsies right after a treatment no longer is effective, and he's gonna to go to the next one because the cancer has now changed its face. It looks different than it did six months ago. Can you comment on that? How beautiful was it for me privately to have this conversation with him about his excitement for immune therapy when it's used at the right moment? And that's why we're going to bring him back anyway. I'm so dang hyper, hyper about it. I'm going to give you the floor to clean <laughs> that up. Yeah. Well, the other thing, not only can it help you um, find potential treatments, but it can also measure whether what you're doing is working or not. So they can actually quantify how much of this abnormal cancer DNA is floating in the blood. And if it's going up and up and up, that's a good sign that your, can your cancer treatment is ineffective. So, uh, so it's just another tool uh, to complement PSA testing, scan testing, and now with uh, Garden360 Foundation One type uh, cell-free DNA testing, you can also detect if the treatment, you can also detect if the treatment's effective or not. That mousetrap just, uh, mouse just went off in your, in your office. I am not, <laughs> I, Mark, I'm not letting you leave here without, in my personal wait, opinion. Wait, 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 I got one more thing on, I, on Quan. I want to just- No, it's on talk. Quan, it's on Quan. Yeah. But I'm, yeah, not yeah, I want, you, I'm not letting you leave without one more comment with Quan, what well, Quan's comment to me privately, which is, my personal opinion is one of the biggest errors that could potentially be happening out there with advanced prostate cancer is that people get one biomarker test, like one liquid biopsy, and then they're done. They're supposed to get, can you, I just please. Well, please let, let me, let me reach up. Maybe the piece here I can come up with it. And I'm going to put the good housekeeping stamp of approval on that comment that if you, I'll put it this way. If someone has had a uh, Garden 360 or Foundation one test one time, uh, it would be about the same as testing your PSA one time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, did that scratch your itch? I know. So what? So what you're saying is it's not unusual to get multiple tests over time, especially as you move into the next treatment. That's become the standard. The standard isn't one and done. Correct. Thank you. Now you've made my day. <laughs> All right. One other thing about Quan that really uh, caught my attention is something that we're dealing with more and more. Now that we're doing all this spot welding on spots of cancer around the body, um, and then we're trying to judge whether it worked or not, uh, you check PSAs, of course, and then you can get repeat PSMA PET scans. Dr. Quan had a statement about the uh, PSMA PET scans capacity to detect the carcasses the carcasses of the dying or dead cancer cells yeah. months yeah. and months and months after the treatment has been administered. And he knows that they're carcasses because when he does metabolic scans with C11, he can tell that the metabolic activity of the cancer is gone. That means it's dead, mm. but you can still detect the carcasses, the PSMA on the shell of the dead cancer cell months and months and months later. And that is something that the industry is gonna to have to learn and understand in dealing with these fabulous scans, you is know. that just because you can still see it for a while after the treatment, 
doesn't mean that the treatment didn't work with PSMA PET scanning. With C11, with Axman, which is another metabolic scan, both of those are uh, looking at quick turnaround, but not with a PSMA PET scan. I'm not trying to say anything bad about PSMA PET scans. We're ordering five or six a day in my office, um, and it's, it's revolutionary and wonderful technology. And that's why this conference has spent so much time focusing on this incredible technology. It's, it's, yeah. it's, the, it's the action point of modern prostate cancer care. But I thought that was such a cool comment. And the it other was. thing that you and Dr. Kwan talked about was, what do you do with these people? With these new, Now we've got this PSMA PET scans. We're hoping and expecting that if your PSA after surgery starts rising, it's up to 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and you get a PSMA PET scan and it doesn't show anything. And maybe it gets up to 0.5 or one and it starts to show something, or maybe it doesn't. What did he say? He had one patient with 600 that never showed up. Yeah. So um, when you have fabulous technologies like this, the we tend to over rely on them because they answer so many questions, but we do have exceptions when they don't show up. And this, the management, I don't have an easy answer for the management of these people with these rising PSAs 0.2, 0.3, 0.4, because there's been some good literature showing that if you radiate some of these people, the cancer will go away. In other words, they radiate blindly where the prostate used to be. I'm not advocating for that in everybody. Uh, what I'm saying is that our technology has outdistanced our experience and our wisdom to know what to do. I don't think this rule of thumb, he mentioned, well, I'll just let the PSA double and repeat the scan. I think in more than half the time, I would do that. But I can also think of cases where I wouldn't do that. If I had a patient who's... Uh, you know, 47 years old, had surgery two years ago, and his PSA is rising with a brisk doubling time. I'm going to be thinking about how can I cure this man? Yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit and let the PSA just double until I, because the reason is, okay, you get a scan, it shows a spot. What's the chances that that's the only spot in someone that's relapsing? Well, maybe 50, 50, it's, there's no guarantee. That's all the spots. So, um, so I think that there are exceptions to his kind of, well, we'll just let it double. And I think that's probably what I would do more often than not, but I'm going to individualize uh, how we use the information from these PSA or the lack of information when we can't see something. Yeah. First of all, I don't know. I've never seen you smile so much during two hours of my life. I don't know what's so, I don't know it's because you're spending time with me, but I, you literally are smiling with every answer. And so I don't know if you've been going into some I'm, of that CBD. Honestly, or, honestly Mark, uh, yeah, I am having more fun at work you are, you are. than you are. I've ever in my whole career. Uh, I've surrounded by a, you know, a strong team of people and they're delightful to work with. And the, um, the technology that we have to bring there to bear, is. I like the challenge of saying, oh gosh, we've got too many new treatments. I can't decide what to do with them all. That's uh, a good point. I like that problem. That's a good point. No, you're, you're, you should be riding high. I mean, it's, uh, not riding, you know, marijuana high, but just riding high. It's just, it's gl I'm glad to see you this enthusiastic and excited. I think I'm going to take, I'm going to take the hit for Quan there also, because what sometimes I like to do is I like to just throw out to the audience some generalities. They're not specifics of, you know, if my PSA is going up, when do I ask for another scan? Because we know in medicine, a lot of what's triggered in a relationship is the patient bringing it up, right? The, the person saying, look, uh, I'm feeling uncomfortable with this. What else can we do here? And then people start to think more. Um, I think of the friend of ours you and I had just in the past six months who went from a, he oligometastatic, went from 0.06 then suddenly went to you know 0.09 and almost was going to be a 0.1 and just wanted a scan and boom, there was a spot and he's getting treated for it. I mean, where is that in the protocol, right? So right. what you're saying yeah. is true. There, there are generalities, but man, Everyone's individualized and there and and well, some make, of the scans have done let's amazing. Let's make that things. wait, wait, yeah, no, let's make your example even more clear. So okay. you didn't say his PSA went from 0. 0.2 to 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.9. You said no. it went from 0. 0.02 Zero. to yes. 0. 0.06 to 0. 0.09. And as you and I, and this is a physician, a patient is a physician That's who's right. prodding That's you right. and I, he's been seeing both of us, prodding you and I to get a scan. And you and I in the back of our minds are saying, okay, the yield in scans at less than 0.1 is less than 10%, you know, we're to, but to, hey, he's a doctor, it's his life, he can, he has the money to pay for it. And, uh, and lo and behold, something lights up like a light bulb in one of his lymph nodes, and he gets, I think we gave him proton therapy. And um, so, yes, these generalities are good principles to work from uh, in, in terms of overall thinking, but 
you have to be prepared. The fact Good that point. prostate cancer comes in hundreds and hundreds of varieties. There's, there's low PSA producing prostate cancers, high PSA producing, low PSMA producing, high PSMA producing. I just want to add that he had treatment previously six years ago, just had a little mm -hmm. hit of radiation to the oligo. This guy went six years without any therapy. He just, yes. they just, you just followed him. And to be further clear, he's your patient. He's my friend. I just do education now. So I'm just helping everyone as friends. You're seeing them in the clinic. Before we finish this up, I want you to answer a, a personal situation that my uh, wife is treating me for. Um, I have, uh, uh, this is right up your alley. So I think you, you can probably comment as an expert on this. So I have a little bit of peripheral neuropathy. That means numbness in my feet. And uh, so I mentioned this to my wife, who seems to own every vitamin on the West Coast. And she concocted up a combination of um, two substances, um, alpha lipoic acid. Yeah, and that's, you, that's a, actually, so I'll take it one at a wait, time. Wait, 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 wait. And benthiamine, uh -huh. benthiamine. Uh -huh. um, and of course, I was already taking a little B12. Um, am I just fooling myself that my feet are already feeling better? Or do you think it's a real thing? No, I think it's possibly a real thing. You know, I mean, the first, first thing, what is what is peripheral neuropathy? So it's I mean, it's just an easy way. We call it it's 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 a nerve injury that mostly occurs on the periphery, peripheral neuropathy. They call it stocking. You know, they call it stocking and gloves. It occurs in the feet, generally in the hands. And you see it when you give, for example, it can it's the, the catch is there are a lot of different causes. There's aging. There's low B12 chemotherapy can cause it. Some of the chemotherapies you give can actually, the drug goes to the very ends, the fingers and toes and causes nerve injury. And then that nerve injury results in neuropathy or the symptoms of it, like feelings on pins and needles, or it can be burning. And sometimes when this gets very severe, it can be, you know, extremely concerning and you have to, so you really have to be you really have to go to someone that's going to look at the etiology of it. Why is somebody getting this? And so one of the most common things to do, even though it's not that common necessarily, is that it, getting even the B12 blood test, probably the most underappreciated nutritional blood test. It's funny when it comes to nutritional blood tests, because if you talk to some experts, they'll think you have to be tested for 8,000 vitamins and 8,000 minerals, and now you're completely broke. And the reality is, which one of these tests really are helpful and show some endpoints? Well, having a low B12 as you get older is extremely problematic, and the blood test is extremely good. And the reason it's problematic is because we call it the great mimicker. It can result in a lot of different symptoms that can confuse your doctor that actually something else might be going on. You can attribute almost any symptom to head to toe. And people were taught in the old days in medical school that if you're low in B12, you see abnormal red blood cell changes. But those actually occur long after these other ones can occur like neuropathy, for example. So the first point, it's a teaching point. The first point that people should walk away with, no, I don't think you're just getting placebo, but the first point and the one I want to leave you with without spending too much time on this, because I have a couple other questions from Quan that you left me on, is that people think that I'm a big fan of just getting vitamin C or a vitamin D blood test. Actually, as, as people age, including in prostate cancer, one of the most valuable nutritional blood tests they can ask for, even if it's just once a year, is how is my B12 doing? And I the completely reason, agree. Now, uh, the reason why, why uh, it's so critical, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the reason it's so critical is in this day and age, if you gain weight, your B12 can go down. If you eat healthier, stay away from animal products, your B12 can go down. If you take common medications, which we, you and I get questions on, metformin, or acid reflux drugs, your B12 can go down. Many things can cause the B12 to go down. And if you need more, the answer lies usually in a pill that costs pennies a day. You don't need to go for a million injections. Those cost a lot. Every time they compare the injections up against the pills in most clinical trials, the cheap pill does just as well if you give it a couple months. So anyway, I... I think wait, 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 the up... cheap pill, the, wait, a couple of things. The cheap pill better be one that melts in your mouth, not that you swallow. One of the reasons for low B12 is because we get gastric atrophy. You can be taking B12 and it won't get into your bloodstream. That's true. Uh, we have so a, tra you do a we have Trader Joe's. 
So yeah, you do sublingual, sublingual. will be twelve. But Absolutely. now, now, but now I'm going to pass well, on. Well, some well, what about the what about the benthiamine and the uh, and the alpha lipoic acid? Are alpha you a believer? Alpha lipoic acid, definitely. If you read any of the books I've ever written, we'll have new. Definitely. We have new, well, we have a new edition coming out next month, so I don't want people buying anything until the new editions are out. But uh, uh, what you'll learn is that some of our best supplements, some of the most effective supplements for neuropathy, are actually prescription drugs in other countries. Mm -hmm. So they now, both give, of those are prescription drugs, aren't they? Exactly. But the one yeah. that's really common is not just an oral, but IV in the hospital is alpha lipoic mm -hmm. acid. So alpha lipoic acid is a global prescription for neuropathy. I've had more urologists call me and say they've read something and they've tried a small amount and it's worked. The other one, yeah, probably too, but the real focus should be on alpha lipoic acid. Now it's a sulfur-based compound, meaning that one of the biggest side effects, are you ready for this? You didn't say it because I don't know if you're experiencing it. If you take too much because it has a sulfur moiety is that you can get malodorous urine uh, AKA asparagus effect. And you're going, why this is pretty stinky urine. And you don't realize it's actually coming from the supplement slash drug, but it has, it has a good track record and is definitely an option. But what I love about the bigger teaching point is that people in cancer, people getting chemotherapy, people as they age, they should know about some of these things like their B12. And they should also understand that one of the biggest causes of nerve damage in the United States of America continues to be a high blood sugar, mm -hmm. a yeah. high blood glucose. So one of the reasons you want to carry a normal blood glucose a, or a some people get hemoglobin A1Cs is that as your blood sugar goes up on that test, it starts to damage those little nerves. And there's an old saying, when you injure a muscle, that takes weeks, maybe a month. When you injure nerves, that takes months and in some cases years. You're playing a different game, right? So the bigger teaching point is why I always go back to the Moyad 4, which is one of your top four numbers you should know better than any of your doctors is your fasting blood sugar and your hemoglobin A1C. Because as it creeps up, one of the early symptoms that it's creeping up, I'm not saying this is for you, I know your numbers, is the neuropathy. That's the most common cause of it. I wanted to I wanted to close on you giving us some wisdom. So at the beginning of the intro, you said you're going to provide some stuff about acupuncture and things like that. So oh, yeah. forget yeah. this prostate crap. It's time for the uh, it's time for the Moya to give us five more minutes of wisdom about alternative medicine. I refuse to give this level of wisdom because I have such power within the organization now and such pull <laughs> with Alex and Peter. Uh, that you have to comment on what we talked about a lot with Juan. All right, you, you, you covered all that. You all covered right, it if you don't want to yeah. cover them, okay, then let's you cover this. You covered it beautifully. Do you no, want to cover exciting. this? Who's better at tennis, Klotz or Scholes? I thought that was so ridiculous that he said that you're so much better than him. <laughs> Did, could you hear that part? Do you want to comment uh, on that? Are you better than Klotz or is he better than you? And don't give me a PC answer. That's not why I seek your assistance. <laughs> Who's the, better? Um, my gosh. Um, well, uh, he's better at everything else. I'm better at tennis. Thank you. Thank you. Honesty. Yeah. I love honesty. Do you know what this means? Mm -hmm. This means the current score is Moyed 32, Soul Zero. You know what I base the score on? This is the number of times I've visited your house in our relationship. Uh -huh. This is the number of times you've come to Michigan to visit my house. And uh, now you're uh, coming. Told me this is going to change. But we're gonna, yes. It'll be a, a one to 32 ratio here pretty quick. It will be. And what part of that ratio is we're going to do filming on some of the nutrition and some of what's happening with repurposed drugs. So I don't know. I thought I would pick out a couple of little ditties here that you might find interesting as we close up. And by the way, I'm going to teach you pickleball when you come here. I'm, I'm going to try to convert you to pickleball. That will reduce your neuropathy um, and your tennis elbow. Anyway, so um, I want to pick out a couple of great studies. My favorite exercise study of the year, Journal of Urology. And here it was with active surveillance patients called the ERACE trial. So you're taking these men on active surveillance. They're not necessarily that active. And a couple of times a week, they're basically having a coach and they're doing high intensity interval training for a couple minutes on like a treadmill. And so just three times a week of active activity versus a control group. All right. 
So they published uh, last year in JAMA Oncology and said, hey, we think we're seeing prostate cancer changes that are favorable just in 12 weeks. They're seeing some PSA changes. They look at the serum, they test it. And I was never excited about that. What I was excited about is the paper that got no attention that just came out. So they decided to do mental health scores on these patients with prostate cancer after 12 weeks. And now let me read you the conclusion, which should win a Nobel Prize, but nobody heard about. If you want the greatest endorsement for exercise in 2022, regardless of the situation, just look at the ERASE trial that was done in Canada at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, where if you've ever been to Edmonton in January, everybody gets free cryotherapy. It's freezing. <laughs> anyway, let me read you this conclusion, Dr. Klotz published in the prestigious Journal of Urology, and I'm one of the reviewers in that journal, and so is Klotz and other people. A 12, this is all the 12 week supervised exercise program did in the conclusion. The 12 week supervised program may, they should have put only for sarcasm, may improve prostate cancer specific anxiety, fear of cancer progression, hormone symptoms, stress, fatigue, and self-esteem in men on active surveillance. That's all it did in 12 weeks. Just help with all those mental health effects. Come on, man. I mean, do you need a greater endorsement than that, that we need to start pushing for the mental health benefits as much as the physical? People understand the physical. People understand that they can become in better shape. What people have to appreciate more is that doctors shouldn't get into a room. Politicians shouldn't meet. You should never argue with your spouse until you put in an exercise routine that day. Then you feel like a million bucks. You get that runner's high. The world's going to be fine. You feel less stress, less anxiety, less depression, and less catastrophizing. That's such a big word. It's so easy to catastrophize in oncology because you, your mind goes negative and negative. Some of the, you got to snap in order to snap that thinking and reboot the brain. Part of that is exercise. And one of the greatest things that exercise does is help put you in deep sleep, regardless of age. People are relying. I just did this big article for a bigger a news network that I appreciate. It was on melatonin, and I'm a big fan of it. But the reality I kept saying, which I'm glad they printed, is we even there's even studies on 70 and 80 year old men and women that when they just are physically active a little bit every day they're more likely to go into the deeper phases of sleep the refreshing restorative types of sleep so this was i say this was the year of exercise and to me it really was in prostate cancer and i'm not talking physical i think that's a new word that's a new word exercise that's uh, i like that you just uh, inadvertently coined a, a uh, i did moiety. that on purpose exercise yeah. All right, exercise it is from this time forward. The, yes, um, yes. And, and, I mean, and, and people have to quit, quit asking their doctors and their doctors have to quit telling their patients, this type of exercise is the only type of exercise that matters. No, it's all about latitude. That's what we've discovered. You pick the type of exercise that keeps you exercising and happy. Don't fall for this BS that the, only the treadmill is what works or only a Mark Scholl's tennis appointment works or the Moyad pickleball moment. You pick what gives you the greatest amount of satisfaction. The benefit is with the movement. The benefit is not becoming micro dissecting what specific exercise should I, people say, all I do is walk. I say, good for you. And they say, is that good enough? I'm saying, yes. I mean, I like you to break a sweat and once in a while, because the biggest problem is everybody does something the first three months. Three years later, virtually no one's doing it. The compliance, the adherence goes down. It's the same way with diet. You can put anybody on a diet for six months and they'll have amazing results. Come back to me in basically a year, a year and a half, and people start moving back to norm, regression to the mean, we call it. So you really got to work with your spouse and your partner. What's making me happy? What exercise do I really like to do? And so I just wanted to reiterate this year that this year was the year of exercise in prostate cancer, even though it didn't get the attention it deserves. Thank I'm you. For that. I, okay. There's, that's the one question that always gets asked when I'm meeting my patients on a regular basis is what yeah. I don't, I don't stipulate any specific exercise. I don't uh, rake them over the coals about how much. I just want them to be reminded each time that exercise is a priority. 
That's right. And I want them to understand that it comes in different buckets, which overlaps. And so what I try to do personally, because people ask me, because I had to exercise before this meeting, because I'm going up against the great Solzy. You know, I got to be in the top of my game, right? He's going to be smiling at me. He obviously admires me most of the time, but I've got to keep a straight face and just keep my gray matter moving. So it comes in different buckets. You have your aerobic activity, right? You're running. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, we, we got the exercise message. No, no, the aerobic. I just want to give you the buckets. I want to give you the buckets. You have your aerobic activity. You have your resistance activity, which is yeah, just yeah. as important, right? A little yeah, bit of weightlifting. Then you have your flexibility exercises, which are mm -hmm. important as you get older. So as if you, what you tell your patients is, if you're doing a little bit of aerobic, a little bit of resistance, and a little bit of flexibility, and all these are very cheap, low cost. One of the greatest exercises is walking and running upstairs. You get aerobic, you get resistance, and after you're done, you can do some flexibility. So what I'm saying is you got to think of exercise in those categories. Mm -hmm. They yeah. come in lots of shapes and sizes, and you can do a little bit of all of those. I think the other thing to mention in terms of motivational stuff, if you have a lot of money, you're crazy if you don't hire a trainer. And if you don't have a lot of money, figure find other like-minded people who are believers in the same concept and team up with them. Uh, because the accountability to persevering through those tough times. You go away on a trip and do you come back and go back on your program or you just drop it? Um, these, these, uh, the accountability is essential. You know, that's, that's why, that, that's exactly a good point. So all I have to add to that is about every six months, uh, we try to do an event with the students and the residents and all that. And what I always say, and I, I'll, people can rely on it now. It's, it's always, I'm going to go to, it's my go-to script. I'm saying, you know, exercise looks really great in research. It looks really great. But one thing you have to also mention the disadvantage and they go disadvantage. Most of this research is done with a trainer. It's done in a socialized setting. It's with, done with people who report data. So there's a group that exercises with researchers and that's a supportive component. And then the other group usually just stays at home. So it's enormously advantageous. That they, people don't count the social aspect of it. Most research studies don't mention in their limitations that these patients were in a social setting being observed. And just in being a social setting, that ups the benefit of exercise, which is what you're saying, which was one of the limitations I always mention when I, I mention review papers, when they say, these are the limitations of our exercise study. And I always write in, I go, no, another limitation was these people went into a center, they had trainers. So there's a social component. You see that with antidepressant. You see that with antidepressives. When people do better with exercise against depression, they tend to do better in the social setting being studied rather than recording something at home, how they're doing. And so that's why I'm so glad you brought up that point. Kaiser, you know, Kaiser, it's in your backyard, right? Paper yep. of the year in 2021. You got to be honest to me and mention if you if you ever heard of this paper. 2021, the largest observational study. Here it was Kaiser's finding. Are you ready for this? This is from the British Medical Journal 2021 and Salas et al. Other than advanced age and a history of organ transplant, physical inactivity was the strongest risk factor for severe COVID-19 outcomes. Hmm. I was not aware of that, but it sure Look, makes perfect sense. I know, sense. but it, it, it got no press. This was Kaiser's data on 48,440 adult patients. I, I'm not saying that we found the magic solution. I'm just saying that when you heard about masking and you heard about vaccines and all these things we reiterate, we should have also mentioned being physically active. We should have mentioned it, Kaiser, in your backyard. Ah. Oh. <laughs> anyway, you, I got to mention one more thing since it's my moment, because I saw about 10 of these questions to you and 10 for me. Are you ready for it? Because I don't want to disappoint the audience. Metformin. People say, Moyad, Scholes, you've been talking about metformin for years. I don't know if you want to provide the, the beginning or this, the, the second point, or do you want to comment on if you're still using metformin? And then I'll give uh, you yes. my take on it. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, metformin, statins, and I know you talked briefly about baby aspirin too. The uh, I, I was unaware of the pr uh, prospective trial on baby aspirin. I don't know if it's baby aspirin or regular aspirin, but the- Both, um, both depending on age, both. Yeah, so um, 
So these things, which can be if supervised medically, you can give metformin with almost total safety. Uh, same thing with statins. If you're supervised medically and baby aspirin, they can be um, uh, they can be given very safely. And there's a lot of indirect and some direct evidence that all three of these have uh, salutary effects. And let's say high risk prostate cancer patients that have gone through surgery or radiation, particularly radiation, and uh, and are hoping to stay cured. So if you say, well, are you willing to take the trouble of taking a couple pills uh, to try and enhance those odds? Uh, I think it's very sensible to um, to take all three of these agents. I tend to steer the metformin patients more, uh, the ones that are overweight, because you can also have some weight loss with metformin. Uh, I'm not as enthusiastic in the, in the beanpole type patients, but because uh, metformin right. sometimes causes some GI upset. Uh, but, uh, but the answer is yes. You know, I, we'll, we'll see if baby aspirin works, but maybe a statin does everything baby aspirin does and more. But the bottom line is that, um, you know, what we're seeing here is there's a lot of clinical trials going on and a lot of cancers with these drugs. And I think we kind of lost sight of the question and, and, and the goal. The goal initially was to use metformin to reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes. And it did that. And that's why it became popular. And so people come up to me all the time and go, you think it's going to going to help hormone therapy? You think it's going to do this? And I'm going, it's already been shown to reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes. And we know type 2 diabetes is not it's not good for cancer. It can encourage things, especially if it's uncontrolled diabetes. And you know, if so, my point is, you've already got something that helps control your blood sugar, helps you lose a little weight if you need it. Cost pennies, literally, right? Pennies. And so, it, anything else is gravy. If it shows that it also helps our the drugs work better in prostate, that's good. But what you bring up is the dirty elephant in the room, and I want you to comment on this. When are we going to admit? that the paradox of the irony of our times, I can't tell you the difference because I'm not smart enough to tell you the difference sometimes between a paradox and an irony. Sometimes they overlap. But the paradox of our times, which I write about all the time, is these amazing prostate drugs, which you use them all the time, ironically could increase the risk of cardiovascular events. So the point is, if at any other time in your life, you should be sensitive to whatever you can do to reduce your cardiac risk to as close as zero is when you're on these amazing drugs because mm -hmm. of the paradox or irony of our time, which is they some of them can increase blood pressure, as you've seen working with abiraterone, for example. And I could go on and on again. So this is where you have got to become an expert in your numbers and knowing what they mean. So if you need a little bit of help to control your blood sugar with metformin, you don't want to initially think of it as, oh, this is going to be what cures my prostate cancer. You want to look at it in baby steps. Well, they, this may help control my blood sugar so I can stay on therapy longer, so I don't get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and so I don't increase my risk of cardiovascular events. I wish people would be more kind to themselves. And when it comes to a statin drug, the data on statins assisting the ability of prostate cancer drugs to work better, or even radiation, it's quite extraordinary how much data there is. Now, mostly it's observational. But the point is, when are we going to start reminding people that I'm sorry that if a cholesterol lowering drug doesn't do anything for you except reduce the number one cause of death in men and women for the past hundred years, that that's still okay. It's still okay. So you want to know that one of the best ways to end it, one of my favorite papers come from the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. It just got published on statins and cholesterol lowering drugs, okay? Here is what I taught to the doctors because I have to do these teaching modules to doctors every month. Here's what the United States Preventative Services Task Force said with moderate certainty that statin prevents cardiovascular events. Okay, we know that. And are you ready for the next line? This is unbelievable. And, and all cause mortality. Wow. Find me another pill in our lifetime, you and me, that you take for pennies that has an impact on all cause mortality may actually help you live longer if you're a joe blow just like me or a joette explain no <laughs> other pill gets that line right. so you should explain that all cause mortality is kind of the holy grail of all tests to see if if a substance really works or not because you can take a subselect group of people 
and who have particular problems and, and focus on them with a specific treatment and, and cause them to die less frequently from an illness, say prostate cancer or diabetes. It's a much bigger thing, uh, fence to jump over to say, no, across the board, whether across they took the, the pill or not, it wasn't that they just died of less prostate cancer. They just died less of everything. That's right. And so you that's all their eyes, cause mortality. It's all cause. It's death from all causes. It means that you're basically extending life. Yeah. You're, you're improving life expectancy. One of the biggest cracks on many of your prevention drugs is, yeah, it might reduce my risk of dying of this, but I'm still going to die at the same age of that. Right. That doesn't improve all-cause mortality. So you will never see in our lifetime, I don't believe, that for generally healthy people who qualify for these meds, there may be an all-cause mortality benefit. There was another major paper from Europe this year that showed when you get your calcium scan, like you know, you're all excited about the CT calcium score, what they were seeing in people taking cholesterol-lowering meds is it made the plaque, it made the calcium more dense, making it less likely to break off maybe and cause problems. So it's causing we're seeing now, you're seeing with imaging tests, the way these are working by lowering your cholesterol, that it has what we call pleiotropic effects. It has an anti-inflammatory effect. It has an effect on reducing the risk of certain types of stroke and heart disease. And so people say, well, you must be with a statin company. I've never worked with a statin company. All I know is there's all these available now. Most of them are generic. Remember 20 years ago, how pricey they were? Now you can buy these for pennies if you need it. And what you also want to leave patients with in the audience is that anytime you look at the data on someone on a cholesterol lowering drug, metformin, or even if they qualify for aspirin, if they engage in basic heart healthy lifestyle changes, they get even a further bump or benefit of that drug. The drug even looks better in people that take care of themselves. There's this pervasive thinking that if I take the drug, it's going to do everything for me, including make breakfast. And the reality is it helps you. But what really helps you is you. So if your lifestyle improves while you're on this medication, you get that much more of a benefit from the drug. That's what they've learned. So your all-cause mortality gets even better. And so I'm glad you brought that up. And I just wanted to bring up this metformin game. And, and for those people who can't tolerate a cholesterol-lowering drug, can you please, because we share these same friends. Remember, we have friends. We, I want you to have the busy clinic. I'm just going to do the educating. So you have to admit that even if you can't take one of these cheap drugs in the next few years and right now, there are these, all these other forms of cholesterol lowering, including these injectables. You give yourself an injection once every two weeks, once every four weeks. There is even a formulation coming out. It's going to be a couple times a year and you're done. It keeps mm -hmm. your cholesterol down. And you've seen these patients in the office and they have stellar numbers. Yes. Yeah. And the yeah cholesterol injections. And there's also a cholesterol pill called Zetia that stops the absorption of cholesterol from your from your food. That's right. Uh, and these there, I have seen patients from cardiologists who have problematic lipid profiles that are on all three. They're taking a statin, right. they're taking Zetia, they're taking Repatha, which is the name of the injection. That's right. So, um, so it's it seems crazy that in a prostate cancer conference, we'd be t spending so much time talking about cardiovascular disease, but we're very grateful that a very large percent of men with prostate cancer are never going to get sick or die from it. And what do people want when they consult a physician? They want to live longer and they want to live better. That's and right. so it's, this is a low lying fruit is it's, to say, okay, get your blood vessels, keep them supple. If you have a plaque problem, let's start to address it. And, uh, and that you say, well, let's just leave it to the cardiologist. Honestly, the cardiologists that are in a prevention mindset are in the minority. I don't, and I understand why. Cardiovascular disease is so common. If you walk into their office, there's three or four people clutching their chest. They, they're all about to die of heart disease. And that you, you stroll into the cardiologist and say, hey, look, my calcium score looks a little bit elevated here. And he laughs at you and says, what are you doing in my office? Get the heck out of here. Come back when you've got a problem. Everyone, yeah. Yeah. they'll say everyone has atherosclerosis, which is true. But you say, but wait, wait, wait. My thinking, my prostate doctor says that I may be in trouble 10 or 20 years from now. And if I take this statin pill, that I might be in less trouble. Um, right. Help me. Right. And That's some right. of the cardiologists are starting to wake up to that. And others are just like, like I said, they're so bombed with people with dreadful heart disease. They don't have time for prevention. 
No, but it's but this is the most like I said, it's the irony of our times. All these great meds, but th these great meds come with catches and they're cardiovascular catches. So you have to be more sensitive than ever before. So, like you said, you have so many options. You have these things called PCSK9 inhibitors, they're the injections. You have all of a variety of statins that you can choose from if you need it. You have Zetia, like you said, it blocks the absorption of cholesterol from food. You have benpidoic acid, which is another new one that's come on there if people can't tolerate. There's so much going on, but you cannot leave. If you're gonna make me look good at the end, I'm gonna basically toot my own horn because this, I got a lot of flack for this and I couldn't be happier. Remember how many times we've been together and I pushed adult vaccinations? Just getting caught up with your vaccinations, right? I pushed it and pushed it. This is from JAMA Network Open, which was this year. This is a meta-analysis. In this study, receipt of the flu vaccine was associated with a 34% lower risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. How many times did I say it's the side benefits of the vaccines that get me excited, not just the direct benefits? Now let's go to what was published in JAMA online July 22nd. These are the COVID vaccinations, association between vaccination and acute myocardial infarction and stroke when you got the COVID vaccinations, one of the largest looks. This study found that full vaccination against COVID was associated with a reduced risk of heart attack, published in JAMA, right? Because we're talking about inflammation. And then to really make myself feel good for getting all that mean email, what do you mean side benefits? It's not proven. I'm going, it's not proven, but the preliminary evidence is so strong that you're quelling inflammation that other things go wrong when you have chronic inflammation. I don't want a severe infection. I don't want to be infected at all, but I don't want a severe infection that causes a lot. So this is a few days ago. This is going to make me sleep really well, apart from the fact that I've got this wacky tie that you made me wear. Flu <laughs> shots tied to lower stroke risk, this is a few days ago. The benefits were seen, especially in people with vascular risk factors or established vascular disease. These aren't just one study. These are meta-analyses. Some cases, randomized trials. You talked about neuropathy and nerve issue. You've seen patients that have had shingles and then they have nerve issues for the next three years. And we've got the greatest shingle vaccine in human history known as Shingrix. So I also, we talk about all cause mortality. We talk about why I get excited about statins and metformin. And th people think in the Moyen world, I'm getting excited because they have anti-prostate effects. I get excited because they have pro everyone effects. You see multiple benefits. So if I go to Vegas, I'm gonna bet on the number that comes up the most on the roulette wheel or at the blackjack table. I'm gonna play the probability game. I get this question all the time from your patients and others. They say, why don't you like this supplement more? Why don't you like that supplement more? Because I'm a betting man. Life is a game of probability. That's why you pick your prostate treatments. You pick the treatments that have the highest probability of working. In preventive medicine, the same thing in public health, you want to push those things that have the highest probability of benefiting you, even if it doesn't benefit you in the area that you thought it might benefit you, right? So if you go get a shingles vaccine and it reduces your risk of neuropathy and reduces your risk of shingles, great. But the reason I also endorse it is I think it reduces your risk of stroke. I think it reduces your risk of heart attack. That's what I bet on. So if a supplement comes along, I bet on the supplements, for example, in certain areas, not so much in prostate, the ones that come with those multiple benefits, the ones where first do no harm is not just a saying, but how you live your life, right? It's a probability game. I don't have any relationships with any of these companies. I'm just picking probability, which is why I'm so glad that we're ending the talk on being more heart healthy and catching up with your adult vaccinations. I'm not making this political. I'm not saying it's mandatory. I'm just saying these are the things that don't get enough attention while you're going through prostate cancer treatment that can change lives. Well, all these risks are multiplied in men that are uh, blocking their testosterone. So if you talk about hormone therapy, uh, there's hundreds of thousands, probably several million men that are, are walking around with low testosterone, which accelerates weight loss, accelerates muscle loss. And, and when you hear about the heart related dangers of the hormone therapy, I don't think it's low testosterone. I think it's the fact that they are running around with more fat around their middles and they have less muscle. And uh, this has always been, has always translated into greater risks of cardiovascular problems.
If, if, you look, I want, I want, if you look at who has a higher risk of shingles, cancer patients do, and prostate's one of those. And it's not just the fact that they can become immune compromised. It's the fact that hormone therapy, I've looked at this data, hormone therapy, surgery, all these things, it's stressful. These are stressful. These are stresses. They're mentally and physically stressful in the body. And that gives the virus a chance to come out and say hello. And so well, singles is such a, I mean, singles is such a horror show when people get it that yes, every, probably every vaccine uh, has an associated tiny risk of something bad happening, but shingles occurs is uh, in about one out of three people in their lifetime. I mean, this so, is a really, yeah, so really can, serious problem. Can I give advice to the audience who has given so much advice to me? Cause people, the audience writes so effusively they write such beautiful comments i like i say i read the i read the nice comments i don't tend to read the mean ones because i'm going to spend the rest of my life a glass half full that's how i've lived my life and so if you're coming at me positive i'm i'm, I'm very very excited but they, they've given us these great questions as to what their concerns are and there's there are these commonalities whether it's metformin so this is why we're bringing this up they ask me about vaccines they ask about all this stuff so here's my new rule if you're going to go see dr Scholz or any of our doctors in the future you're not allowed to start the appointment unless you mention first of all the moyad four plus one and the moyad four is you got to tell dr Scholz your latest cholesterol you got to tell him your latest blood sugar. You have to tell him your latest blood pressure done at home, not in his office, right? So, and then your latest weight, your BMI, how your waist circumference is doing. And the fifth one is, just, are you happy? How's your mood? Are you, are you doing okay? First, you have to start with those five. And then when you, when you tell Dr. Scholes and make his day those five, then you say, oh, by the way, I'm caught up with all my adult vaccinations. I'm not just talking about COVID. I'm talking about pneumonia. I'm talking about tetanus. I'm talking about Chingrix. So if people start walking in your office and they can do all that on the Moya checklist, oh, I will be the happiest man on planet earth. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You don't want people to miss out on the, on the uh, easily available things that can make them live better and live longer. That's for sure. That's right. Uh, um, Dr. Moyad, thank you so much for um, I know so much hard work that you put in throughout this conference in your preparation. You make it seem so flow, you know, flow so smoothly and naturally. And, uh, and it, 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 it kind of falls into the background, but you put in tremendous work preparing and the fact that you become an expert in each of these areas so you can ask the kind of questions that we need to know. And you're so relatable for the patients I know that are facing these problems and you're asking the questions that we want to hear. So thank you so much. Thank you for helping select these amazing speakers. And of course, we want to say thank you to the PCRI staff for making this whole process happen. I don't know how technically it is possible, um, and it, uh, that we can enjoy this time. It's your tree almost matches my tree. It's really, uh, I think that's really cool. It's um, cool. so I just want to well, say thank you. Thank you on behalf of you. everybody for, I'll for tell you, it's an, it's an honor and getting old with you, to be honest, it sounds funny, but getting old with you has been an honor. I, I <laughs> think we've learned from each other. You've taught me a tremendous amount. I know that I brought a subject that's not, doesn't get much attention that you've learned from, and you also include in your clinic and, and this this meeting, you have to admit, is is just the greatest moment of spirituality that I have during the year. It it is. I mean, these are incredible people. Our audience, people say this all the time, like an Oscar speech. Well, our audience is the best audience. So they'll say this about a football team. But the truth is, if you read the comments, the majority of comments from our audience, if you don't think there's a spiritual aspect going on, I know there is. I mean, some of the most beautiful comments about our volunteers, the workers at PS, PCRI, the doctors, the nurses, what they're doing. It's, it's if you really wanna feel fulfilled, do something with the organization, do something that has to do with this meeting. Cause we're gonna be back in person in spring and fall and that's gonna be a beautiful moment. But I don't, I don't wanna be too, I don't wanna drone on like an Oscar speech, but the reality is it sort of was, it was sort of a lifesaver, isn't it? It just restores, it completely restores my faith in humanity. That people- yeah, we, Well, we're that, amazed, right? of course, with, with the incredible, um, uh, how these uh, doctors pour their hearts out for us and, um, and how passionately committed they are to not just getting through their days, but to make their patients' lives better. That's right. And, uh, That's right. and it's really, really cool because they're quite good at it. Uh, these are really talented people. 
And uh, we have a wonderful privilege of, uh, of seeing you interact with these people, uh, both at a professional and a personal level. And it makes it uh, very uh, approachable and it makes it very uh, useful in terms of the type of information that is coming across. And for that, we are very, very grateful. And as, I, as we leave here today, I wanna to reiterate something that's quite extraordinary. None of these speakers, including yourself, have any idea what I'm gonna say. They have no idea what question I'm gonna throw out. Many times I have no idea what question, but people have to understand to be put on YouTube under that kind of pressure is not easy. And to me, it's symbolic of the sheer brilliance and knowledge of these people. And I'll even say, you know, with me and with you, because you have no idea what I'm about to toss at you. And when someone has that level of knowledge and confidence, it's very important. It really is because, you know, we've been around the people that want everything perfectly edited. These are the questions you're going to ask me. These are the responses I'm going to give. Everything has to be scripted. I think one of the most beautiful things about our in-person conference and our Zoom is that many of these things have no script at all. And it's people really, like you said, they're pouring their heart out. And that's why I am so glad you guys are coming here next next month for some filming. You're going to see my background in Michigan. And you're finally going to change this score from 32 to 0 to 32 1. And we're going to do some filming here, including more Q&A that I'm really excited about. So I'm excited you're coming east. Yeah, and you're a doctor too. Now, do I need to take antibiotics to make sure that the tick uh, doesn't give me Lyme disease when I come out there? Or should I just stay in, in inside all day long? No, no, your biggest fear is coming here and realizing that this is a lot better to be here than any other place in the world, including California. So the biggest threat to you and your wife and your family is that when you come visit me, you're not going to want to get on a plane and go home. You're going to want to <laughs> establish a clinic here. You're going to want to move here. You're going to realize that life on almost every level is so much more beautiful in our state than it is in any other state, including up North Michigan. So you need to forewarn the team that you may be moving the PCRI office is in the next month to the state of Michigan. That's your biggest fear. All right. I have many other comments, Dr. Moyad, but thank you again. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Yeah. See you soon. Can't wait. Can't wait. I want to thank everyone who attended this virtual conference. Thanks for joining us and showing your support for what we do here. Thanks to all of our speakers, Dr. Moyad, Dr. Schulz, Dr. Yu, Dr. Kwan, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Klotz, and Dr. Brady for presenting incredible information and making it available to us. Thanks to Bayer, Pfizer, Estellis, Janssen, Abvi, Advanced Accelerator Applications, Novartis, Blue Earth, Dendrion, Maiva, and Tolmar, who helped to make this event completely free for all of you. And go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel, stay up to date with everything in the world of prostate cancer. And once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you to the PCRI team who made this event possible. We appreciate that you trust us and we will see you soon. Prostate Cancer Research Institute is an educational organization for prostate cancer patients, their caregivers, and their families. We put patients first and are an unbiased source of information and support. For over 20 years, our goal has been to meet the educational needs of prostate cancer patients at every stage of their journey. Medical technology is advancing rapidly and new treatments are becoming available. Patients have to make complex choices which have lasting implications. They face unexpected industry biases and doctors who may not be up to date on the latest research. Your donation helps men receive the latest, most up-to-date information, which empowers them to make informed decisions. Our website, PCRI.org, is a wealth of information and resources. Our conferences and webinars are a way to get patients questions answered by leading physicians and researchers. And we have a helpline for men to call with questions about their diagnosis, treatment choices, and side effects associated with these treatments. 
Each week we produce multiple videos covering concepts and every patient question that we can think of about the disease in a straightforward and easy to understand format. This was a brief overview of what we do at PCRI, and to learn more you can visit our website. Your donation directly funds our educational programs, which give life-changing information to men during a very vulnerable time in their life, and we thank you for your consideration. You can visit PCRI.org to learn more. Provench is an established cellular immunotherapy used to treat certain men with advanced prostate cancer. Provenge is customized to each individual and is made from his own immune cells. Immunotherapy is the prevention or treatment of disease with substances that may stimulate an immune response. The immune system has memory and can recognize substances it has encountered previously. Immunotherapy is designed to boost the immune system to target and attack advanced prostate cancer. This is why immunotherapy empowers the immune system to fight the cancer immediately and allow the effects to last over time. Indication. Provenge is a prescription medication used to treat certain men with advanced prostate cancer. Provenge is an established cellular immunotherapy and is customized to each individual by using his own immune cells. Important safety information. Before receiving Provenge, tell your doctor about any medical conditions, including heart or lung problems, or if you have had a stroke. Tell your doctor about any medicines you take, including prescription and non-prescription drugs, vitamins, or dietary supplements. The most common side effects of Provenge include chills, fatigue, fever, back pain, nausea, joint ache, and headache. These are not all the possible side effects of Provenge treatment. Provenge is made from your own immune cells, which are collected during a process called leukapheresis. The cells are processed, returned, and then infused back into the patient through an IV, intravenous infusion, approximately three days later. This process is completed in three cycles, about two weeks apart. Each infusion takes approximately one hour and requires 30 minutes of post-infusion monitoring. Provenge infusion can cause serious reactions. Tell your doctor right away if you have signs of a heart attack or lung problems, such as trouble breathing, chest pains, racing or irregular heartbeats, high or low blood pressure, dizziness, fainting, nausea or vomiting, have signs of a stroke, such as numbness or weakness on one side of the body, decreased vision in one eye or difficulty speaking, develop symptoms of thrombosis which may include pain and or swelling of an arm or leg with warmth over the affected area, discoloration of an arm or leg, shortness of breath, chest pain that worsens on deep breathing, have signs of infection such as fever over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, redness or pain at the infusion or collection sites. Tell your doctor about any side effects that concerns you or does not go away. For more information, talk with your doctor. You are encouraged to report negative side effects of prescription drugs to the FDA. Visit www.fda.gov slash medwatch or call 1-800-FDA-1088. Please see accompanying full prescribing information.